Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Jim Cornette Experience. Today, the wrestling business may suck, but it doesn't suck as bad as Podcast One's business. Kayfabe's in the dictionary, but nobody knows how to do it anymore. And Tony Khan's dream matches give everybody else nightmares. To join me in talking about all this and even more, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Argadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, sweet dreams are made of him, and who are we to disagree? The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Still, in my eyes, probably the best Eurythmic song. The only one where they were kind of cool before they got really cheesy. <laughs> the very striking image, Annie Lennox, with the red hair. She had a good look, didn't she? Uh, yeah, no, she had a very striking look, and they were... She had a great voice. It's just you hear people talk about Annie Lennox, like one of the great voices of all time. It's like, yeah, but, you know, I think all of her songs suck. She wasn't no Judy Canova. Anyway, um, we just, we have not, hello, stranger, by the way, we have not done a program in the almost unheard of length of three full days now. And we did not speak during that time. And then we started talking here a few minutes ago, and we started talking like we were doing a fucking show, but we were only doing it for us. I don't know why. So I said, save the conversation. And we'll just catch up on the air because when you called earlier, you know, my first thought was he must have found out I was talking to Heyman the last three days. Hey, come on. Now. I didn't talk to anybody the last three days except select people that I will speak about in a second. But otherwise, this is it's been a refreshing. I don't know how you felt about it, but it's been a refreshing stretch that we didn't record something or speak about the, the grappling for the past three days, I've, I would like to say that I just laid around eating bonbons. I've been busy with other things. Stacy's in California for her nephew's wedding. Congratulations to Jade and Jennifer, by the way. I heard it was a wonderful ceremony. But she's out there, so I've been taking care of Harley Quinn, my little puppy. She's right over here. And I've been watching the wrestling that I knew that you would you would browbeat me and tongue lash me and strap me to the tree of woe if I wasn't prepared to talk about the wrestling and keep up with what's going on in this wacky, weird world that they got going on. And otherwise, I've been going back and forth to the hospital to see my cousin Larry. And that's the only... I've, not, I've stayed off the telephone and for the most part stayed away from the real world news. And so the only interaction I've had with people is in the process of doing that, and that's people I have not seen in some cases for 30 years, so there's a lot to catch up on. What's hospital life in Louisville like? Do you have to wear a mask when you go in? Well, no, that's what you were telling me something. I said, wait a minute, save this, because this sounds like a discussion. And you spent time earlier this year, you were visiting your dad in the hospital. Well, last both, year, last year. Well, la last year, I'm so, which, my God, how time flies when... I'm chained to this fucking headset, speaking to you. It was like this time last year. Well, then, in the past year, potentially not the calendar year, but in the past 12 months of the Gregorian calendar I've recently found out we're still observing, you've been in, in visiting people in the hospital in both where, Florida and New Jersey, right? Correct. And what is the procedure there in those locations for you to go visit a relative in the hospital that you were starting to tell me? And I said, whoa, back up. Yeah, you stopped me. I didn't even get an answer to the other question, which I just asked you about the, wearing a mask to go in. But when Well, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, here in a second, I'll talk about my process. When you would go to the hospital, again, two different states I went to hospitals in, you go to the front desk, you either get in line at the front desk or you just walk right up to the front desk. There's usually a thing of fresh masks there. You put one of them on. You give them your ID, they scan you, they know who's visiting the patient, they tell you where to go, they give you a pass to put on you, you don't have to put it, I never put it on my clothes, I don't know why anyone would do that, but then you go find the floor, you take the elevator up to the big, well, in the big hospital, if it's a big hospital. In you, the big hospital, in I, the medical facility. With all the big doctors and all the big nurses, and you it, find... It, it, they, well, they, there's, there's old Dr. Andre the Giant. And there's Dr. Giant Haystacks. And you find your room, and you are supposed to keep your mask on the entire time, and it's a whole process. In Florida and New Jersey, I had to do that. Yeah. 
Well, here in Louisville, Kentucky, here's what heck. Because, you know, like, I want to go to a hospital, right? I don't want to go to goddamn Kroger when it's crowded. The last thing I want to do is go, I believe I've mentioned this before, to a hospital, which is the home of sick people and the people in the world who are not sick but who are around sick people the most, right? So that's uh, first and foremost. But secondly, and my cousin Larry's wife is a is a nurse, and she's been in and out of this room and in and out of these hospitals. So she clued because it's a giant place, it's a complex, and she clued me in on which garage to park in. But it's a public garage, right? But still, it's the one right next to his building. And I go in there and I park, and I walk in. There's a, a door right there that come from the parking garage where you come in the side and bypass the lobby, which is over to the left, which there's usually when I'm visiting, I haven't seen hardly anybody in. And you get on the elevator, and you go up to his floor, and you get off and you turn left and go down the hall, and I haven't seen any patients in the hallway because they're all fucking bedridden. And I don't see employees all that often, but if I do, I keep to the opposite side of the hallway and hold my breath as I quickly walk past and right into his door and I'm sitting in his room and I do not emerge from that room except outside his room is a an area with a window where nobody's ever at because it's in the corner and occasionally if they're too confining, too confining, I can go there and gaze out the window and imagine I'm breathing the fresh air but there's no humans around me and then I repeat the procedure the way I came in to go out and have no interaction with anybody. And nobody knows that I'm there or who the fuck I am. And nobody's asked. Do they think you're a doctor? Again, there has to be some kind of protocol. You can't just walk into a hospital through the stairwell. Well, I am wearing a complete scuba outfit with fucking a mask on and fucking oxygen tanks on my back. Maybe they don't want to, maybe it's the webbed feet. They don't want to, no, but no, and no, and none of the employees that come in this room are wearing a mask. And I haven't seen any of them out in the hallway. But I, there's not a lot of people in this particular section anyway. It, there's not a high traffic area. So I'm in the corner in his room until I leave and then boom, and then I'm sneaking out and holding my breath and off I go. That's like one of the big things in the hospital. You see the nurse and you only see her eyes and you have to kind of guess, is she attractive or is she not attractive? I only see the eyes. The eyes are very attractive. I have never guessed that in my life. If I'm seeing anybody in a medical fucking setting with a goddamn mask on, I'm only worried about what I'm potentially fucking about to undergo and or whether or not that they've got something communicable that they may pass on to me. I don't care if it's goddamn... Gina Lola Brigida, how's that, you fucking 60s swingers? In a fucking mask, in a goddamn medical outfit. Fuck that. How many people are you allowed in a room at one time? I haven't seen a fucking uh, uh, sign that says capacity. It's a large room, got a hell of a bathroom. The bathroom would make a heck of a luxury hotel room. He has his bathroom. own room? Well, of course. What, are we going to put him in with goddamn Joe Schmo from down the road? Well, I forgot there aren't that many people in the Louisville areas. In some of the highly populated areas, no, there's only a fucking people million people around here. Well, there's more than one hospital. You know, so, how to, you know how to get you know the trick to getting your own room? Any hospital you ever in? Say I want my own goddamn room, or I'm gonna fuck up whoever you try to stick in there with me. That doesn't work. And sometimes you're stuck in with someone. What if you have to fuck that person up? <laughs> how are you gonna do that? You're tied to the gurney. Well, we don't know what shape everybody's in. <laughs> well, what I was going to say is all you have to do is tell them you have MRSA or have had MRSA. They'll give you your own room right away. Woo, MRSA, baby. MRSA. <laughs> MRSA, baby. That should be an ad campaign. It should be valued for <laughs> MRSA. <laughs> what, if I, what if I was just laying there in the bed doing that instead of telling them anything? Just woo, MRSA, over and over. I think you'd get you think I'd room. get my own room? Maybe your own doctor. Yeah. So anyway, Mesa. that's the hospital procedure that I've been under. I, I've, 
I, I don't need to do like I'm crossing a goddamn border into a fucking foreign country or an international country or whatever whatever the terminology is these days to add to the fact that I'm going to the hospital to see a sick relative. I don't need any more fucking stress. I'm already shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds going into this goddamn place to begin with, swimming in a cesspool of bacteria. Have you gone to the cafeteria? Are you out of your... I'm not Try one of the burgers. Try one of the burgers and review it on the show. No, no, fuck me. It's a burger. No, fuck you. Fuck you. I don't care. I've never in my life had the urge to go to a hospital and have a meal. Whether I was in it or just in and out visiting in it. I want to eliminate, eradicate, reduce whatever my time in this fucking procedure as quickly as possible. Last thing I'm going to do is sit down and have a fucking meal. How's the food over at fucking Baptist East Hospital or whatever? I can say here at Morristown, the food was all right, depending on uh, the day. If it comes to it, I'll get a goddamn stooge to go out and run and get me a bag of Wendy's before I'll eat in a hospital. Who knows what's, Who knows who's preparing the food? They walk through the same hallways. They breathe the same air. That's a good business to start if you can find the people. Everyone needs a stooge. But where do you find the stooge? Stooge Incorporated. You just said, I'll just get a stooge. It's not that easy for everyone. But uh, there was a stooge website, a database of available stooges. Stooge Stooge Incorporated. Some enterprising stooge. Stooge Stooge Incorporated. Some enterprising stooge could go in and set that up and have all the other stooges working for him and he could book them. I've just described the beginning of the wrestling business. Hey, what's parking like at the hospital? It, it, I hate parking garages because I got Black Beauty. I got the Ford Expedition. So sometimes it's a challenge just to be able to find a place where you can get in and get out easy. But these are, are slanted spaces rather than the straight in and straight out. So it's easier for me. So I've found the parking to be uh, not nearly the burden that it is in some locations. Generally, the first level that public parking is allowed, I can find a spot where I can just just it's slide free? right in. It's free parking? Well, nobody's asked me for any money yet. They've got a valet deal out front. I think they charge, you know, a couple dollars to valet it or whatever. Play, you have to tip the, the stooge. It's yeah, probably an independent stooge, not affiliated with Stooge that's Incorporated. Unaffiliated stooge, that is correct. Yeah. No, uh, the places I've been, you have to pay to park in the official parking lot. Well, fuck that. You're already goddamn going there to give them your money to have whatever needs to be done to you done. Well, not if you're visiting someone. Well, in that case, you're supporting their business. You're visiting <laughs> some to make them comfortable so they'll stay longer, spend more money. Supporting their business. You won't even try their hamburger. Well, I didn't say I needed to goddamn eat there. I'm all, I'm, I'm going in. I'm I'm supporting the, the person that's currently on their on their docket there, registered in their location. Do they have a and Starbucks? If, if, huh? Do they have a Starbucks? I have no idea. I'm not roaming around this place looking for goddamn food and beverages. Okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What kind of... When you're in the hospital for... When you're there a lot, you get the answers to all these questions and you roam the hallways enough that you know where you can find the ice cream and the soda and everything else. No, I'm going to be fucking hiding. And if I eat, have to eat or drink anything, I've brought my own drinks in. And if I was there long enough to where I felt I needed to eat, I'd bring a goddamn cooler with sandwiches or whatever. I can't believe you're just walking through the stairwell. That blows my mind. Nobody has accosted me. I, I see other people roaming around freely. It's a medical establishment, not a goddamn government courthouse. Are you what kind of is... fucking people you got going on up there? See, I think I think it's because you may pull off the doctor look with the glasses and everything. Is it w- wearing a U of L sweatpants and a goddamn <laughs> Beatles T-shirt? Oh, okay. I, th- I was picturing you in, you know, the uh, post office ninja outfit. No, that that might have uh, that might honestly have got people to start questioning me if I was all wrapped up in in that whole fucking and, and the black gloves too give an air of yeah. no sinisterness. One's, no one's gonna question the guy showing up in sweatpants with his own drinks. No one's gonna question that guy. <laughs> I see people carrying boxes and bags. They're bringing supplies to their loved ones. Supplies. Yeah, like a toothbrush, maybe. 
So well, no supplies, whatever, you know, for the people who are on the liquid diet, they got liquids for the people who are allowed to eat. I guess they got solids for you got books. You got coloring books out of crayons. What do you bring people in the hospital? I don't know. Cause I don't usually go. In my, right now, Larry's not in a position where he needs to be brought anything to keep him occupied. He's pretty much occupied with sleeping. When I was a kid, my grandfather was once in the hospital, and I remember this. He requested a Big Mac, and my dad had to like sneak one in for him because the hospital was like real strict about what he was eating, and my grandfather was like, just get me a Big Mac. Well, I'm, I can see that because, you know, the food does look somewhat unappetizing. But what are they going to pat you down for a Big Mac? So you smell like fucking special sauce. Maybe you had a big night. A big night that you would spe <laughs> spell that you would smell like special sauce that you would smell like special sauce. Haven't you ever spelled spelled? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you ever spelled like special sauce after having a big night, Brian? Only after a big night. Just a, a real big night. Well, anyway, but they can't pat you down, so you could bring in, technically, you could bring in a Big Mac and a plastic bag or line your pockets with Ziploc so you can bring in the soup. Soup. Anyway, I understand that, meanwhile, you, you said you'd had some inclement weather up there. We finally got some rain. We've been, we're still in moderate drought, I believe. That's, that's the next step up from exceptionally dry, I think, on the scale. But nevertheless, we got here at this location almost an inch of rain the other morning, which would, brings our sum total for the last month plus to an inch and like two tenths. And every, all the leaves are crisping up, the, everything's dry. You apparently stole our rain. Well, I didn't do anything. But apparently, here in the Northeast, Apparently, and not apparently, it happened apparently, in actuality. You to look out the window. No, well, we didn't get it as bad as everyone else did in the tri-state area, but Long Island, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, I assume Staten Island, we usually forget about them, parts of northern New Jersey, perhaps even southern New Jersey, flooding everywhere. the island that the Statue of Liberty is on? Crazy flooding. Like on the news, you see like the FDR drive shut down and just cars half underwater. And uh, that's a sign of the future, by the way, of what it's going to look like. How in much rain did you get? They said it was like a month's worth of rain in a few hours. So you got our rain because we've had no rain for a month. Yeah, it was. I mean, but it was, why didn't why didn't you get it there? Do you have a dome over your property or whatever? Or you mean your your entire neighborhood, not just you? I know you feel that you are the the ruler of the neighborhood, the baron of the area. Well, yeah, but. But it just What's it just point? came in off the water, right? You're inland, so you were sal salvaged somewhat. Well, we're inland. We're not really in a flood zone. Thank God. It's the first time in my life I haven't been in a flood zone, and it's really nice. <laughs> not having to worry about that ever again. And it didn't rain as bad here as it did, you know, closer to the coast, I guess. And so you were to the subway leak? Oh, my God. The subway footage. That was the first footage I saw. You see, like, just water coming out of the ceiling. You're like, okay, that makes sense. The subway's right into the street. If it's really pouring that bad, the water's going to start coming down. It started shooting out of the walls, uh, like the tiles. Like in between the tiles, just water shooting out. So, so okay. So, like poltergeist. And now are you going to say, Jim, you were right? About what? Do you remember? It was nigh on to, gosh, 10 or 12 years ago. When we, you and I, and Stacy was with us, we'd come up for Ring of Honor, and I made the comment to you as we were walking around the various places you were showing us, we came past a subway thing, and I, and I don't remember how, it, probably she brought it up, and I rolled my eyes, and said, I'm not going in that thing, I'm not going down, I've seen that movie. And that's the same thing with what those movie? fucking tunnels. The movie where some innocent fucking putts is in a goddamn tunnel when all of a sudden it starts collapsing. Either water is shooting or the fucking explosion happens and here comes the fireball everybody's running from. Or whatever the fuck, you're trapped like a goddamn rat. <laughs> of all the things I worry about in the subway, those aren't the things that no, you worry about in the subway. <laughs> no. 
I wouldn't get in one of those goddamn things. How long have they been there, those subway tubes and subway lines? I'm not talking about the trains. I'm talking about the holes they dug. What have they d done on top of it since then? The whole thing's a house of cards ready to come in, cave in, fall in. And that goddamn, that Holland Tunnel, is that the one that's underneath the goddamn, the river there? Well, there's a few of those, yeah. Well, fuck that too. I mean, that's why I... If, when we would drive up to New York, she started feeding me the Xanax 45 miles out because I was either going to have to go across one of those decrepit fucking bridges or through one of those goddamn death trap tunnels. And again, all I could picture was the big giant goddamn fireball coming ahead of me, evaporating and incinerating everything in its path or the goddamn... What is it, the East River? What is that river, that polluted sludge pot? Well, it could be the East or the Hudson. The Hudson, whichever ones of those rivers, suddenly caving in on top of me, seven billion gallons of water. You wouldn't feel anything. It would be too quick. It would be like Exactly! That. So I what are you worried about? I time to fucking cuss about it. <laughs> That's what you're worried about? So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to get somebody on the phone in my last moments and give them a piece of my mind. God damn it. There was an article the other day in the paper about like, I think it was the eight places in the greater New York area that are sinking the fastest. <sighs> like Flushing Meadows, LaGuardia Airport, where City Field is. LaGuardia Airport specifically is sinking faster than most other things in the area. Now it is on a landfill <laughs> right on the water and the water's rising as well. Oh golly, I wonder what that could have to do with anything. Yeah, but Coney Island, I think Lower Manhattan. Various things that will be underwater probably uh, in the next hundred years or so. Well, at least it won't be our problem by then. That's apparently the, the, the vision or the uh, tack that we're all taking as a planet now about uh, melting everything. And it's while this bullshit's happening, you get 10 inches of rain, we get none. And you know what else happened this week, don't you, Brian? What's that? Kayfabe. The word kayfabe is officially in the dictionary. In the Merriam-Webster dictionary, from what I understand. That's, that's what I gleaned from looking at it. So what do, you, <sighs> what do you think about that? Is this the first time that a word has ever been added to the dictionary, and by the time it made it, nobody knew the definition of it anymore? Did you see what the definition was that they listed? Well, that's as good as anything else, but I'm just talking about nobody nobody in the particular field and business that spawned it currently knows how to observe it now that it's in the goddamn dictionary. And if they had known how to observe it, it wouldn't be in a dictionary. I, did, I had been in uh, around the wrestling business as a photographer I'm going to say a year, year and a half, two years before I ever heard any of the boys utter the word. And I still didn't know what it really meant first until I figured it out from the application when I heard it a couple of times. I'm, I'm serious. I think it, it was probably, you know, a, a year or two before I even heard any of the, and any of the boys would just utter it around me in, application to something else that might have been going on across the room or whatever or in a joking manner you they didn't bandy it around that much in the business around people that needed to be kayfabed and nobody at that point knew that i was smart nor was i really now that i know what smart is was i smart but now it's in the fucking dictionary it just it's like I guess when, is it the same thing when the mafia godfathers, you know, read the exposés in the paper, the commission, and the, the way that the this thing of ours, the way they did things, is did they have a sad feeling like, ah, uh, this thing of ours is now the thing of everybody's? I think it's like now where all the mafia guys have like podcasts and talk, talk about all their fun adventures back in the day. You know, it's a weird <laughs> thing. It has, I guess more than we even realize, seeped into general society. Do you feel you'll fit in more 
with the fact that people will be using this in everyday common uh, conversations. Well, no, now we've got to figure out some way else to speak so people don't understand, don't understand, so the people don't understand what the fuck we're saying. We've got to figure out some other language to use now. Shouldn't, and, and nobody uses Carney anymore properly, but everybody kind of knows what it is. Should we go, should we go with the Alfie Arnie instead of the uh, Kiz Arnie, the Calf Arnie? Would that be a new wave? We could, but then the rappers will steal that. I don't know. It doesn't have the same ring. Driz no. up, diz down, bizotti, slizam is drow fop, dow found, bow fotty, slow fam. Would this classify as technically the absolute death of kayfabe? The fact that it's being publicly acknowledged in a dictionary? Yes, because actually once that you, this is a thing where once you actually know it exists, it can't exist anymore. Can it? And I mean, you know, and, and by the way, in behind the curtain, my best-selling graphic novel, which will be back on sale at jimcornette.com this Saturday, more on that in a few minutes, um, I do have a glossary of wrestling terms, and kayfabe is in there because of the clientele and the audience that the book is aimed for, but now just every, every fucking quilting bee and sewing circle of elderly white women uh, sitting down to play Scrabble with a dictionary, we'll be able to read about kayfabe. It just, it's, it's insane to me. And that exactly, uh, more people, again, kayfabe is a thing that's more popular and more well-known now than ever before, and nobody's doing it. And the, the more people have found out about it, the less the, the people in the particular field of endeavor that spawned it bother to fuck with it anymore. <sighs> it's a dichotomy. Or as Bob Orton Jr. said one time, it's a paradox, and that's not a couple of brain surgeons or a place to park two boats. All right, well, this has been the dictionary portion of the show, ladies and gentlemen. Next, well, speak next week's word, what will next week's word be? Next week's word will be new co-host. Hey, um, speaking of dicks, though, I want to say speaking of dicks, I want to thank John Fell in Baltimore. <laughs> Don't say that. He's uh, not a what? dick. <laughs> no, he, now, see, he could have taken that as a compliment. He could have taken that me saying that as he possesses one of the largest phallic organs in all of the city of Baltimore, even the state of Maryland. And then you just immediately blew that out of the water and practically accused him of shrinkage. You didn't say John Fell is a big dick. You said John Fell's a dick. Well, I just said speaking of dicks. I want to thank. Not speaking John of big Fell. dicks. He could have been a goddamn. He could have been a private been. detective. He could have been a contender. He could have been. But you didn't Stella. say that. <laughs> Look at here. He could have been the private detective over to Grand Hotel. You know, those private dicks. But anyway, instead, he sent me a birthday present, which I neglected to mention on the last program that we did. Uh, which was a program from his native city of Baltimore from 1958 featuring the Graham brothers in the main event, Jerry and Eddie, against Larry and Joe Hamilton. Wow. Piece of history there. And Is that a heel versus heel match? It, it actually apparently was. But you know what? They did that a lot with the heel tag teams in Vince Sr.'s early before the WWWF, or just Capital Wrestling, in, in the Garden in the late 50s and early 60s, because if you look back at it, except for Rocca and Perez, the heel teams were the, the most interesting, and there was a ton of them because they'd cycle them through Rocca and Perez. And then they, they would book them against each other, depending on who was in the territory at the time. Bull Curry and the Sheik. Can you imagine that with the New York State Athletic Commission at ringside about a year after the riot, they were a tag team. I bet they were on their best behavior up there. But anyway, I wanted to thank our friend John Fell for that wonderful birthday present. Did you see the fact that Lint had to, I don't think they had to do it, I guess, because they're trying to protect their page, but the Wikipedia page for them is on lockdown now. 
Yes, well, because it got changed a number of times. And, and I don't know how that anybody got the idea they should do a thing like this, but since they fired John Fell back, what was it, a number of years ago? But in such an unceremonious... A year ago. Less than no, a year ago. It, no, it was It was longer than that. No, he said it happened at the end of 2022 into January 2023, I thought. No, that was the that was the last time he got fired. I thought that he got fired from Lint years ago. Remember? Because they were putting the date in there when he was banned. And I, I bet you can find it now if you go to their Wikipedia. <laughs> Somebody else has probably changed it again, but the point, people have been changing their Wikipedia, li their Wikipedia, the candy company's Wikipedia, to reflect that they banned John Fell as an unsavory individual that never worked for the company again. See, it was funny because at various points, like, paragraphs were changed to say, like, all these things happened in 2022, plus John fell in Baltimore was fired. But then my favorite one, the one that got me, was on the side, like, on the right side, it has, like, just basic facts. Yes. <laughs> Headquarters in Switzerland. Key people. Ernst Tanner, executive chairman. Adelbert Lechner, CEO. John fell. Banned. Man. <laughs> so anyone who went to that page saw him as one of the key people in the company. <laughs> Can you imagine what these people in Switzerland thought of all this? <laughs> who is this John Fell? <laughs> who is this and where is he? We must we must contact him. Pull out of Baltimore. <laughs> Pull out of Baltimore now. We will go to Poland. <laughs> all right. Uh well, that's a lot of frivolity for the opening of the program, so let's bring that to a screeching halt. We want to bring back one, I don't know if you can call it a popular segment, but it's apparently a segment that has meant a lot to many, many of the listeners out there, and we haven't done it for the last several weeks because of, of at first there was the onslaught of multi-company pay-per-views we had to cover and and truth van harley was sick as you know for a while we talked about that on the program she's feeling chipper now but i didn't want to think about that and then we've just we haven't been able to get to the emails but this is finally to acknowledge some folks that have been waiting the return of reggie's corner <laughs> Reggie's Corner. We're here to talk about your good boys and girls. Reggie's Corner. We're so sorry they're dead now. <laughs> oh, st again, still, it never gets any easier to hear that. But all right, I've got to say this, that uh, again, and Brian, you've mentioned that several people have contacted you on the on the socialized media and so when's Reggie's coming back? And where, you know, we sent something in or we just want to hear it. And it it has meant a great deal to a lot of the listeners, especially those who have been recognized. So we we're going to try to keep up with this. But when we started doing this, we didn't realize, but we should have. I was never a math major, but you're pretty good with them numbers that with the, the audience that we have, chances are there would be multiple tragedies every week and it to recognize every we don't want to leave out any of the good boys and girls and and everybody's members of their family but to recognize everybody on a regular basis would almost be its own show i think you can vouch for this with the amount of emails you've seen and then i get some sent to me that i almost never see yeah i think we figured out for every listener there's 1.5 animals in their house and apparently many of them are crossing the bridge. So we're going to we're going to recognize here on the program today a a sampling of some of the emails that we've gotten in the last few weeks and and we'll try to keep up with the more the more heart-rendering or unusual you know uh, stories that we hear about about our furry family members, but we just we can't do everybody. But it doesn't mean that we don't love them all. So, as a matter of fact, Harley's bugging me to do something for animal charity uh, coming up since we're uh, doing the breast cancer thing with the figures and we've done the, uh, you know, the crusade for children. So, Harley's going to pick a, an animal group coming up soon. You sure she's not just bugging you for a treat? 
And no, she talks to me when nobody's around. Really? Yeah. Son of we'll, Harley. We'll talk about that later on. But anyway, uh, my friends, Aiden and Brandon at Galaxy Records up in Michigan had a tragedy, and they, they wrote a, a long email and it starts today. The Galaxy Records family and primarily Aiden have come to terms with the euthanasia of our unofficial mascot cat, Ozzy McOzerton. And then the rest of the email, they, I'm sure, crafted with care and spent a lot of time on that contains, in the context of the email, puns on every single Ozzy Osbourne song that has ever been written or released. And I can't go into it here or we'd have to sign off before we did anything else. But good work, boys. But we're sorry about Ozzy McOzerton. And that was Brandon and Aiden, as I said, at Galaxy Records in Michigan. I may send you this, Brian, so you can read it off the air. It was quite clever. Um, Are you, Mark, bang Are you banging on something over there? What? I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing the stack of notes here. What's the matter with you? I heard like a... Well, it could have been. It's on the desk here. What What? What are you wrapped in bubble wrap? It sounded there? like a drum beat. It sounded like you were getting ready to make a sacrifice or something. I didn't know what, no, what it was. There's no, there's no goddamn. Went to see the witch doctor. This is what he said. He said, ooh, ah. Ooh, ee. All right. Ooh, ee. Ooh, ee. Ooh, ah, ah. Bing, bang. Walla, walla, bing, bang. Mark writes from where? I don't know where. But he writes that uh, this past September, one of our dogs, Keto, had to be put down as he's been suffering from several ailments. He was 14 years old, and his original owner was my deceased brother-in-law, Carlos Montanez. Keto would have been 15 if he made it to his birthday on Christmas Day 2023. He was a purebred Shiba Inu. I have no idea what that is. Carlos named him Keto. K-I-T-O, by the way, as that was Carlos's nickname. Wouldn't that be Kaito? I thought of Keto. Well, Keto's Kaito. K-E-T-O. Kaito. Well, how do you get Kaito out of Carlos Montanez? I got Kaito out of you saying it's Keto and then you spelling it. No, it was Kaito or Keto, whichever way, was Carlos Montanez's nickname. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm not disputing this. <laughs> well, goddamn present you the way, is, facts here. Is Carlos Martinez famous? I mean, he's not saying my brother-in-law. Martinez, brother -in -law. not Martinez. Well, he's no, saying... he's famous because he's fucking Mark's brother-in-law. Well, that's what I'm saying. He's saying my brother. He didn't just say my brother-in-law, Carlos, like any normal person would. He gave him his full name. Should we well, know he who he is? wanted to make sure we knew who he was talking about. Is he in a band? Maybe he's got a lot of brother-in-laws. This would probably be the only one that's deceased. Here's the thing. If his brother-in-law is deceased and now the dog has passed away, was it genetic in that family? I, I don't think it works it, like that. Well, we're sorry, Mark, to hear about Kaido. Or, it, 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 there's got to be an example of a, of a... What about a pita? Pita, see? Pita, piece of pita bread. P-I-T-A. Right, but uh -huh. what if it was P-I-T-O, what would you say? Pito. But that isn't a word, so it doesn't matter what you would I say. What if I say puta? <laughs> what the, but don't, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's be careful what you say here on the air. Here's another uh, <laughs> Kevin from Wyoming. Good morrow, Jim and Brian. Is that the way they address people up there in Wyoming? Good morrow? I don't know. I, I know someone with an LLC in Wyoming. Well... That's a place where a lot of shady people go to hide their... Anyway, on September 24th, 2023, I lost my close friend Scoots. He was a German Shepherd mix and a notorious spot stealer whenever you got out of your recliner or couch. He made it through 13 years of life, and even though I knew his crossing was coming, I am quite woebegone. Kevin from Wyoming, we're sorry about Scoots, but you got away with words, Kevin. Woebegone. Woebegone. That's where all your woe is is gone, and you have you Wobegon, have the Wyoming from Wobegon, Wyoming. Uh, here's another. We've got this is the first example of this particular 
uh, species on the program. Uh, Victor. Oh, that. Okay, if this is indeed his real name, Victor Rivera. Former WWF Tag Team Champion, partner of Chief J. Strongbow, Victor Rivera. He was an America's Champion, too. That's right. But that is a real-sounding name. It's not like Dolph Ziggler or something ridiculous. Well, it just... It, 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 do you know any other Victor Riveras? I know Victors, and I know people with the last name Rivera. Okay. Put them together. Well, wait, How many do you know? If maybe if someone from each family married and they had to name the next kid, maybe it would be Victor Rivera. That's like that's like my fucking cousin. It lives down the block, Frank Sinatra. There's Franks and there's Sinatras, but you don't hear many Frank Sinatras or Junior, except for that one. Hey, Jim and Brian, <laughs> hope all is well. We just lost one of our horses yesterday. Her name was DD Seven Thirty. Sounds like that DraftKings spot. She retired from the racetrack at the end of November 2022. We asked the owners if we could keep her so she could become a brood mare, uh, which is a mother horse. Throughout these months, she's been such a joy to have at our barn. My daughters, uh, five and two years old, absolutely loved her. She got really sick on us a week and a half ago and went to the Equine Hospital there in Ocala, Florida. I wonder if they check your ID when you get in and out of that place. Yeah, to make sure you're not Marty Funk. Hey! They needed, I'm aware of that, yes. There's no reason to malign <laughs> the good name of Ocala when you... Hey, brooding Mayor, wasn't that Edge's first gimmick? That was actually, he was the brooding mayor of the WWF at that time. But anyway, back to Dee Dee. They needed to do exploratory surgery, and, and her intestines had issues, and they couldn't do anything to save her. So we're sorry to hear about Dee Dee, and, and Victor, if that is indeed your real name, Rivera. Um, and Frank Sinatra, if he has any horses also. Uh, and Jenny, from Mayville, North Dakota, proving that we do have female listeners. Unfortunately, her little mini dachshund uh, Penny had to be put to sleep in August. She had been having trouble breathing and had liver and intestinal problems. She was 13. And I had a miniature dachshund when I was a kid. Well, my mom and I did. And they're just the cutest little things, but they also have a tendency to develop back problems because of the the way they're built and the suspension, especially if they get overweight. Uh, little Hansi was a pudgy little dog. Hey, when you got Harley Quinn, was it because you wanted a dog or was it in part because you had memories of having a dog as a kid and it was, you know, just a happy part of your life? Well, no. Well, Stacy actually uh, instigated Harley and wanted a Pomeranian. And I was concerned at the time I had been uh, talking about when I was out of town so much, I was still traveling. She went with me sometimes. But then at the uh, point in time where Ring of Honor gave me a mental meltdown and I dropped out of society for about a year or so. That's when she convinced me, okay, we got to start looking. And then I saw the Pomeranians and, oh, they're cute. And then as soon as I met little Harley, I've always loved dogs, but I haven't had time to take care of them or, you know, spend with them or whatever. Other than the Steiners, how many wrestlers you know, at least until the complete end of the territory days slash, you know, WCW, whatever it was, had dogs that, you know, if they weren't married or something, and they had dogs, like, were there any guys that took dogs on the road? Um, and no. Um, and really, and Scotty only brought Arnold when they were close to, you know, home in Atlanta, and he and Scott, or he and Rick were in the car, so why not, you know, just throw Arnold in there too? Um, it's not like they were flying him around. But generally, no, you had dogs if you were married or had some a girlfriend, somebody in the house to take care of the poor dog. But no, guys that just lived by themselves usually didn't have a dog because you'd never see the fucking thing and he'd never get out. No locker room dogs? Um, no, every once in a while, somebody if they were visiting, but never not a lot of lot. Not in the... Are you kidding? Watts would have goddamn fined you probably if you'd have brought, uh, he certainly fined people for trying to bring too many family members and smooch them in for free. He would have fined but, you and uh, kicked the dog. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, there was a, although Hercules Hernandez, I may have mentioned this, but when he came to the Louisiana Territory and his girlfriend, I can't remember what her name was, and they didn't last very long, but they had, I think, a dog and two cats in the car with him, and she was making a trips with him, and they were they were just in the car, and it was a very crowded car. They had the trunk was full of his shit, and the animals in the back seat, and them in the front seat, and well, you interesting. really you really have to be committed to a relationship to drive around with your boyfriend or husband in mid south of all the territories. That's not yeah. Well, I did. It's road. possibly why it didn't last too long. And I I don't believe their parting was amicable. But back to Reggie's corner. Um, Matt in England says, I would like to put forward my guinea pig, Sam, for induction into Reggie's corner. Sam lived until the ripe old age of eight, which is old for a guinea pig, and outlived his mother, Ziva, and sisters, Hetty and Kono. Sounds like part of the cast of the original Hawaii Five-O. Sounds like a lonely existence. But no, well, there, there's all of them around there. He had all the guinea pigs. He said Sam would always brighten up our day when he got home, squeal like an alarm when he wanted food, and when I was trying to listen to your podcast. So apparently we're not big with the guinea pig audience. That's a key demo we're missing. All right. I can live with that. You're not going to try to do anything to get the guinea pigs. No. Just tiny shit everywhere? No. What not just all right, nevertheless, we don't want to include it disinclude anybody, any segment. Yes, of we do. You out there. you said no spiders, no snakes, no reptiles, no lizards. Well, but a guinea pig has fur. It's a cute little furry thing. Jonah from Saskatchewan. On Thursday, August 31st, we had to say goodbye to my lifelong friend Ernie the Cat. After he lost his battle with cancer, Ernie was 16 years old and he was my first ever pet. He was with me since I was eight years old. Oh, that sucks. Oh, that's. I had all kinds of dogs when I was a kid at various points and they, they coexisted for some periods of time, but the, the early ones are never easy to lose. And speaking of which, Chris from wherever the fuck he may be from, Lost his 15-year-old best friend, Max. His full name was Maxwell Shithead Taggart. Oh, I'm sorry. He says his middle name was pronounced Shytheed. As he was and always will be, my little shithead. Maxwell Shytheed, a.k.a. Shithead Taggart. That'll be MJF's name in WWE. <laughs> And also... MST! Uh, what, uh, go ahead. M M MS, well, it could be MSG. What is the MSG that they now have, for the past several years, have been assuring us is not in their goddamn food? I'm not exactly sure, but there was something I recently saw on the news, well, I said recently, within the last year, about how everyone got it wrong. MSG isn't the problem. Well, is MSG going to file some kind of slander suit then well if it was owned by james dolan it would but the it, overall chemical or the um it's not a chemical the saucy the substance the component of msg does not have a advocating body what do you think madison square garden thinks about the negative msg publicity over the last several years i think they love it because it makes people not pay attention to all the negative publicity around madison square garden well you got a point there uh, and Matt has a point that his best friend Piper just passed away at 17 years old. He was a little pug chihuahua mix. That's old for a dog. And he only had a short illness for about two days, but he passed away during the night. And he says, I miss him every day. It's hard not hearing his nails on our hardwood floors when I come home. And that's so sad. Aww. And that's, yes. Why just start with the goofy saying. ones and end with the sad ones? Well, I'm not done yet. I got one more, oh. but I just wanted to to bring that one up because, again, when Harley was sick and she was just laying around in the corner instead of walking back and forth, it was very quiet. I understand the thing. But anyway, 
We have one more from Aaron from uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, who apparently, I'm not sure quite grasps the concept of Reggie's Corner, but he says, my little mischievous Tomcat, Smokey, who I should point out is literally Tom from Tom and Jerry, if he was a real cat, same markings, coloring, the whole lot, received a nasty bite from something. This left him with an incredibly painful abscess in his foot that was full of green pus and blood, and once the vet popped it by accident as it was hidden under his foot fur, spewed this volcano of goop that absolutely stunk. Once clean, he had a literal hole in his foot. After a week uh, inside the house and feeling very sorry for himself, and a twice daily matchup filled with choke slams, power bombs, and table spots to get his antibiotics and painkillers into him, I'm happy to say he's on the mend and back to his usual irritating little self. A happy induction into Reggie's corner. He's alive. The dog's alive? Yes. He's not in Reggie's his corner. Cat. His cat. His cat, whatever it was, no one was listening. The cat isn't in Reggie's corner if he's alive. That's what I'm saying to you. He didn't grasp the cons. He just wrote to explain that his cat had a fucking abscess in his foot that spewed a volcano of foul-smelling goop and pus. But he's okay now. So, Aaron, that means that Smokey is not in Reggie's corner. Oh, wow. You can hear the anger in those hands. But now come back if something happens. <laughs> but it has to be something bad. You don't think he should be banned from any further Reggie's Corner submissions? Well, it, it, because then sometime it's going to be true. You know, well, I don't know. Maybe fucking Smokey will outlive Aaron, and then Smokey can write in and tell us about Aaron. I don't know that Smokey will care that much about Aaron as Aaron does about Smokey. All right. You know what's coming up, don't you, Brian? Was that was that the end of Reggie's Corner? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and that, folks, was... I'm sorry for the time that it's taken till we got back to it, but that was the end of Reggie's Corner. Reggie's Corner. We're here to talk about your good boys and girls. Reggie's Corner. We're so sorry they're dead now. Woof, woof! All righty. You know what time of year is coming? It's fast approaching, Brian. It's almost upon us. It's bearing down like a steaming freight train, like a ball of fire coming through the Holland Tunnel. You know what time of year that is. No. It's it's the holidays. It's the time where you give gifts and you you give tributes to the people that you love, that that you enjoy, that you cherish, that you are friends with and related to by mistakes of fucking genealogy and High school backseat grope fest. You give them all presents, don't you? Me? No. I yeah, mean... well, most people. The royal you? You wouldn't give a cripple crab a crutch, would you? Depends who the crab is. Do I know the crab? Well, it, you've had some of them in the past. Most people at this time of year are starting to think, what can I get Aunt Fanny or Uncle Felcher? or any of my numerous circle of friends, especially if they're wrestling fans, well, the answer now is merchandise from jimcornette.com because this coming Saturday, October the 7th at noon Eastern, all of our regular merchandise goes back on sale. As you'll recall, it's been off the website for the past month while we handled the pre-orders on the incredible official Midnight Express action figure 40th anniversary four-pack. And now that we are handling that, we are opening up the rest of the line of merchandise for sale. You will be happy to know, once again, you can purchase the iconic Cornet Face t-shirt, the best-selling graphic novel behind the curtain, the autographed DVDs, the pictures, the Cult of Cornet membership certificates, and Brian, you'll never guess what in the world that I found in, when we were going through inventory. I found a box in a closet 
Remember the restraining order that our friend Shitstain placed on me about, it's been about six years ago now. Well, I found a box of 47 of them that was, I didn't know I had them when we took them off the website back a couple of years ago. We had had them up for sale for copies, I should say, of the official restraining order. We had them up for sale for a few years and sent part of the proceeds to the Crusade for Children. That way, Russo could actually say that something that he wrote did some good for somebody in his life. And then I thought I'd run out of them, and we had the website was down, and I took them down. We didn't put them back up. So I found 47 of them straight from the copy shop. It's not just the front page, folks. It's the entire nine-page document where Vince Russo admitted to a, a court of law that he was in fear of his life from me, and I have autographed them personally, the stalker Jim Cornette, and there will be 47 of those on the website on sale, jimcornette.com, Saturday 7th at noon, and all of the proceeds will go to the WHAS Crusade for Children. And just a note to make sure if you've been on the fence about whether to get a lazy booking t-shirt, they will not, they've been up for about a year, year and a half now, they will not be restocked as we're going to cycle those off and do something even different and more exciting in the future. So if you've been on the fence about the lazy booking shirt, they probably won't last till Christmas in all sizes. I, we might have some smalls left or whatever. But get that while you can. October 7th at noon Eastern, jimcornett.com. All the holiday shopping for the friends, the family, the frenemies, the enemies, the Furnum Snavitzes, and all that type of thing. You know where you shouldn't spend your money, Brian? Where's that? In the stock market, buying stock in Podcast One, from what I understand. Well, certainly you're speaking from your own personal point of view, and I guess you could say my point of view and the point of I'm view of a lot of people. I'm speaking from the who point of view to. of any sane, reasonable person that wants to keep a hold of what little money they may have left. This fucking stock is going down like a circus seal. So uh, we, we've had an update in the world of cast media and Colin Thompson and Podcast One and Live One, courtesy of our friends at, is Billboard a magazine anymore? Do they do it right or do they just put stuff out on the internet these days like everybody else? Well, they have an online presence, of course, but Billboard uh, is, I guess, the last standing music industry and in this case, beyond the music industry, publication, trade publication. It used to be Cashbox and a whole bunch of different things. Billboard's really the last one standing. It's now the paper of record. Well, it has been for a while, I think, for a lot of people. Yes, in the in the industry and and to alert people to what's going on, they had a big, would you call it an expose, Brian? Would you use the word expose of what Billboard did concerning the whole podcast one, Colin Thompson, Rob Ellen, live one, the thing that we've been talking about for low these past three months, now that it's hitting the mainstream and people are, Finding out all the dirty little secrets. I don't know if I would say expose. Certainly an exclusive story revealing some details that no one else knew. Those details were exposed. Those details were exposed, but let's go back a step. You asked about the stock. I don't remember where it was where we last left off. But as we are recording over the weekend, the market is closed. Podcast one, PODC on the market, or on the exchange, I should say is at $1.98. Oh, wait a minute. I think they've made a slight comeback. Well, there's a story to be told there. And then Live One, the parent company, yeah. is at $0.96. Cents. <laughs> and uh, we'll see about any slight <laughs> comeback there. One other note about Podcast One here. Podcast One's market cap right now is approximately $45 million. How? 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 Or any of explain to a layman, Brian, to a just a a journeyman, to a common, ordinary, everyday, shit kicking, small town bird lawyer, how that they can claim that these companies are worth these tens of millions of dollars when you can get a share of the parent company for ninety six cents down, by the way, from its original point. On Thursday of 99 cents. They missed it by that much. 
This stuff is not worth a goddamn dollar a share. The parent company that's supposed to be even bigger than Podcast One, which is the company they say is worth $45 million, and you can get a share of that for a dollar eighty something cents. When it was issued two weeks ago, at, they started out at eight dollars and and went down like a goddamn New Orleans whore. Yeah, and again, a good time to point out here that if you're hearing this, whatever you're hearing has been legally cleared by Stephen P. New, eight eight eight, the new number. No, no, eight seven seven five zero seven eight three eight three. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Just give them the brand new phone number, Brian. 877-50-STEVE. That's right. That's what I said. 507-8383. But Podcast One stock had a very interesting few days. It was going down. It started the week last week at 219. And on Wednesday, September 27th, they hit $1.79. The low was $1.77 altogether. So that was on the 27th. And then that same day, they put out a press release. Courtside Group Incorporated completes restructuring of balance sheet and officially rebrands named the Podcast One Incorporated. Podcast One will continue to trade on NASDAQ under the symbol PODC. The parent company, Live One, converts its $3.5 million bridge note investment into Podcast One stock at $3 a share, a 57% premium, to the September 26 closing price, increasing Live One's ownership of Podcast One to 81%. Podcast One converts the remaining bridge notes in the range of $2.5 million into shares of common stock at $3 per share. So it sounds like the parent company, Live One, had money they loaned, or had a, bri a bridge note is a short-term loan. A bridge note investment into... Po the parent company is converting their investment into Podcast One into stock in the company that no one will buy the stock of. So that caused the stock, I think, to... Uh, and that caused the stock to go up? It caused the stock to go up to a $2. $2. Because they were out. buying it. At a price of almost twice per share of what it, everybody else was that wanted it, the few people that wanted it, was, it was selling for. They would use it. Well, we'll give ourselves three dollars a share. How the fuck does this kabuki-ish bullshit even work? It's a good question, and you know we probably should have an expert one of these days on here to answer. But just imagine, someone says, "Jim, I'm going to loan you three point five million dollars," and you say, "Great, I'm going to use that money. And I'm going to try to operate my business." And then you come back and you say, how about instead of giving you that cash, I'm going to give you stock in my company, but I'll value that stock higher than it's currently valued. You would say, no way, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would I do that? No one would do that. Unless you were the parent company of the company you're trying to help out. I don't yeah. think anyone would do that. So Nobody that, would do that. So again, you, should, you shouldn't do that, Jerry. As, Nobody. As we talked about previously, Podcast One just likes to dump as many press releases as they can, saying almost nothing positive that's actually happening. So while all this is going on, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And there's a lot I can't reveal today, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes and a lot going on from different parties. I could tell you that Colin Thompson's operating business is normal. There are various shows under the cast media umbrella, The Opportunist, various other ones still operating, still billing sponsors. Hasn't filed for bankruptcy. Hasn't filed for bankruptcy, which we heard he was going to do from him, his lawyer, and from Rob Ellen in an email to you. Turns out that was a bluff. Never happened. So in the midst of all this, and Collins, we here, working to recruit shows still for Podcast One, it came out previously, any cast show that went to Podcast One, Cast Media, Colin Thompson, who owns Cast Media, Cast Media would get stock, additional stock, just for any shows that came over. So you're helping Colin by trying to just get straight from what Colin did to you. So an article came out in Billboard by Dave Brooks, 
Podcast One paid Brendan Schaub $1.6 million, while other cast podcasters were asked to accept pay cuts. Parent company Live One took out a high interest loan to bring Schaub over to Podcast One after he and others were jilted by cast media. What are your initial thoughts on that? Well, and Brendan Schaub, for those of you like me who didn't know until this whole debacle started, is a former UFC fighter that now has three big podcasts. He's a, he's a big boy, right? He's got a big listenership. And apparently, the, the way to try to artificially inflate this new enterprise that they were going to be selling stock in, to me, just on the outside looking in, was... We got to get this guy. He's got a lot of our numbers that we're claiming. So we'll make good with him however we got to to get him. And then we can say he came over here and that'll make a lot of the other people do it. They didn't count on you and me rallying a lot of the other people. Well, also, I think that it was a two-way thing. If Colin Thompson, who recently publicly stated that he reduced his debt from $8 million to $4 million, So there's him putting the number $8 million on the debt. Who knows if that's true or not, because Colin's a liar. Right. But he said it was reduced from $8 million to $4 million. You would have to think this would be a big part of that reduction. And again, it helps Colin if he can get $1.6 million off his books. And Podcast One needs these shows for any of this to make any sense. And you can tell that... Live one and our friend Rob, and by the way, hey Rob, when you email me and say I highly suggest that you talk to my team and I highly suggest you don't slander this deal, I highly suggest you check your fucking stock price when you tell Jim Cornette and Brian Lash shit like that, motherfucker. Mook. Look what it is. Yeah, mook. Mook, motherfucker. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> point being, they took out a high interest loan to pay this guy the money this rob ellen claims that live one is worth so much money they have to take out what did they do go to some back alley and deal with a loan shark to get 1.6 million or whatever to pay this guy off what he was owed so that he'd come to their shyster operation if if they got a 45 million dollar company under their umbrella how come they can't come up with 1.5 million they got to take out all these burdensome loans. This whole thing sounds like a house of cards. But, you know, I'm not an expert. No, and to that specific point, Billboard had the details here. Records obtained by Billboard show that in early August, Live One borrowed $1.7 million from Cap Chase, an online bank based in Madrid. <laughs> that money, Billboard confirmed was borrowed to pay UFC fighter-turned-podcaster Brandon Schaub what he was owed by Cast Media, the Los Angeles-based podcast company launched in 2016 by founder and CEO Colin Thompson. So, it wasn't like, let me go to Bank of America and get a loan. Let me go to Deutsche Bank. No, let me find an online bank from Spain to get a loan to pay this guy outright the debt that someone else racked up Possibly by committing financial fraud. What the fuck? The stupidest fucking people. And then, so stupid. why would why would he do that? Why not? Certainly out of the charitable. We're not talking about Mother Teresa. We're talking about old Uncle Rob Ellen. Why would he do that? Because he thought that he was going to make even more money selling the suckers this fucking stock in this bullshit. And again, he said the stuff out loud that he's probably supposed to not say out loud. We're looking to pick off shows. We see this is our chance to be a consolidator. You're not consolidating anything. No one thinks you're a competent CEO. Stop it. Stop and it. besides that, you could have been a contender, Rob, but you fucked with Jim Cornette and Brian Last, and now your stock is worth 96 fucking cents, which is more cents than you've got. Let me go back to this article because there's some... By the way, you have my email, Rob. And I believe you probably got my phone number, too, if you ever had the fucking balls. Gutless fucking gum-bumping sack of snake feces. Was there more to the article? Well, by the way, if he does want to call, let's please get that on the air. But uh, let me go to the article. There were some interesting details here. Since Live One announced plans to acquire Cast Media in May, CEO Rob Ellen has not budged on his offer to compensate the podcasters to whom Cast owes millions of dollars. 
Ellen's best offer, one third of the money Cast Media owes them in cash, one third of what they are owed in promissory notes to be paid over two years, <laughs> and one third of what they are owed in stock from Live One subsidiary Podcast One. In exchange, the podcasters must sign a multi year agreement with Podcast One and agree to reduce their cut of ad sales from 80% to as low as 60%. Yeah, well, and also, have we actually documented them actually paying anybody this way? We haven't heard of any money changing hands or any stocks changing hands or anything except this payment to Schaub. Have, and well, no, they did put out a press release uh, maybe two weeks ago when the stock started really nosediving, saying that all these shows, including Brandon Schaub shows, all employees, all shows have received stock, and any cash shows that come over, like Brandon Schaub, receive stock as well. Oh, who, who else has come over? Come over, Red Rover. Uh, some more news or more news. I always get their name wrong, but their there's show. Like two, there's like two shows, right? Yeah. Now, they're still negotiating because, look, I've heard from people that Colin Thompson is still trying to reach out to people and get them to consider making this deal, which benefits him. And it, really would be, shows it would be in the long interesting. Run. It would be interesting to see if these handful of shows, these few shows that you can count on one hand, on the fingers on one hand, even if you're a goddamn ex lumberjack and have had amputation issues, if those shows have yet to receive any stock or any promissory notes or spend any cash, and if they did receive cash, did the fucking green ink come off on their fingers? You know, the podcast one accounting department doesn't have a great reputation. So I'm expecting some cash shows, anyone who makes the move, maybe a few months, maybe a year, but we're going to hear podcast one's not paying us or not paying us on time or we can't get answers from accounting. We'll see. But here's a quote from Rob Ellen. This is from when he talked to Podcast Business Journal on August 11th. We've spoken to every podcaster. We've offered really fair deals, equity in our IPO to help them. No other platform is going to pay them for the past. They're only going to work with them in the future. Yeah, no one wants to work with you to help fix what Colin Thompson did to fuck up the past. That's the problem. The reason no shows have jumped on this deal, no one wants to work with you. The only shows that are working with you are the ones that got forced into this position or the ones that you just paid million, $1.6 million allegedly to to get them on your team, on top of stock or anything else. But that's and, what are, and, and, and what's the bank in Madrid going to have to say about this? That's the interesting thing. Of all the places you can go to borrow some money, publicly traded company, they say they're worth, I mean, the market cap's $45 million for Podcast One. When the stock went public, I think they had it at like $250 million. Oh, come <laughs> on, like, who's making, that's what I'm saying, who's making up these numbers? It's ridiculous. It, they had a... Okay, they said they were valued at $250 million two weeks ago, and now it's $45 million. So that was, that's a great investment to hop on that gravy train. And then the parent company that supposedly owns this goddamn paper mache bullshit, how much should they be worth if, they're, if their subsidiary is worth $45 million and they have to go to a goddamn online dark web place to get... A million and a half bucks to pay off a fucking guy from what he's owed to come to their shitty fucking organization. What? Who, Are you interested in stock? How about instead of some money, I give you some great stock in this company uh, run by me? Now, but now that I just said that, I'm wondering who's paying 96 cents for this bullshit. That you, toilet paper is, is going to be more expensive here pretty soon. You can wipe your ass with this stuff just as well. I'll show you how much I believe in it. 96 cents? Ha! Huh. I'll give you three dollars a share. <laughs> but but who's he giving three dollars a share to? I give it to oh, me. He gave it to himself. He took his hand out of his right pocket and he put it in his left pocket. That's all he's doing, Rob, is just playing pocket pool. But uh, we got a few more things here that are interesting. Again, Dave Brooks wrote this article for Billboard. After announcing Live One's plans to acquire Cast Media in May. Ellen revealed that the deal would only close if 70% of Cast's podcasters would join Live One under the proposed settlement terms. To date, Podcast One has not announced the closing of the Cast Media acquisition. We should jump in there. 
it was carefully worded publicly that it wasn't an acquisition. It was the acquisition of certain assets, not of cast media outright, because if they had purchased cast media outright, all of this debt would be their debt. Right. So they were saying, how do we get Colin's shows? And Colin holds on to the debt. He'll figure something out, but we'll get all the shows and all the revenue streams. This is how it all happened right here. On September 8th, the day Podcast One was listed on NASDAQ, Live One released a statement increasing its revenue and earnings guidance for the year that included Cast Media's revenue and adjusted earnings and assumed, quote, the previously announced Cast Media acquisition would have taken place at the start of the fiscal year, which is April 1st, 2024. So, and they reiterated that guidance on September 27th. Well, yeah, that's all they're doing. You said it at the lead of the uh, the uh, piece there, is they're restructuring their balance sheet. Every time they start to go in the tank, some way or another, they they redo the figures. They read, oh, there's hope here. There's life here. For people who don't have any idea what us crooks are doing, this looks great. I'll read one more thing here. I'll let you finish it because I'm not going to okay. read my own quotes. <laughs> but... The reiteration you were you were heavily referred to in the piece. The reiteration has not helped the company's share price. In July, Value Scope, a third-party valuation firm hired by the parent company Live One, valued Podcast One between 230 and 275 million dollars, <laughs> which came out to eight to twelve dollars per share. A valuation Ellen had hyped to podcasters considering joining Podcast One. How about that? They hired some companies like, yeah, you're worth $275 million. If we take a multiple, if we look at all the money you didn't make and pretend you made it, and then we give you a multiple of a million. <laughs> what? <laughs> that estimate ended up being overly optimistic. Podcast One share price immediately dropped 46%. Let's say 46 cents. 46% after being listed on the NASDAQ and has since tumbled even further. Tumbled! Three weeks after being listed on the NASDAQ, the stock closed Tuesday at $1.91 per share. With a $45 million market cap, a drop of more than 80% after less than three weeks of trading. Rob Ellen is a wizard. He's Tumbledore. <laughs> I'm a wizard. I'll make the money disappear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's gone. <laughs> But I'll let you finish it. I was quoted. I spoke to Dave Brooks for this article. Of course, any media people that have questions about any of this, reach out. We are more than willing to be helpful for anyone looking to investigate any of this. But I was uh, interviewed for this article. Well, and, and here again is the thing they... Th and we've got a pretty good audience, right? We're not, we're not Brendan Schaub. We're not even our friend Theo Vaughn. But we got a pretty good audience. And we've been talking about this for three months from the start. And we knew how this, we predicted how the stock was going to go. We told everybody how this was being worked on. And we got more information as we went. But we've revealed everything. We dared them to fucking sue us or say something to us at the start of this because we knew we were right. And we had the documentation. And when other people, those are apparent, you've heard them started seeing that we weren't getting in trouble for this or running with our tail tucked between our legs or fucking mincing our words, as they say. They started doing the same thing because they were pissed off. They just, unlike us, they ag agree to certain social decorums and norms, and we say, fuck you to that. But now everybody has jumped on this, but still they thought, they thought, Rob Ellen and Colin Thompson, thought that they were going to get by with conning a lot of people out of real money with this stock thing. That was uh, the whole fucking purpose, and that was what they thought they were going to do. And that's why they were threatening us at the start with their little emails, and that's why they were saying all this other shit. Again, Rob, 96 cents, motherfucker. Don't fucking send me a goddamn email talking to me like I'm some fucking asshole running the county fucking fair Ferris wheel. And don't send me a bunch of gibberish that you dictated into your fucking phone in a high wind and doesn't even sound like English. 
If you're supposed to be the goddamn CEO of a multi-million dollar company, you know what you're the CEO now of? A fucking septic tank. And thank Jim Cornette and Brian Last for that. And if you can get Colin out of his closet where he's been hiding, like he's in the fucking London Blitzkrieg, then slap him about to head and face too, because he's the one that led us to you. You bunch of fucking bastards. They thought so, they were the smart ones. That's the insulting thing. Rob Ellen and Colin Thompson, when they hatched this scheme, thought they were the smart ones. They thought the podcasters were the dummies. They're going to be so grateful to get any of their money back that they'll take this bad deal, that they would listen to bullshit. They tried to sell us on this stock. I don't have the exact words in front of me. It's a great way to double up on your revenue <laughs> by owning a piece of the network that you'll be boosting by giving them your fucking ad sales. What a bunch of shit. This was a shitty deal to save Colin Thompson from what he did. Nobody would have known a goddamn thing about it except all these podcasts that got ripped off and pissed off and many of them were under contract where they couldn't really speak. Some of them haven't yet. But they would have got by with this stock thing and maybe it'd still be worth three or four fucking dollars or whatever if we hadn't made sure to let everybody know what the fuck was going on and how to keep a hand on your wallet when you walk past either one of these son of a bitches in a crowded room. So, Rob, Colin, you're welcome. Can you imagine the guy who stole the money from us is like, I advise you to do this. I strongly... So why would anyone listen to you, you fucking boob? The only reason anyone listened to you is because you had the sales team. Other than that, you have nothing. You have nothing. You're a bubblehead. You sleep in the streets. I'm a musician. I, was a, I used to be a musician. Anyone could do stupid fucking ambient music for a podcast. I thought he was the one that was singing soprano at the end of all the jingles. I just love the fact that this guy, who fooled a lot of people, fooled us in terms of thinking he wasn't going to run off with our money, but has fooled other people into thinking he has any idea of what he's doing, or that he has some kind of creative hold on what to do with podcasts. This guy, who has all these true crime shows, apparently these are the only shows he still has under his umbrella, the original productions, which are like, you know, the opportunist. A real true crime look at someone with dramatic music and a narrator telling you the story in a way that's kind of boring, but we'll tell you the story anyway. All this kind of shit. This guy's going to spur a whole industry of shows about him. The guy who has all those shows is about to cause a bunch of shows to be created about him and his shit. And he still thinks he's going to get away with it. Him and that wife of his. Just wait. Yeah. Just wait. You guys have no idea what's happening behind the scenes right now. You're going to wish you had given us our money. You're going to wish you had given us our accounting. And you're going to wish you hadn't fucked around with so many people. These people are better human beings than you. All the people you ripped off, whether it's $16,000 or hundreds of thousands of dollars, all of these people, Colin, are better than you. There'll be more to say about this. Uh, and if, again, legally cleared by Stephen P. New, 877 507 8383. 50 Steve. And by the way, we're better than him, and he knows it. Well, we can't do that. Come on, you can't do that. All right. We're better than him, baby. And he didn't know it, <laughs> but he's about to find out, and he better recognize. That's right. Stephen P. New. Your ass better call somebody. Well, Brian, you know who I'm surprised doesn't sell stock in themselves? They're so high on themselves. I think they're high on huffing their own farts, but apparently the buckaroos, our friends Maddie and Nikki, have taken to Instagram to defend themselves over... The, I guess they're the, there's the... The debate and wrestling over who the cancer is. Was Punk the cancer? Or is the elite the cancer? Or who's the cancer around here? And apparently they're they're so tired and fed up about being called cancers of wrestling and cancers of the locker room that they have taken to Instagram to defend themselves against apparently random fucking fans that are just expressing their opinions. 
Well, I think it probably bothers them the fact that the narrative that they pushed that a lot of people accepted and went with for a long time has switched. People now realize that maybe the Bucks are bullshit artists. Maybe the Bucks well, are full of shit. Maybe AEW would have happened even if the Bucks weren't there. Maybe the Bucks don't mean anything anymore. Maybe all the things that people loved about the Bucks are meaningless now. And the Bucks mean you less. Mean sort, of like the, sort of like the hula hoop and the pet rock. You talking about they were a fad? It was kind of temporary insanity. People were caught up in the whole bullet train or bullet club thing, and they slipped in and took advantage of people who were also mesmerized by the the whole group thing and thought that they were integral parts of it. Talking about Maddie and Nikki, are you are you saying something like that? I think that's actually a fair comparison. I think Matt and Nick may be the hula hoop and pet rock of AEW let alone wrestling. Well, but they're, they're, they're pissed off pet rocks. Well, they don't like anyone pointing that out. Again, you know, we saw the way it played out with you, where they didn't like the fact that you didn't accept everything they did as being great, and then it became this passive-aggressive campaign to discredit you, put you down, embarrass you, anything they could do, and they put things out there like he's out of touch, he's a shock jock, then you'd see Dave Meltzer start repeating the actual verbiage used by these people. Well, just because he's their mouth organ. So again, they don't like anyone that says anything other than the Bucks are great and they should do whatever they want forever. Anyone who says anything else, they're a problem. But how do they have time to argue about this with random people on Instagram? If they're running this big multi-million dollar organization they got going. What do they work, a day a week, two, two days a week? That's how. Well, hey, mailing out all that merchandise, well, his wife does that, I forgot. They don't move that much merch anymore, but let's go to this someone, and I don't know who this is, Pipe Bomb Gee on Instagram. I don't even know what they were responding to, but they just put cancer of wrestling. And for the record, this person's avatar is a picture of CM Punk. Nick Jackson on Instagram at Nick Jackson YB replied why it should be the question is why be nick jackson ha ha helping get hundreds of wrestlers and production crew jobs and creating an alternative to wrestling is a weird way to think we're a cancer to wrestling but please keep thinking that silly and i they have admitted from their own chicken lips they are an alternative to wrestling now, hold on here one second. Now, we talked about kayfabe being in the dictionary, but I have right here the American Heritage Dictionary. That's better than Merriam-Webster. We don't know if Merriam-Webster is all American or not. But alternative... Hold on. All American? What does that have to do with it? Well, the, the American Heritage Dictionary, you, <laughs> you have all the kinds of American heritage in here. I've never heard anyone say, I don't like that Merriam-Webster dictionary. They're not all American. Well, we don't know where they come from. I want my dictionaries made in America. Say, we need, we need to go to alternative, uh, at a, altitude, alternator, alternative. The choice between two or more exclusive possibilities. Allowing or necessitating a choice between two or more things. So... If you have a choice between two or more things, that means you have a choice between wrestling or them. Wrestling or their routine. That's what it is. You can go, you could be a wrestling fan and enjoy wrestling. And some of them are fans of the Young Bucks routine. But there's a difference between the trapeze act and the boxer. They're well, different here, things. Here's another thing. They said, we got hundreds of wrestlers and production personnel most of them, our own personal friends, they could have added. That's what they did. Tony Khan was mesmerized by the fact that these stars of Japanese wrestling would speak to him. And he was convinced that they knew what the fuck they were doing. There was a reason why none of them. The Buckaroos have been close to a national television promotion and used in the middle, if that. But none of the rest of their circle had ever made a goddamn impression on any major company because they weren't good enough to do anything. But they got them jobs with the billionaire, whether it be his wife doing in, in charge of merchandise for a, a national wrestling promotion, or whether it be Brandon Cutlet 
wandering around. How long was he on television? I'm sure he's still there. They're still paying him. But it was he's their fucking friend from grade school. It, all the outlaw people. It was, hey, we got the fucking gravy train here. They're all going to be beholden to us because we're going to get them jobs because this guy doesn't know any better that they're not ready for national TV and they never will be. And they got a bunch of people thinking that the moon rises in their ass because they got them a job doing their dream job that they're not qualified for. And they don't like hearing when people call them out for keeping these people employed instead of people that are qualified for the positions that their friends are in. The Puddin', the Puddin gang is on national TV, for fuck's sake. Chuck Taylor shouldn't be able to park cars at an NBA arena. And again, Tony and Shad Khan gave all these people jobs because Tony Khan was a lifelong wrestling fan who wanted to start a wrestling company. It just so happens the Young Bucks were hot at that moment. If they weren't there, it would have been Tony trying to start something with Omega and Jericho. He would have probably tried to get Punk at that time like he did. He would have tried to get Jim Cornette at that time like he did. And various other people. Just no Young Bucks. But they make it sound like they were writing the checks with Tony. Which isn't the case at all. And like you said, no. they got a lot of their friends' jobs. Christopher hey, Daniels. Hey, what, what would happen if the, young bucks, if the Young Bucks had called up TBS and said, Hey, we need a meeting. We, we're we're going to do a TV show and put it on your network. And they'd say, And who are you again? Yeah, and all national TV has done is expose the Young Bucks as being not, Indie. not as popular as people want to pretend they are. Someone who drives off viewers, or a team that drives off viewers, bad skits, bad acting, bad comedy that clearly the audience doesn't care about. If you're into their matches, you get some of those matches. You don't really get those matches anymore. You see everything that you've seen every time. How many times have you seen Nick Jackson run and hold someone's hand to jump on the rope and catch the other hey, guy with his no, feet? No, no, wait a minute. He vaults over the top rope and gives the guy the face smash and then does a neat little backward roll across the second rope and does a backflip off the apron. You've seen it a million times. You've seen every single move that they do a million times. There's nothing new, but that was the rather dim-witted of the Bucks. The other Buck had some comments here, too. The, wait a minute, the smart one, Pie Face, he jumped in on it? The mouthy one, Pie Face, had something to say here. I hope CM Punk stops punching me. No, here's what he said. <laughs> we changed the business and we'll be discredited until the day we're both buried in the ground. But the ones who know... No. <laughs> Forever grateful that I've not been on this journey alone so that I know it wasn't all just a dream. Love you, brother. Oh, good Lord. They'll be discredited until they're both buried. You'll be discredited after you're buried in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to end there, there, you idiot. No, no, no. <laughs> this, the video will live on. The audio will live on. People will hand these tales down to their... Sons and grandsons, you will always be known as a couple of smarmy little fucking twats. And you're going to be less over tomorrow than you were today, and you're less over today than you were the day before, and this just keeps going, and... You're less over today than yesterday, but only half as over as tomorrow. Da -da -da -da. Or something like that. Well, I just, uh, before we wrap this up, I do want to thank Nick Jackson and Matt Jackson for creating hundreds of jobs for everyone across uh, AEW. I, you know, we, we should thank selfless them. People. We should thank them for giving us endless material with their fucking obnoxiousness. The obnoxiousness of them. You know, let's face it. If they, if they would keep their mouth shut and their heads down, they came in totally unqualified for the business that they were pursuing. They fucking lucked up and got a goddamn cult following for their cheerleading routines, which lasted for a couple of years, long enough to impress a billionaire's son who's easily impressed and get in with the right people in the group that the group migrated over and got put on national television. We should applaud that, I guess, because... Where else in any other line of work is somebody that less qualified and that incompetent for what the 
position is supposed to be achieve that level. You got to hand it to them in one way. I hand it to them. You know what? If we really are honest, what they did on the indies was pretty incredible because they, they were the first ones to get what I always thought someone should do, which is to push. If you were an indie wrestler, push yourself the way you would push an indie band. That was really successful with the merch, with the way you promote your shows, which making the shows themselves a thing. They got all that down. They are the most successful independent wrestling tag team ever. And it may be tough for anyone to ever surpass that. They got everything down except the wrestling. That's right. They look like shit and they wrestle like cheerleaders. And they weren't able to do the wrestling properly or professionally. So they instead created an audience for a parody of wrestling, clown wrestling, trampoline cowboy wrestling, whatever you want to call it. And the bad skits. And the bad skits. And that's gotten old. And it doesn't last. And people move on from meaningless horse shit like that. And people have moved on from them in large part. Yeah. But in the process, they created the core audience of this particular fucking promotion that just goes expecting to see bad, fake, silly, sloppy fucking wrestling. And those are the ones that they draw on that reaction to see we're right. But the problem with that is, is that nobody is ever going to fucking join that group to make their crowds bigger by feeding them more bad, silly, fake, phony fucking wrestling. So they're caught as long as Tony can't get his head out of his ass and just back up and hire experienced, competent, serious people because they can't exist with children. And again, the Young Bucks used to be able to boost an indie crowd. Now it's the opposite. AEW comes back to a town. It's almost across the board the crowd's going to be down significantly. They keep going back to these places, and you hear they had 4,000 last time. They only had 2,000 this time. They're not able to pick up people. The Young Bucks hit their peak in terms of being able to pick up new fans, being able to get fans interested, being able to get fans to buy into their whole spiel. That's all gone now. So now they're just two guys on the roster who are no more over than anyone else on the roster. In fact, you could say that they're not as over as other people on the roster. And they're not really used particularly well either. But they make as much money as the main eventers. So what's the point of the whole thing? Tony wanted to play with him. Tony's got his little toys for the next few years. And, well, the one thing at Nick, I didn't know Nick was such a badass. He kicked the shit out of two of the biggest men in the company the other night. We'll talk about that in a minute, but don't get on his bad side just because he's five foot seven and 175 pounds and looks like he's never met a fucking muscle. Uh, he apparently is a badass. He was throwing him around. Just like Ace Steel threw that chair. I'll tell you what, you know what the problem is? <laughs> what the problem is, Brian, the problem is we're watching the wrong show. We need new shows to watch. We're seeing the same old thing from these repetitious one-trick ponies. We need a whole new world of entertainment opened up to us. That's what we need. I agree. I, I like where you're going with this. Where are you going with this? Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to South Korea. And oh. I'm gonna watch. I'm going to watch Parasite. What? I, because apparently it's on, it's available there in South Korean, uh, uh, the South Korean Netflix. It's a movie? Parasite? It's, it's, it's something. It's a Korean drama. And that's why I'm studying Korean right now, so I can watch it. But folks, if you want to watch anything from around the world, there are no restrictions anymore. Because you know, you know. I know. You, you know. know. You know that I know that we know the, the people at ExpressVPN. That's what I was trying to say. You got me all verklempt there. Our friends at ExpressVPN are opening up a whole new world for you fine folks because apparently I didn't realize how bad we were getting screwed. Brian, you know, we've talked about ExpressVPN is a good way to get the people out of your walls. Your internet service providers are putting these spies in your house. We've gone over that. It's been documented. It's been on all the news. But now 
I'm finding out too here in the United States of America, we don't get access to hundreds, maybe even thousands of programs that are geographically blocked and they're only available in other countries. The, the, the Office is on UK Netflix. Now, The Office is also on my television, but it might be somebody else's office. Well, no, there's another office from the UK. The original version of the show was from the BBC. Oh, I didn't know what Moxley and Claudio had to do with this. I've never seen them on. Maybe they're on the UK version of The Office. Well, if you had ExpressVPN that could fire up the UK Netflix, you'd be able to watch Moxley and Claudio on their office over there. Because ExpressVPN lets you control where you want sites to think that you're located. Let's say the kids are fighting about which show to watch. Well, the last thing you want is violence among children. So you just send the kids to South Korea. Or maybe you send them over to the United Kingdom. Or maybe you send the little crumb snatchers wait, just anywhere they want to go. Wait, what are you talking about? You're time talking about you can send the kids to another country no. so they can watch the television programs that they enjoy that's through not, ExpressVPN. That's exactly not the way it happens, no. Well, it says you can choose from almost 100 different countries. Think of all the Netflix libraries that you could go through. Just go yourself. Yeah, all the Netflix libraries in 100 different countries, You, they give you the address of the particular library, they send you to that country, and you go through that library and see what you want to watch. And it's not just Netflix. ExpressVPN works with any streaming service. Hulu, we just talked about their hoops. The BBC iPlayer, YouTube, you name it. And ExpressVPN is unlike the hundreds of other VPNs out there, the ones with shoddy workmanship and poor customer service. ExpressVPN is ridiculously fast. There's never any buffering or any lagging or any drooping. And, and, you, and there's no leaking. You can stream in HD with no problem whatsoever. Have you ever tried to stream in HD and your screen starts leaking, Brian? No, I don't think that's the way it works. I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. Well, no, ExpressVPN brings you all these programs in all these different places that you're not supposed to see. And, and I mean, some places, you know, there's age restrictions on some of these. Yeah, you have to be over 50 years of age to watch this program or whatever. You can get rid of all of that. You can watch of any age, any place, anytime, anywhere. It's a free world out there. And it works on all your devices, phones, media consoles, smart TVs. What about the stupid ones? That'd be a tube TV. They don't really manufacture those anymore. Well, I've got several. But they don't manufacture but, them anymore. Well, I've still got them. So as long as they exist, how, how, what difference does it make how old they are? That's ageism, Brian. I didn't say right. anything about the age. Well, and you better not. Right now, folks, if you want to get access to hundreds of new TV shows that you have never seen or you'd like to see again, as well as going to countries that you've never seen before and possibly would like to visit, ExpressVPN.com can send you to hundreds of locations where you can watch anything. Sometimes these people don't even know they're being watched, which adds an element of voyeurism to it. And no, boy, that's that's just exciting. No, that's not the way it works. You're going to be watching authorized programming. Just from another country and authorized websites, just from another country, things you may not have access to, but it won't be any sort of peeping Tom voyeuristic. Well, how do these people know you're watching them? Who? What do you, people? Do they get a memo? The people from these other countries that we're going to be keeping an eye on through ExpressVPN. No, that's not how it works. You watch pro If there's a program airing in India, you'd have access to watching the show from India. Yeah, but they you might can't not spy know on the people. They're, they might not know that somebody is watching them in Poughkeepsie. They might be prepared that people in India will know what they're up to, but you know, people all around the world, you, you could drop in and spy on people like no, that. No, you absolutely cannot spy on anyone with this, and uh, in general, it's probably illegal to do any of these spying techniques that you would like to do. However, if you are in America and would like to access the WWE Network from overseas, this is a wonderful way to do that. Well, you could do that too, but just keep an eye out, make sure they don't spot you, because then they'd know you're watching. Right now, folks, go to expressvpn.com slash JCE, and you're going to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. So whatever you purchase, 
You're going to get three more months of it for absolutely nothing. Gratis. That means you pay nothing at expressvpn.com slash JCE. That's to learn more about this exciting opportunity for you to travel around the world and see exotic locations no. and spy on people that don't no. know they're being no. watched. No, you will sit at home and you will go to your computer and you will watch programs and leave people alone because there's no way to use this and spy on people. That was the funny portion of the spot, but the reality of the spot is that you could use ExpressVPN and access wonderful programs like the Great British Spelling Bee or sewing bee, not spelling bee. <laughs> sewing bee from England. You don't want to watch their spelling bee. You know that there's a lot be, of U's a, in those words. There'd be a wrinkle thrown in there with all the U's in those words. That's right. I just said that. Well, I was reiterating it. And who are you to tell people what to do? You will go to your computer and you will do this and that and the other thing. Who died and left you, boss, as Mama Cornette used to say? No one died, and I'm not trying to be the boss. I'm trying to help people on their express journey. Well, be a journey. little nicer. I suggest that if you would please go to your computer and please go to expressvpn.com slash JCE, and you'll be so excited at the wonderful things that you'll find there and the ways that you could keep an eye on people Against their will. ExpressVPN.com no, keep it, no, no. slash JCE. There will be no one you'll be watching against their will, and of course that's part of the fun. Who knows? They portion. may like it. No one will why like it. Why else are they in front of the window with no clothes on? I don't understand how you think this works. You think there's just like random camera people linked up to ExpressVPN? Well, it says you're going to get access to a bunch of shows that you've never seen before. That that are only available in other countries and not available here to you and me, us normal folks. That means professionally produced programs, not... It's not a show just to have some guy film someone on a balcony. Well, I've seen some cable access that would disagree. Well, this is not cable access, ladies and gentlemen. This is ExpressVPN. What's are you the promo saying code? that it, ExpressVPN, you can't get access to cable? That's not what I'm saying. Well, then there you go. No, there I do not go. There you don't go. I go where I go. But there's a difference between cable access and access to cable. What's the promo code again, Jim? Wait a minute, you got... What? Give me that again. You got to go north to go east. What? There's a difference between... ExpressVPN.com <laughs> 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 slash JCE. <laughs> difference a, between access to cable and cable X. <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is. Well, speaking of cable access, did you watch any wrestling this week? <laughs> yes, I've got, I have access to my cable, thank you. I watched the SmackDown. Are we ready to layeth the smacketh down? Possibly. Uh, For some of it, at least. Oh, boy. Um. Well, the, the bloodline, I'm... I'm getting, I'm loving Jimmy Uso because he's so over the top with how he just thinks that he's just nominated him to come himself to come back in and he's telling everybody what to do and he's putting his feet up on the desk and Roman's not around. So he's taking it upon himself to be the most uh, boisterous member and he's doing a great job with it. And they started the pro and this was SmackDown for September 29th, by the way, we're at the end of the month already. And it was Heyman and Jimmy and Solo in the ring. And have you noticed that Paul's hair now is, it's not like going gray, like from where he was dying it, like the roots are growing out. It's like it's going gray from front to back with a black stripe running through the sides of it. He looks like a negative of a fat skunk. <laughs> have you seen? <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's white on top and it's white on the bottom. It's a black stripe going around. It only goes around the fucking sides there's nothing on the top it's probably the hair dye washing out as we're watching it <laughs> anyway um it's just evaporating it's like invisible ink so they pitched to the last week the contract signing thing with cena but he's got no partner because they heard aj and la Knight had covid but we're not supposed to know that and then AJ the has COVID too. Um, or not AJ, but LA Knight. You said AJ and LA Knight have COVID. No, they. I said they hurt AJ and oh. LA Knight has COVID. I thought LA Knight and AJ were having a good time, and they both got COVID. 
No, no. They they used protection. That's not what I meant, but, but um, go ahead. Well, we, well, it, clarify what you mean before I take off with it. But nevertheless, so... And in Heyman, the, the story they're telling is Cena's had transportation issues, but he, he's expected to make it there, but he's not there yet. So they can... A, a good little fucking detail covered. They can run roughshod all night, and Cena is not there to do anything about it. And AJ's in the hospital. And, you know, between this and have you noticed there's a lot of similarity between the two companies now of where there's a contract signing and or there's a guy that needs a partner and the guy shows up just in the nick of time or all these and the hospital thing. Is it a rule now that since they're in the fucking a different city every week that the guy that's in the hospital has to check out of the hospital and go to the next city and check in one there? Because it kind of looks like it with in AEW with Roderick Strong. He's constantly coming out of the hospital, but they're in a different city every week. Anyway, Jimmy snatched the microphone and does his, did his shtick about, you know, Cena's scared of him and he's just, you know, he's the big dog now. And then suddenly, at least with no music, Carl Anderson hit the ring and attacked the bloodline, and he's obviously pissed because he's one of AJ's guys. And the heels went to the fucking floor, and Paul whispered at Solo, and then Solo told Jimmy that he better handle this or elsewise I will. And they just went to the break before anybody handled anything. And I guess now they've just figure for the limited number of people they're left with the the regulars even on SmackDown, two million people every week, an extra few hundred thousand when The Rock shows up. They'll know that we just went to the break, that the show is not over, there's a match coming up. They'll just know these things. And when they came back, there was Jimmy Uso against Carl Anderson. And it wasn't Carl's night. He got beaten about two minutes. <laughs> and then Solo spiked him. And left him laying. And as the heels were leaving, they crossed paths with Mia Yim. That's become another thing where people are crossing in the entranceway. She's going out to see about old Carl. And she slapped the piss out of Jimmy Uso. And that was that. Are you excited, I, to, are you excited to see the Jimmy Uso-Mia Yim match? Uh no well see they can't have that because that's uh, the enter the entering of the genders. So instead, because he got pissed, they're going around beating up everybody else all night. I don't want to add too much other than to say I agree with you. I thought the bloodline has needed something for a while. I still do, but the new Jimmy Uso has been really good. <laughs> He's been really good. And uh, and you just know that Roman's going to have to say something to him when he gets back. And then they also had uh, uh, Escobar and Rey Mysterio in separate backstage interviews killing each other with kindness about their big championship match that was going to come up later on tonight. And then the Grayson Waller effect. And I'm what is the Grayson Waller effect? Declining ratings, diminished interest in the product. What is the Grayson Waller effect? So Grayson Waller brought out Lashley, who basically said that he made a mistake. The street profits didn't have enough Pride to make it, so he's going back to the drawing board. Fuck it, right? And the prophets come out and try to talk to him, and he tells them no excuses. If you want something from me, then prove you deserve it. And he walked off on him. And that was that. And then Waller introduced Theory, who started his entrance, and they went to a break. When they also, come also, he had a little bit of a face to face with Bobby Lashley in the aisle. Oh yeah, then and, and they got to pass each other and and give each other sideways glances. And that was pretty much what happened in that whole segment, right? I mean, I mean he Lashley said I made a mistake, bug it. Profits came out, no. Nope. Walked off on him. Yeah, let's it, uh we we can keep moving. I just want to say I agree with you. I think Waller whatever they see in him wherever that may be, He's not doing anything special with this talk show. Anyone could be in that spot doing this. It's all about whatever happened, like in this case with Lashley and the Street Profits, but 
Yeah, I'm not feeling Grayson Waller at all. I mean, there are people who keep telling us we're wrong. What? But I don't see it at all. There, there's no there there. He's not doing anything groundbreaking verbally because he just does the same old WWE scripted heel shit where he puts himself over in a disingenuous manner and gives catty comments at, at other people and is loud and has a set and there's no physique. The work is nothing special. He can talk a lot, but I'm not sure people want to listen to him. I don't see him kicking in and, and something being serious and being a money drawing level interaction with anybody with him. But he did introduce Austin Theory, who came out and had a match with Cameron Grimes. And this actually was probably the thing that I most enjoyed on the program in the way of the wrestling, because Again, both guys are great. Theory is a natural, and Cameron Grimes is from North Carolina, so he gets wrestling. And, you know, all their shit looked fine, and they, they kept the action going and the pace, but you could tell from the start that they they must have had no time because they never slowed down. And basically, that was true. They They went three minutes. And then Theory posted Cameron Grimes and Grams took Graham Grams. Grimes took a great post and a great bump off the post. And then Theory rolled him in and hit his finish perfectly. Looked like a million dollars. One, two, three. It was a three minute match. It was the best three minutes so far. But I love the idea of Theory beating people in quick succession, but I wish that we could have seen something from Cameron Grimes before he got to be the three-minute job guy. Have we even seen him on this show in the last few weeks? I haven't seen him in a while. You but know, uh, he, he had so much going for him in NXT, and then all of a sudden he cut his hair, he shaved his chest hair. Yeah. And he hasn't done anything on the main roster, and it's a shame. He has a lot of talent. And, of course, they made him quite silly at NXT, but if he was being him rather than the over-the-top version, he was great. But... So now, basically, in the first 45 minutes of the show, we've had five minutes of actual wrestling on the screen. And it don't pick up too much. Well, it, it does in terms of amount of wrestling, but they, oh, they did the deal where the bloodlines ro roaming around backstage beating up people because Jimmy's pissed, and they were beating up Ashante Adonis. And, and did you like B-Fab screaming and waving her hands over... Waving her hands in the air like she just didn't care. She was pretty good in this segment. I mean, it added some realism to it, but it does say... I mean, the, I hate to say the only thing I was thinking watching this was, wow, they really got rid of Top Dollar and kept them. Yeah, yeah. What is Top Dollar thinking right now? He's thinking, can I go back to finding lost treasures? <laughs> so, then they had the U.S. title match, which was Rey Mysterio and our friend Pablo Escobar. And by the time the bell rang, we were 52 minutes into the program with five minutes of wrestling. And the long match that we get is a baby face match. And haven't they? We saw he knocked Ray out and they had to stop the match. And they've been, they've wrestled more since they've been friends than they wrestled each other when they were on opposite sides and they were enemies, have they not? Well, they've been teasing something happening with them for a few weeks, but I believe uh, they've wrestled a few times. And, of course, they also showed Dragon Lee at ringside. They made him a part of this. Well, and see, now we're cooking. Because uh, the thing is, did you see where they had to wheel the kitty seat up to the front row Will so you that he stop could see, it? Uh, see over the barricade oh, from the front it. row there? with the? I actually thought him being held back in the crowd was one of the best parts of this. Well, that's like being the nicest guy in prison. It Both those things can be true. It could have been one of the best parts. Now, there wasn't anything the matter with the match. Of course, the they didn't care a lot about it because during the match, they were cutting to the back where Solo and Uso were beating up random people wandering down the hall. But they went through two breaks. With Ray's Hame, always... Go with, ahead. with Heyman looking kind of horrified, but walking... And well, yeah. Them. Well, Heyman is not... 
in favor of any of this because Jimmy's going off and picking fights with, as we'll hear later on, picking fights with people he's not supposed to pick fights with, and he's out of control. And Heyman's wandering around with those bug eyes like, oh, my God, here we go. But as far as this match went, it it was good. Ray's always good. The fans are into him. Escobar's trying hard. He needs some more than one expression on his face in a match a, a lot of times. But it went through two breaks, and it's a baby face match. And, and like you said, they've been teasing something's going to happen, but nothing ain't happened yet. And then finally, Ray rolled him up one, two, three. And then he helps him up, and they start to talk. And, you know, Ray, et cetera, but there's no handshake because then the prophets hit and beat both of them up. And Lashley comes out smiling and encourages them to beat them up some more. And then the heels left. So we don't know whether there would have been a handshake because that got interrupted. But from the start of the introductions of the match to the out of the heels kicking the shit out of the baby faces, it's 28 fucking minutes. 28 minutes. I'm not going to complain too much because I thought it was an all right segment and an all right match. And at least now we kind of know a little bit more about where the street profits are finally going. They are heels with Lashley, like we thought. And again, Dragon Lee tried to jump into the fray. They had him at ringside. So it says something that WWE sees something in him that they want to do something with. And I guess the issues with Escobar and Ray are still up in the air. I almost thought Ray was going to turn heel for a second there because Escobar is just playing such a nice guy. Yeah. And also, Ray subtly was wearing an all-black outfit. Yeah, good point. So, you know, but, and and then after that, by the way, I mentioned 28 minutes, but when they came back from the break, they did a recap of what had just happened, and then Ray and Escobar challenged for a tag team match, playa, on the pay-per-view, so let's add another three minutes. So they were, they had 31 minutes of television time on this program. But now they're going to be partners at the pay-per-view. There's alliteration there all over the place. So could something happen if they lose that match and then one blames the other? Or are they just going to milk this cow until it's dry? And then whose side will the LWO take? Well, they would take the the side of the Latino. Well, no, I guess Ray and Escobar are kind of both the Latino leaders of the LWO, right? Because Escobar was with those other guys before they were in this group. Zelina just kind of came along, and then Ray was doing his own thing with Dominic. Well, then they better take the side of the heel Latino, because elsewise, if the babyface has the group and the heel's all by himself, well, that's just odd. Well, we'll see what happens. They made a big announcement about the signing of Jane Cargill, your favorite new WWE superstar. Can you remember when they made that big of a deal about anybody else on the program? The quotes, the comments, the social media pictures, the whole nine yards, the announcers putting her over. No, I mean, it's been a while, but again, they're getting someone who was presented as a top star in AEW. Someone who, in the week that the news has been out there, has gotten a shit ton of publicity for it, so you might as well ride it. Well, but listen, here's the thing. They've never once mentioned AEW. I don't think this has anything to do with how she was or wasn't presented in AEW. And the reason I say that is because they have, they've just said industry-renowned. They couldn't say only worked for one promotion in the history of her career. But somebody's got an idea for that girl. We're going to see an eye pop, an outfit. We're going to see an entrance. We're going to see a presentation. We're going to see something. Somebody's got an idea for her that they love. And, and whether it's Vince or whether it's the new ownership or a combination or whatever, they didn't talk about Cody like this when they signed him back and he'd been there before. And he was a whole lot bigger deal in AEW than, he, than Jane was. This is specifically because it's her and whatever they're going to have her do, they are goddamn in love with, is what I'm saying. 
Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Can't, I can't add too much to that. I mean, I think she has a lot of ideas too. Remember, even though she was a heel, she had pretty spectacular babyface entrances in AEW for big events. Well, yeah, but a lot dance routines, again, all sorts of stuff. A lot of talent in a lot of places has had ideas of their own and they didn't make a bit. I'm saying that this is a vested interest of somebody really important that they've got this fucking gimmick or whatever they want her to do. And they're going to push this thing to the moon. And it's not because they got an AEW star. It's because they got this particular person. You don't think it's just going to be her with her same AEW gimmick or her gimmick just presented better. Yeah, it will be her presented in a big budget, probably different, grandiose way, and they're going to push it to the moon, whatever it is. So I can't specifically say what they're going to do for it, not knowing what it is. But they didn't change her name, and she probably wouldn't want to. And they shouldn't. And well, and they. You know, I'm against the whole goddamn owning everybody's name thing just because it makes it impossible for anybody to be a star anymore. But uh, but yes, especially because she's been on national television. But uh, but yeah, it, I don't think it's because it's an AEW signing or it, it's it's because it's that person. Because they have not even treated, as I said, Cody. They gave him a big push right off, but they didn't dropped down to their knees and sala bim just the fucking fact that he had signed a contract to this extent. But did you like the video on Pretty Deadly? No, I didn't like the Which one last week and I didn't like the one this week. Purely dreary. This was such unfunny, fake bullshit. It should have been on AEW television. This was not even... The WWE is often silly and stupid, but there's still some element of professionalism to it when it's silly and stupid. This was just fucking rotten. And I don't like these fucking guys anyway, and they look like idiots. And then comes the, the whatever this was. They should never do this again. I think they should clip this from the tape and never show it on the cock anymore. So Charlotte wrestled Bailey. What'd you think, Brian? You know, I was kind of fast forwarding a little bit by this point. Mm -hmm. It was drear. We were an hour and fucking almost an hour and 40 minutes into the program. I love Charlotte. Bailey's okay, but we knew who was going to win, which she did Charlotte. Then the heels minister. And then Oscar came out to save and ran him off and screamed in Japanese. And at, then, at EO, who's Japanese. At EO. But hold on, here's what I'm saying. She, meaning Oscar, was screaming in Japanese at EO, but Bailey accepted an alleged triple threat match with EO versus Oscar versus Charlotte for the women's title that allegedly she had asked for, but that as the announcers pointed out, that would mean that Bailey must speak fluent Japanese. So whether she asked for that or not, Bailey accepted the match. And then EO got this stunned look on her face. Who would have thought there, the, the, the heel women's group can't get along with each other either. There's constant strife in these organizations. That was that right. Smackdown rolls on. And then finally, what they'd been milking since the start and what anybody who watched this program would have been dying to see by now, here came John Cena, because he finally got there. The plane was late, but it arrived. And he does the music entrance. They've got 10 minutes left on the air. The babies are th being thrown into the sky, the Cena chants. And he cut the promo and explained it perfectly and succinctly. He wants the match. He wants a match. He wants to fight. He's got a contract with the bloodline that he asked for, but he's got no partner. So he can rip it up and act like it never happened, or he can go it alone. And then he asked the fans, what do you think a guy would never give up on his T-shirt is going to say? And he gets a big pop. 
and he's going to honor the contract by himself if he can't find a partner. And this only took like a minute and a half or so for him to do, and he did it perfectly. He laid out the fucking deal. And in here comes Solo and Uso and Paul. And Uso's laughing at him. And they all start to get in the ring, and then Cena gets proactive, and he nails Uso off the apron, and then he dares Solo to get in, and he picks him up for the attitude adjustment, formerly the FU. But by that time, Uso is back up, hits super kick, and they get heat on Cena. And they clear off the announce desk, and Solo is going up as my Jay was, or Jimmy was going up, and then they say, oh, wait a minute, Solo, you go up. And Solo's going to splash off the top rope onto the desk onto fucking Cena. And now the LA Knight music hits, and here comes LA Knight running to the ring. Monster pop, bigger than Cena's. Huge pop, because they knew Cena was supposed to come out, but now they got the pop of L.A. Knight, and it's a surprise, too, and it's at the right moment. And he hits the ring and makes a big comeback. The L.A. elbow, the heels powder. L.A. Knight picks up the contract and signs it. Cena gets shocked face. Oh, my God, to sell it like this is big. The heels were mad. The fans were happy. Now, that was 10 minutes of fucking wrestling television. We just had to wait an hour and 50 minutes to see it. Well, that's SmackDown. That's how they do it. The only thing I didn't like, Cena was being too hokey with his facial reactions to LA Knight signing. Oh, yeah, but, well, it's John's face. He's got an element of hope to that face anymore. <laughs> I didn't well, expect that to it. be your explanation. For well, no, think about it. When he was when he was young and he didn't have any wrinkles and he didn't have the bald spot and he had that strong chin, he looked like a goddamn genetic experiment. But now that he's lost a little bit of weight because he can't stay jacked up, you know, constantly and in Hollywood and he's lost a little bit of hair and he's got a couple of wrinkles now he's looking a little bit more like Jim Varney. So you got to go with that and do the Ernest Ghost camp face. All right. Well, a bizarre defense of John Cena's faces there, comparing him to Jim Varney. There's a bit of hope there now, but Mother Nature put it there, so he's just got to go with it. But he was putting L.A. Knight over and how shocked he was that, that this had happened, especially yeah. since <laughs> just seven days ago, L.A. Knight was sent home with COVID when it was supposed to happen. Again, I thought it was a good segment. I just thought Cena's silly faces were too much, but I didn't think of the fact that he now looks like Jim Varney, so that excuses it. <laughs> that explains it perfectly, doesn't it? It does, I guess. Ernest goes to SmackDown. Yeah, Ernest goes to SmackDown. Co-starring L.A. Knight. That's a big budget production a studio's going to be putting out. It's going to be a Mammoth Pictures. Jed Clampett recently sold that fucking studio. I'll have you know. That pop that LA and I got coming out there, man. I mean, we knew people were getting into him, but they got completely behind him now. Well, and also because, again, after either the boredom or the quick matches or the constant blathering that they've heard, that I'm talking about the audience in the arena that night, they get the biggest star on the card. They get him to lay out the deal. It's moving. It's not dragging. He lays out the deal. The heels come out to create fucking jeopardy. And just when it looks bad for goddamn John Cena, here comes the second most popular fucking guy on the roster to make the save. They couldn't have done it any better. And so, and that was a way to send the people home. And they, they might think, wow, I'd go back and see that again instead of goddamn, how long were we there? Right? Well, that was WWE SmackDown. Yeah, it's did you just hang up on me? Hello? I hit my mouse. Oh. I, I hit my mouse mid-sentence. I moved my hand like on a waving motion. <laughs> so that's SmackDown, and I smacked my mouse. But that was SmackDown, and this is your show. Well, why are you being cruel to your pets over there? Smacking your mouse. <laughs> Yeah. <sighs>
Boy, that trip through time is getting longer every week, folks. It's all it's almost like we're riding a bicycle through time at this point. But yes, that was an unscheduled bit of time travel. We are now in the future from where we were just moments ago. As far as you know, we were uh we had to take an unscheduled break. I had another hospital trip, and I'm pleased to report that my cousin Larry, for the first time in a couple of weeks, is uh, is speaking to people and is uh, aware of the fact that they're there and can carry on conversations. And the physical therapy people actually got him out of bed and stood him up a couple of times. And he's uh, currently scheduled to be released to go to a physical therapy facility so they can start that process. But nevertheless, that's good news. And Speaking of hospitals and people who need medical attention on the on the obverse side of things, Brian Last, your slight allergic sniffles yesterday that you were sloughing off as nothing has apparently turned into a full blown case of what is that, SARS or RSV or whatever. I, apparently you're gonna be all right for the rest of the program as long as I don't make you laugh or speak. Is that correct? Jim, we are in the future. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to do my very best. <clears throat> Apologies to Jay Sharknado in advance for what's about to happen. Are you going to be wheezing or slobbering or snotting about? All of the above. Well, and more. Good. And more. Co cover all the bases with a good, good layer of slime there. You look like you've got Vaseline running down your chin, I've, I've, apparently right now, from what I've been told. Anyway, nevertheless, you know what I did last night, don't you? I'm afraid to ask. I just told you I went to the hospital, oh, but you know... that's right. Cousin Larry. You know what I did there? You saw Cousin Mo and Cousin Shemp? No, it's, it's, it's his, actually his other brother Larry came in. But nevertheless... I realized that the whole reason for all of the, the the illness that was going on was he was sleeping on the wrong kind of thing. I took that hospital bed mattress. It felt like a, a gunny sack of hot steel balls, and I threw it right out the window, and I had installed on the sperm of the moment a Helix sleep mattress right there in his hospital room on his hospital bed. And I'll have you know, within 12 hours, boom, he was nipping up. He was doing jumping jacks when I when I last left the room. He had been feeling up some of the nurses. No, let's not recovery. say that. Let's not make him some pervert. Well, no, he'd just been making sure that they they didn't have anything on him, that they any contraband. They weren't trying to smuggle anything out of his room or whatever. That's what he was doing. Just a little pat down, like the TSA people. But nevertheless, it shows you the healing properties of the Helix Sleep Mattress. As a matter of fact, come to find out, that's where the he, or the heel, the in he. Helix comes from, is the healing <laughs> properties. Because I understand that they they have consulted with, a, with an ancient Mayan medicine man to uh, have only the finest natural ingredients in these mattresses, and they have incredible healing properties, especially if you burn a certain type of plant right before you go to sleep, according to the Mayans. And this is None of this is according to the Mayans, and the Mayans, I do not believe, were consulted by the people at Helix Sleep, and they have nothing to do with he's or heels or whatever you were trying to say before. How did you get it into the hospital? Well, it came in that box that it comes right to your door in. I mean, one person can pack this thing around. It looked like I maybe brought a lunchbox or something. It's not because that it's small, not, a lunchbox. Well, it's, you know, the kids' mattresses, if you, those little darling little things for your little darling little toe-headed crumb snatchers, they're very small, but they come right to your door. The Helix Sleep mattresses, they come right to your door in a box. One person can move it where it needs to go, and then you open it up, and whoosh, it comes to life. And I, here's the thing. What I figured was it's not going to be in a hospital that long after the healing properties take over. So I'll just order one, and then once he's done with it, I'll send it back, because all these Helix mattresses, they've got a 100-night free trial where if you don't like it, you can send it back, get your money back. 
and they've got 10 to 15 year warranties depending on the model that you buy because they got so many my 20 unique mattresses several collections mattresses made for heaven's sake for any preference whether you like to sleep or you're hot or cold or you're fat or skinny they've got special mattresses for people with carbuncles and goiters on various parts of their body i it's don't i don't believe those are any of the special mattresses they offer but Maybe well, and future. besides the mystical healing properties of the Mayans, where it's almost like a pet cemetery situation. No, it's you nothing know, like a pet cemetery I'll situation. I'll tell you what, I wheeled one of these mattresses by the morgue, and I heard a couple of people going, huh? Why were you it's wheeling just, the mattress by the morgue? Well, trying to get it down there to his room. It, if you even get close to this mattress, it'll cure what ails you, and I'll tell you something else. That is not true. Let's not promise that. Well, I, there's no promises in life, but... You know, besides the fact that a witch doctor has ooh ee ooh ah ah all over this thing and given it healing properties, also it's it's very sterile. They didn't even need to spray it down with any kind of decontaminant when they brought it into the hospital because each of these Helix Sleep mattresses comes to your house brand new. Nobody's ever laid on it or done anything else on it for that matter. And they've actually they've they've got a They've soaked it in this disinfectant. It's a proprietary blend of formaldehyde and brass nope. polish. No. It kills all the germs. It kills all your brain cells. There's no formaldehyde it's, mix that's used well, with the mattresses. Just don't, just don't bury your nose too deep in the mattress and or try to breathe shallowly no, instead of deeply. No, deeply or shallowly, there will be no formaldehyde used in this process well you're not going to have any breathing problems either because you're going to be sleeping like you're in suspended animation and until some you wake prince, up until you wake up and until a, you wake some prince is going to have to come in and kiss you before you wake up and he might wake up turned into a frog but some of these things are going to happen it's just the natural way of life prince nana there you go did you know that prince nana was once a frog in queens in queens but then he got kissed by that hooker <laughs> Over what, there in, which hooker was that it sounds like you know who she is well I, the specific one i'm not sure i you know <laughs> there was several to choose from but folks once again helix sleep mattresses you're gonna you're gonna sleep the sleep of the angels you'll be cured of all of your illnesses you'll probably live to be 200 years old we can't guarantee any nope. of these things but well we can guarantee it won't be probably well, it, 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 well, no, probably, probably not. Who's to say? Science. And they, su they support the uh, science. Who are you, Thomas Dolby? Science. science! Well, if you'd like Helix to support science as well as the military and first responders and teachers and students, who else is left? Apparently, Helix supports everybody. If you're not in the service industry of military and first responders and you're not teaching and you're not a student, I guess they don't like accountants. But anyway, who does? And attorneys. You should never have to compromise on comfort, folks. And right now, don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for anything. Go right now to helixsleep.com slash JCE and see for yourself with all these fine mattresses for your home and your family. And you can use the kids' mattress for your pets if you want to you know, because, I mean, the kids will sleep on anything, but your pet deserves a comfortable night's sleep. But go to helixsleep.com slash JCE. You're going to get 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows just because we sent you there. Helixsleep.com slash JCE. 20% off and two free pillows. Boom, with Helix, better sleep starts now and better health and immunity from some of these many viruses that are roaming around the countryside, hitting people over the head with blunt instruments. Just, just bury your face in this thing and take a big sniff and you'll feel so much better. Or have a good night's sleep and do that every night with Helix Sleep. What's the promo code one more time, Jim? J-C-E. All right. That that is, was, that's, that's that code, yeah. That was the promo code. What have you got against snorting mattresses? I'm not too familiar with the practice. Well, I'm telling you, it's all the rage in the uh, hot circles. 
especially in the fashion industry. The hot circle. How are you familiar with the hot circles? Well, I got I got spies. Little, See, I, little birds I, in the hot circles. I know what I did was I let those people out of my walls and I turned them against the internet service providers and now they're working for me. They're very, Jimmy's angels. Very interesting. Very interesting plot twist there. How did you turn them against the uh, people they were working for? Because I said, I won't let you out of these fucking walls unless you agree to flip. Because they tried to come out one night, but I stopped them. I'm telling you, I'm doing a comic book. You against the people in the walls. <laughs> now that now book two is them joining your team. What was the, uh, was it how awful about Alan? Or wait, what was the, the, the TV movie in the Alan early Blackstock? 70s? No, 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 not him. He wasn't born then. The, uh, the early 70s TV movie about the kid, his, his weird, mentally deranged, overprotective mother passed away. And rather than be sent somewhere, he just moved into the walls of the house. And when the, the house was <laughs> sold and the new family, it wasn't how awful about was it was it bad Ronald? I'm now I'm every goddamn delinquent teenager featured in a TV movie. I'm gonna think about that until but yeah, but yeah, he moved in and, and he was living in the walls of the house. And when the new family moved in and and frivolity ensued all right according to uh wikipedia bad ronald is a horror thriller film but you said hilarity ensued no i'm i'm kidding they were all they were many people were killed in the oh. course of this thing yes it was a very oh, Dabney Coleman. very creepy movie but what was the plot then if you've looked that up the plot is like eight paragraphs here Ronald well, just will be, it should, if he's living in the fucking walls, we pretty much got it. Ronald Wilby is a socially inept, awkward high school youth with budding artistic talent and a predilection for fantasy who is often ridiculed for his behavior and mannerisms. Played his, by Tony Khan. Uh, played by Scott Jacoby, for the record. Oh, oh. His overprotective mother, Elaine, played by Kim Hunter, needs surgery and plans for Ronald to become a doctor and cure her illness. Ronald's father has not been heard from in years. Having divorced his mother and agreeing to terminate his parental rights in exchange for not having to pay child support. <laughs> Everyone's a winner in this movie. One afternoon, while asking out Lori Matthews, Ronald is rejected and then ridiculed by her friends. As he returns home, he accidentally knocks over her younger sister, Carol. Carol, like Lori, taunts Ronald. He pushes her over, inadvertently killing her when she strikes her head on a concrete block. He buries the body and confesses to his mother. Fearing the police will not believe that it was an accident, Ronald and his mother wallpaper the doorframe to the downstairs bathroom and convert the closed-off space to a living quarters for Ronald with a concealed trap door in the pantry <laughs> through which Ronald can escape in an emergency. The plan is for him to hide in the room until the incident blows over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll forget about her in time. Can't grieve forever. And Mrs. Wilby tells the police that Ronald ran away. It's like another eight paragraphs here. It's not like a simple <laughs> little... Well, but then, then the mother now, I remember, because then the mother goes to have her surgery and doesn't make it. And Ronald's waiting with bated breath for her to come home, and she never does, and, and that's when the, the transition changes and things get really weird. Well, you we can find out more about this. Uh, Bad Ronald. Wherever you find movies you've never heard of. A TV movie. It's a TV movie, too. Yes. Yes. That's what I said earlier. The, the fucking phlegm is clouding your brain. And should we talk about Tony Khan's clouded brain? Now, we're, we're going to have to zip through his TV offerings so we, this week so we can get to the, to the main event of the, the longest professional wrestling event. They had the, the, the biggest paid crowd, what they said. And they've, they've had a number of other firsts or records but this is like the longest pro wrestling event of all time right certainly no there can't have been it you had to time it with a with a, a calendar 
It was a... Uh, uh, before we get there, since we got to go back and, and bring you up to how we got there, should we talk about AEW Dynamite from this past Wednesday in... I wanted to... I wanted to recognize some things, both positive and negative. I'm not going to give you the details of the whole goddamn show, but there's there's some questions I've got to ask and a couple of things I've got to to utter. You saw that now the new AEW concussion champion, Felix, said, fuck it, I'm just going to fucking drop Moxley on his head over and over until he gives up that belt last week. So now he's in the opening match defending the belt that he's not supposed to have against Jeff Jarrett, who if and if ever the booker of the year sat down and said, what can be a great match? <laughs> oh God. It's like, <sighs> so uh, by the way, uh, Karen angle, uh, Karen angle, Karen Jarrett looks great for her age. I'm sorry. I've known her since way back when. And, but, it looks like he's got half the locker room out there. And again, Zippy just looks lost. If they were going to make any money with that giant, wouldn't they have been able to figure out a way by now? Because the more you see him now the, that he doesn't ever do anything, it's just, it's like, look at that fucking head on that large fellow and how misshapen it is. Anyway, this is... <laughs> Remember we've talked about the producer's job, whether agent or producer, or whatever they call it, what their job is supposed to be. And we maybe haven't talked about how the guys can help them do that job. But the, the match started, actually the match didn't start because they goddamn had to do this first before they could ring the bell. But the very first thing is as the heels are coming into the down the aisle and they get to ringside, Old Felix dives over the top rope or off the top rope or whatever onto everybody on the floor, and the camera was focusing the handheld on the floor in a close-up of the heels to the point where it just looks like he just dropped in out of the ceiling, like one of those fucking surveillance videos where the guy's trying to break in, and he falls through the ceiling of the fucking convenience store. And... The job of the producer, and I don't know whether they're being allowed to do the real jobs of producers over there, and I don't know whether the talent is working with them to would inform you, them. What now? I was going to say, would Jeff Jarrett have a producer? Well, yes. Because Jeff Jarrett can't be in the truck while he's in the ring, can he? Well, I, meant, I guess I was thinking more of an agent. You're, you're right, you're right. Agent, producer, whatever, some... There, there is a bridge between the technical crew and the wrestling roster. And as I mentioned, I did that in TNA with Jeff. Jeff was there on site, but he wasn't doing all these fucking things. You have to have different people. Even if Jeff is calling the match and setting the match up, the producer or the agent should be there to know, okay, here's what's going to happen. Because then that guy during that match goes and sits in the truck because the director is looking at 20 matches that night over three or four hours with these people, right? It's if you tell him ahead of time, you know, foot by foot and step by step, what's going to happen. He ain't going to remember all that shit. And he's, and he's directing. So the producer is there either over his shoulder or in the fucking communication system telling him, watch for a dive. Felix is going to dive. Or get a wide shot, they're going to do the group fucking circle jerk around the ring or whatever's coming up. If it's not something that should be covered by the hard camera and by the handhelds that are focused on the ring, like when Felix and his fucking goofy brother, they did it in MLW, they've done it, I've seen them in Ring of Honor or in uh, AEW here, or Ring of Honor shows, whatever. They do this all the time in multiple promotions. They'll do that goofy double foot stomp, double arm spike pile driver thing to a fucking guy as their finish. 
And then as the co- one guy's covering, the other guy will jump up, hit the far ropes, run back across the ring, dive through the ropes, and tackle somebody on the floor that just happens to be standing there. And no television director in the history of television would catch that unless they knew it was coming because it doesn't make any fucking sense. And I've seen in MLW, they missed the finish like two different TVs because they're trying to follow the dive suddenly and miss the, and the people miss it too. Point is, the producer's job, if the talent is telling them and if they know what the fuck they're doing in the truck is to, and you see this throughout the programs, that everybody's just doing this crazy ass shit and you can tell when they've actually told somebody they were going to do it and they shoot it versus when they just went crazy and just ran and dove somewhere and they have to do a replay because they missed it. (sighs) Anyway, so before they started the match, I've talked about that Jeff, at least, and again, this was a complete style clash, and I was getting a giggle out of it after a while. I'll tell you why in a second. But Jeff knows how to put a match together to keep things up and moving and action going on with a clear baby face and a heel to get a reaction out of the crowd without doing a million big moves and he, he keeps the people involved wanting to see the baby face come back or to outsmart the heel or whatever. And he tried to do it here with this fucking guy. Uh, they had the fight on the floor at the start and Jeff tried to shoot Felix off, but Felix jumped up and hurricane Ronald Sanjay head first in a zip. He's nuts, but Karen scratches Felix on the back. And he turns around and snatches her by the neck, but Dutt tries to save, and Felix moves, and super kicks Dutt, and then Jeff, and then the bell rings, and Felix does some more flips, but then he hurts his back, and Jeff tries to get heat on the back for a second. Did you notice, Brian, that after just a couple of minutes, Jeff looked like he was saying, fuck it. On those leaping spin kicks, he was in the corner one time, and Felix jumped up, and he had jumped off the rope, and he jumped up, turned around, picked a bale of cotton, and spun the foot toward the face, and he's slapping his leg, and Jeff just turned around and put his hand up and hoped for the best. And within, you know, a couple of seconds, I guess maybe they went to break right there, and by the time they came back from the break, Jeff had a mouse over his the fucking eye that was bleeding slightly. And I'm thinking, you know, again, it's hard to work with one of these guys. You don't know what the fuck direction is. Stupid, goofy, nonsensical shit's coming from. And so anyway, if Felix, again, Jeff tried to make him the baby face, have him fight back from underneath. He was trying to be there for it, but Felix is timing his shit because that's, Making a fiery baby face comeback without gymnastics apparently is a foreign language. He's a hell of a high diver, but he cannot waltz gracefully. And then they had Aubrey Ed jumped up on her hind legs and shoved Karen down on the floor and got a big pop, and Karen sold it like she was been trampled. And then they again... <laughs> Jeff nutshotted Felix while Sanjay had distracted Aubrey because she wasn't wearing blinders. So she immediately went to him and Jeff nutshots Felix and then small packages him and gets a two count. The nuts are not as vulnerable as they used to be. Then they go back and forth. The guy that just got hit in the nuts and Jeff hit his stroke finish. But Felix didn't know what to fuck and just took a flip bump over forward, which was the shits. And they, that was a two count foot on the ropes. And then Zippy, the giant comes up and Felix knocks him off the apron. And Jeff goes for a figure four and Felix small package him one, two, three. And Jeff had a look of relief on his face. Like nothing was broken. What? <sighs> Why does Tony put these things together? I know they tried to make the best out of it, but 
how was that ever going to be good? It was completely a, a style clash. Yeah, I mean, I, it's exactly what I expected it to be. As soon as you see Jeff Jarrett and the clown crew come out there, you know it's something that you don't have to take serious. And Jeff hasn't looked particularly good in a while. And this is the worst possible opponent you could put him in there with. And apparently, and, and did he that, get hurt again? And, and to be to be fair, the opponent was coming off fucking winning an unscheduled title by dropping the fucking top baby face on his head or top. He what is Moxley a baby face because he's a heel? He's both. Did he get hurt again in this match, Phoenix? Because apparently, he also got hurt in a Moxley match. <laughs> and then I think I heard he got hurt again. That's why they did the thing at the pay per view where they had a reason to usher him out. I don't know cuz that uh, the he was in the four-way tag that I was able to skip several illnesses at the same time. So I don't know what they did in it nor do I care. But Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So then MJF and Adam Cole decided they would do a romantic buddy comedy video on MJF's father's boat. And <sighs> Uh, what again because it, this is so preposterous even though they're playing it straight but nobody would say these things or act like this or do these things especially in front of a fucking camera it's become a mini television program when MGF says hey now Adam about you being on the phone with Roddy and not coming out for my match you know what's that all about? Well, he needed me. Well, let me get you another beer. And the camera sees MJF pull the ring out, put it on his foot, his fist, and standing behind Adam Cole, when Adam Cole suddenly asks him, hey, Max, you didn't bring me out here to hit me with the ring and throw me overboard, did you? And then MJF takes the ring off and sticks it back in his pocket. Well, no, of course... And Adam tries to explain to MJF that part of friendship is having more than one friend. We've all become 12 years old mentally. Why is this... <laughs> if <clears throat> The idea that one of them might turn on the other one would be accentuated if you believed that this was actually taking place and that they actually were friends and committed to each other rather than this than dramatic renditions every week of these goofy fake videos that are obviously produced and everybody's cooperating. How can I say this in a dip? Well, and then, before I ask that question, they catch a fish and it's Big Show in the Captain Insano outfit floating on a rubber ducky float. And then they all drink beer. What? Do they have to make this for 12-year-old children? And why is this the thing that the world champion of the company is involved in? Help me. I can't really help you too much. I enjoy so much about MJF, except for these skits, just because it, I'm not even against him doing something if it's within the guise of him being the wrestler or being filmed doing something, not a clearly acted out skit because of the way it's shot and the way it's produced. It can't be anything but that. He can't even pretend it's anything but that. And, you know, there's a difference between, like, doing something... Like you said, I mean, it feels especially Adam Cole, more than MJF here, feels more childish than anything else, a lot of the stuff. But again, it's getting over with their fans. Can't say it's not. Well, there's a lot of stuff over with their fans that well, this prevent is the most them over. from having any more fans. The MJF Adam Cole stuff is the most over thing right now, but... But is it is it them coming out in person in front of the people and they don't give a fuck about the video? These videos are not helping. It's when MJF talks and MJF and Adam Cole interact in front of the people. They love that shit. The talent like making videos. Well, and, and they need a talent fucking booker to stop them from their worst instincts. Speaking of the worst instincts, so 
this made the goddamn news on Twitter and the internet in general. <sighs> Phallus and Take a Shit come out for an interview with Rene Moxley Good. Takeshta. They him too. And they give Sammy Guevara the big introduction. And he comes out dressed as Danny Douchebag. And then Don says, We were in Tokyo last week and found Kota Ibushi at his dojo. Well, what they also found was an amazing ability to not even remotely pretend that their shit is in any way real, because not only was this, this was one of the fakest things I've ever seen, but this is what made, remember the promo that did the little teaser that, that Don Fallis and our friend Take it did when we're in Tokyo and we're looking for Kota Ibushi, where they find him here. Kenny Olivier was the one that was shooting it with his iPhone. There's a picture on the internet of Kenny holding the phone up, shooting the promo with his mortal enemies, <laughs> talking about going to find his best friend and fucking do, do mayhem. And they're in the middle of a crowded street in Tokyo. And the only thing that, it, why it didn't really break kayfabe there, it just the picture did here, was because nobody on the fucking general street in Tokyo or anywhere else knows who any of these fucking people are. But one guy took a fucking picture and spreads it around the fucking world. But uh, it's what a do-it-yourself goddamn Hey, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, when I was running the camera, there was no fucking people around. So anyway, they found Coda at his dojo, which was a plywood room barely big enough for a ring to be stuck in it. Why were the walls plywood? They can't afford drywall in Japan? Plywood's more expensive than drywall. Maybe that's why they want it. Maybe they want something other than drywall. Well, it looked like shit. It looked like they were wrestling in a goddamn birdhouse. But anyway, they do a fake shoot angle where they beat up the random guy that's there that's not Kota Hidushi. And then that means that Kota ro rolls in. And then they did... What were they trying to do here? Is it fake fighting? Is it fake grappling? How was this supposed to look? It neither looked real nor like what you would do in a fight. It was an odd hybrid of grappling, sparring, and whatever. And then every once in a while, Coda would for some reason turn his back on him so they could take over on him. Like you do that regularly in a fight. I, this guy's still on me, but I'm going to turn around and check on the guy that's down. And then they finally hit him with a, a fake dumbbell a fake shot in the fucking head and got some more fake heat did i mention this all looked fake how fake did it look to you i mean it looked ridiculous i mean i don't know what else to it was obviously shot on an iphone even before the kenny omega photo came out it was clearly shot on an iphone you could tell by the quality of it it would, you know, I'm not, I'm not going for quality. It should look grainy. It's not an official television production. But what they're shooting should not look phony. The other thing is, did Tony Khan pay for these three guys to fly to Tokyo just to shoot this angle? It would have been cheaper to bring Coda over here and stick him in a goddamn Planet Fitness, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, it's a great angle to do if it'll actually draw you some money is that angle the week of the pay-per-view worth no, anything does it actually no. increase any buys even if you're a fan of theirs no if you're if, if you like the people in this deal you're already going to buy the pay-per-view and seeing this not look good it would not tip you in that favor if you weren't so i <sighs> And then, you know, Sammy did the promo about Jericho holding him back, and that was that thing. And, and briefly moving on, 
Then we got Wheeler Useless coming in to confront Ricky Starks in the back and telling him off in a very nerdish manner. And the, the challenge for the match at the pay-per-view, so this is Wednesday night. They added a match between Starks and Wheeler Useless for Sunday, four days away. And don't worry, that won't be the last one. And He's not good in the role, I mean... Beyond whatever else you think of him, just him acting like the tough guy confronting Ricky Starks and trying to, like, you know, be the tough guy didn't work. He doesn't have the look. No, that's the problem is nobody in this company looks the part they're trying to play and no one will make them play a part they look like. So that's why you got what you got. And speaking of getting what you got, and speaking of not playing a part that you look like, they had a three-way where now the winner gets an international title match next week against Felix. Brian Cage versus Claudio Castagnoli versus Balding Nicky Buck. The two biggest physical monsters in AEW and a tiny, pale, balding, flabby, fucking juvenile delinquent. Guess who won the pony, Brian? Were you surprised? Because I wasn't. <laughs> When you saw who was in this match, you knew it wasn't going to be Claudio, and you knew it wasn't going to be Brian Cage. But just the, the gall, to quote Jackie Fargo at one point, the gall of them. To I mean, now, in addition to everything else that's wrong with this fucker physically and visually, he's almost 40. And he's out there just pirouetting around and flinging these fucking guys into each other and... Uh, so meanwhile, we don't get AEW world title matches anymore because MJF is defending the prestigious Ring of Honor tag titles by himself, but the the mascot title is on display every week now. Okay, what do you yeah, think and about... In, and in the last two weeks, we've seen the Young Bucks get the Ring of Honor six-man titles with Hangman Page, win a tag title match, continuing the FTR series. And now Nick Jackson gets a singles title match. So they can't, <laughs> they can't. And now as we'll find out the, the buckaroos are in line for a tag team title shot. So can they, can they have a six man set of belts, a tag team set of belts and one of them have a singles belt? Will they allow that to happen? Will they ignore the fact that the Bucks are less over than ever before? The reaction they got at the pay-per-view was quite telling, I thought. But we'll get there. We'll get there. And as I was, I was going to ask, what do you think about the Righteous videos? You tell me. Well, again, I don't want to do too much uh, spoiler stuff here. I mean, well, anyone who's listening to this is going to hear that. I don't like their videos, but I actually like them in that handicap match with MJF. The big guy, actually, I really liked. Okay. Now, having the video, that, The video seemed to me, I think I said it last time, Bray Wyatt Swamp Tribute. Yes. And, and not even the swamp, but the Firefly Funhouse. Not even the cool, spooky stuff, but the... What the fuck is... They're, they're making paper dolls. And that's, uh, you know... You can't describe what they're doing on these videos. It doesn't make sense, and it looks fairly visually ridiculous. And by the way, Vinny, I won't reveal his real name. He's Italian. I can't pronounce it anyway. But he came to one of our Ring, Ring of Honor camps back in 2011, I think. And he's a fine young man. But it's, it's the gimmick is taking over to the point where there's some cuteness in it. There's some good shit in it in the the entrance and just the look of them, the contrast or whatever. But if all of this stuff is deep, hidden meaning shit that you, nobody really knows or you have to figure out or it's goddamn the backward masking, Paul is dead, turn me on dead man, whatever the fuck, right? It, it's in every company, multiple through the House of Black. It just becomes ridiculous, doesn't it? Well, the if other, you don't understand what anything anything means? Well, the other thing is, is the tag team crazy? Or is the filmmaker crazy? 
Well, exactly. Because it's not like they're editing this thing. They're just standing there filming and the guy saying, cut. All right, I think I could use this. And then they're producing these videos. Now everyone in AEW, not everyone, but again, it was another thing at the pay-per-view. All of a sudden, everyone has these videos. I'm not just going to show up. I'm going to have these videos. Vignettes are one thing. I'm Terry Funk on my ranch. I'm coming to do this. Yes. Yes, it was something you can plainly and clearly see and understand, and it, and it make it makes a point. It draws your interest to something, but yeah, not all these guys are not fucking Fellini, some kind of independent goddamn film auteurs doing this art for the fucking Cannes Festival. Fucking horseshit, horseshit! I say. What do you think of the names, Vincent and Dutch? <laughs> I'm not opposed to that, Ferg. And Vincent looks weird, and Dutch looks like his big goddamn stooge. It looks like the fucking, you know, the cat and the fucking sheepdog or whatever. Um, that's fine. But just the it, everything. If again, I've said if you if everybody's seven feet tall, you got no giants. If everything's silly or inexplicable, you don't understand any fucking thing. Speaking of not understanding any fucking thing, how have they managed to not only make MJF's TV appearances less anticipated, but in the process, they have determined that Jay White needs to be out there talking for 10 minutes straight. And then they put them together. This was another big expose of Jay White on the mic. We've seen it happen a few times on Collision where I kept going and going, and he wasn't really saying anything. He had energy, but he had nothing to say. And there's a lot of people that rave about him in the New Japan media scrums or whatever they are. That's a different animal. He's the only one who can speak English. But that's a different animal, sitting there at a table with a microphone and being able to not scream or anything is different than being in the ring in front of a room full of people. He's proven it several times now. He keeps going and going and no one stops him. And it doesn't help him at all. Well, but but first, before we even before he even came out, we got MJF and Adam Cole. And Adam Cole had to reveal that he's fucked his ankle up and needs surgery. And we have no reason to believe this is a work. He jumped off the ramp doing a run-in and broke his ankle. And so now that's whatever the fuck was going to happen ain't going to happen no more or it ain't going to happen for a while and it was already getting a little long in a tooth but now the, the to try to make some chicken salad out of the chicken shit that they've been handed now the story is mjf is not going to let him relinquish the ring of honor tag team belts he's going to make sure they're still there waiting on adam cole when he gets well and he's going to defend those belts this weekend at the pay-per-view against the Aussie jobbers by himself. So now, again, now you've got... No, not the, the Aussies, uh, the Righteous. Or the, uh, I'm sorry, not, yeah, the, the Righteous, not the, uh, not the Aussies. I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. I couldn't read my shorthand. So he's going to defend them by himself against the Righteous is what he's going to do. And that's, here comes, because they've got him, the world champion, in this position, where he's having to defend a secondary, non-existent company's tag team belts, because they let this happen. And then, they've also got to still tie up the loose ends with Roddy and Taven and Bennett. So now Roddy comes out in a wheelchair and a neck brace and a hospital gown, as we mentioned earlier in the program from previously. Does he check out of a fucking hospital and check into one in a new city? They're in a different city every week. And it's so unbelievable. I need you now, Adam. It's an emergency. And Adam, supposedly a baby face that we want to sympathize with is falling for this like a goddamn uh, you know fucking suburban housewife go oh my god it's my husband phil he needs me it's uh, so then 
MJF tells Adam, I understand. He's your boy. Go do what you got to do. I'll be here waiting for you when you come back. And they hug each other. I'm thinking, my God, it's a romantic fucking dramedy. What the fuck? And then Cole hobbles out of the ring on his broken fucking ankle to go see Roddy in his fucking wheelchair and neck brace. And I wrote, good God. Oh, good God. And then suddenly the music plays and there comes Gin and Juice and the guns. And Jay White comes out to the to the ring and that, we're seven minutes deep in this thing already. And deep is an apropos description. And have you noticed that Jay White... I mean, there ain't a goddamn lot of difference in his physique and build and Adam Cole's. It just, with the with the beard and the fucking extra man bun, he looks like Adam on crack. He's taller. That's it. He's taller. Wrestlers shouldn't wear skinny jeans. Wait, is that what the... Because I thought, my God, those legs could win a fucking legal battle. Fucking sue the whole body for non-support. It stood out to it, me. I mean, I noticed how skinny his legs looked, and I thought about everything you just said is what I thought watching it. So, and that's the you know, MJF looks like Luger next to his opponents. So, Jay White is now going to tell MJF off, and as I mentioned, he got his hair in a fucking bun, and a scruffy beard, and he's dressed like a slob, and it looks like you invited a fan into the ring to cut a fantasy promo. If he's going to be in a main event position, jaw jacking with the world champion, can he not groom himself and get a fucking look? And it, it, MJF tried hard to get the people interested. And I think that's probably, he does have a tendency sometimes when he knows that they're wearing out their welcome, he tries too hard. But it was like he was cutting a promo on the hot dog vendor because it was long. The delivery was okay, but the people don't care. Do you see Jay White getting over as a goddamn superstar with these people? I think he's over. The people he's over with already as a superstar will continue to see him that way. I don't know about getting over. I think Juice is the one who has stood out in the group. Yeah. And MJF tore down the heel right to his face, and, yes. the guy, and the guy had nothing he could say back. He's tofu. And that's the thing, he's tofu. He's in the middle of a bunch of good shit, but if you put him out there on his own... See, you know what and the, the problem with MJF saying the tofu thing? It's true. If you think about it, it's true. That's the problem. So now he makes it so that <laughs> you look at the heel, you're like, how am I supposed to take this fucking guy seriously? Yeah, here's this fucking... Toothpick legged, fucking scraggly haired, man bunned, fucking sweatsuit wearing guy with a whiny fucking voice and an accent. And the American audience doesn't like whiny people with accents. That's what, and I don't mean in a heelish don't like way. I mean, what the, he sounds like he's trying to convince himself and everybody else at the same time. And he's saying a lot of words. Well, the, the joke on the Twitter, thank you, first name, bunch of numbers. We ought to call him Jay, a lot of words. He's saying them vehemently. But, bleh. And so, but basically, MJF told, told him off and tore him down first, and then Jay White started. And the fans besides chanting tofu at him. The retort was long fucking winded. And MJF had to stand there and listen to this fucking dribble. And the fans started chanting, shut the fuck up, because they wanted him to. And, you know, he's he's there. It's like he's screaming at MJF, who looks like somebody, but the guy that's yelling at him is the guy that showed up to service the dishwasher. And so finally, then MJF got pissed and screamed at Jay White and dared him to fight. And Jay White left. And that was the end of that. 21 minutes long from start to finish with no breaks of what we just said. 
Yeah, again, it was a bad expose of Jay White and his... I mean, no one can compete with MJF in there on the mic. I mean, Punk was pretty good, but it's hard to do that. MJF's really good. And him as a babyface tore the heel down and the heel couldn't say anything. And it's one thing to be in a room doing a promo. It's another thing to be in an arena and having to actually go back and forth with someone. Jay White is not shown an ability to be able to do that yet. We'll see well, what happens. Well, they didn't even really go back and forth. You know, MJF did his thing. Though the other guy stands there and listens, and then Jay White does his thing. There, there can be a, a back and forth argument, but not when you've pre-planned. And MJF, I'm sure, can do it with anybody, but not when you've pre-planned your cues to speak and the things you're going to say and blah blah blah. And Jay White don't need to be jumping into that fucking pool. Anyway, the pool that I j did not jump into was the four-way. One guy from each team in the four-way on the pay-per-view that will determine the number one contenders to the AEW tag team title with Pockets versus Penthouse versus One of the Guns versus Matty Buckaroo. And the pony winner in this one was Tony's Boy Pockets. Did I miss anything? No. Very good. And Julia Hart versus Willow. Brian, let me bring this, this thought that I had in my head up to you. Uh-oh. Well, no, uh, no, not that one. Julia Hart, she looks like a star. She's got a great look, right? And she's very young. She'll, she has a bright future ahead of her. They're already trying to make her a goddamn girl wrestler instead of an attraction. She not only wrestled on Wednesday, she's wrestling on the pave. They're going to push her as a fucking wrestler. If they were smart, with somebody that looks, with the state of their women's division anyway, who gives a French fried titty fuck? How apropos. Why make her just one of the girl wrestlers when she could be in a main event spot as whatever you want to call the uh, the job of manager or valet as it used to be years ago? Whether an advocate or a, a cult leader or a fucking whatever, she's the girl with the guy. And that would be a main event. A, can you imagine a top heel? with a good look, and that girl with that look, and then you've got a fucking package, whether it's the House of Blech, or, you know, or somebody good, she's a star. You should put heat on her. She should be speaking. She should be directing people what to do, and she should never wrestle unless you got to pay for it. Special match on pay-per-view, feature match on a big event, a, a strong babyface girl comes in to even the odds or a mixed tag team match, whatever the case, she would be special. But now they're just going to push her as another one of the fucking girl wrestlers. That's what I'm saying. I think she is special right now. I think she's the most over woman in the division just based I off know. the last few now weeks they're, now they're fucking sending her out there to wrestle and they're gonna fucking screw that up by the way she may have the best moonsault i've seen since muda did you see that moonsault how high up she got i mean she's a smaller yes. girl incredible great hang time you know what instead of fucking wrestling the other girls and the willows of the world and hitting that moonsault she ought to goddamn be up there and hitting that moonsault on fucking MJF when her goddamn man has laid him out and she is fucking rubbing salt in the wounds and on pay-per-view, then if MJF beats her guy, then he gets to moonsault her or something. Yeah, I don't know about that. Well, whatever. <laughs> no, you know what? Look, if they're going to have a women's division, she's been one of the better ones and she's been improving. Push her. Get rid of some of the other people who have names, but they don't mean as much to the AEW fan. Julia Hart, the AEW fans are getting behind her. Part of the reason is she's theirs, and she's actually been good. There's a lot of people who have been pushed who haven't been very good. 
Yeah. And there's a lot of people who have been signed who aren't very good. And I, again, if they're going to do a women's division, I see some hope with Julia Hart, Willow Nightingale, Sky Blue, more than I admit, Chris. Statlander. Well, I'm, I'm sure that they can have some girl, good girls matches. I was just as a former promoter and booker trying to make some fucking money. But who are you going to put her with? Well, because for it to be worth it, it has to be a sustainable heel, right? It has, I mean, you don't yeah. want it to be Karrion Cross and Scarlet. Right. Because that's then something it, where you see something that could be, you would think, a better used act, I guess. We could say not even a main event one. Better used, but we see how they're using that yes. paints them going forward. Then in that case, we ought to get the roster out when we have more time and go up and down and see if there's any candidates that could be a top single heel in that fucking company that needs a little... A little uh, greenery or a little uh, parsley on the package. And, and you know, and here's the thing. I'm sure she's having a, a fun time wrestling because that's the problem. If you went to not only Julia Hart, but probably any of these girls or guys and said, look, we want to put you together with a top heel and we're going to push you in the world title fucking picture and blah, 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 or... We'll let you wrestle in the middle of the card with all of the opponents that you have fun wrestling with. Which one do you think that everybody would pick now versus 40 years ago? 40 years ago, everybody said, put me in a fucking main event. Now they say, oh, let me just wrestle. With Malachi out with an injury and Buddy Matthews. I Is he hurt? I, heard, I did not even know that. I heard that he's hurt and Buddy's in Australia with Rhea right now. So that's why she's been coming out with Brody King. Maybe that's why she's been working matches more the last few weeks as opposed to coming out with the House of Black. They haven't been around. What do you think of the visual of her with Brody King? Well, you just you just buried the lead. Buddy. Buddy needs something. Brody, I... Is it Brody tough to King, do that? He's is, all right. Is it tough with Buddy that this specific example... He's already example, been there, though. It, yeah, it wouldn't go anywhere because he's been there. Well, plus everyone knows he's with Rhea. So if you put a girl manager or valet or whatever it is, well, as opposed to all the other girl managers and valets, if you put a girl manager... Or, if, uh, you know, several several people and a woman. That's it, right. Did, I didn't say they had to be fucking... Although, you know what? Can you imagine how what kind of a stir it would make if they came out and ad admitted that they were fucking around? And what's she going to do about it? I dare her to come down here. But never, I'm saying, point is, Buddy. She's is, fucking Dominic. Look what I got. Well, there you go. But Buddy's a talent, but he has the worst name ever, and he's stuck in this group. And. He's been there, so you can't really just change his name and put him with somebody else, and it's not going to mean anything. He, you know, unfortunately, they blew that by not figuring out that they could probably do something with that fucking guy if he didn't have the name of a fucking pet dog and, you know, was stuck as the middle guy in, in the group of tattooed guys. Anyway. What, did you actually watch the match, though? No. It was good. Good. So they were down to the last 10 minutes of the program, which now their main events are contract signings. But instead of John Cena versus whoever or The Rock coming out to do 10 minutes, they had Swerve Strickland and Hangnail Page for the 10-minute main event spot and their contract signing for the pay-per-view match on Sunday. And that's why I wrote, are these shows all the same from every company? You can write down the five or six things. You know you're going to see a fucking contract signing main event. Somebody's going to get jumped backstage. A piece of furniture is going to be broken. Whatever the fuck. Um, and Hangnail came out at that point. I don't know if this was a... See, uh, 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 where were they? They were Seattle for the pay-per-view. Where were they on this one? They were out west somewhere, Colorado. That's right. Um, I don't know whether it would have been a punk crowd or a buckaroo crowd or whose crowd it was, but it wasn't Hangnail Page's crowd. They just sat there when he wandered out. And again, Swerve looks like somebody and he can talk. And honestly, even in Colorado, which is not his hometown, the fans seemed a little bit more like they were behind Swerve than Hangnail. And the swerve's cool. What's cool about Hangman yeah. Page? 
He looks like the guy who brings your pizza in a fucking beat up Opal Cadet. And <laughs> so explain what? Well, I mean, it could be a brand new one. You still get your pizza, but he put on his dramatic voice. And once again, he has come up with Paige, I'm talking about a long winded dramatic promo with hidden meaning to talk about the black cloud that's been hanging over his head, mainly CM Punk, telling him he was a fucking empty-headed dipshit that had never done anything in the business, and he, if he needed choked out, he'd be happy to oblige. And so now Paige doesn't have to be scared anymore to come to work because Punk is gone, but he's trying to do the goddamn double-meaning shoot promo and it, he can't. He's not good enough with words. He can't do it. You don't, it, you end up not understanding either one. It's just vague references to shit that you don't, he never comes out and says. And if he's got a black cloud over his head that he couldn't get rid of, it's a ghost of Toots Mont haunting him, as far as I'm concerned, because it's, he is the most fucking feeble excuse for a top baby face that I've, with his wishy-washy, mush mouth, fucking flowery jeans and goddamn lawnmowers and friends in the dork order and the whole nine yards. They have bungled this fucking guy since the start and come to find out it wasn't against his will because he doesn't know what he's doing either. And so he tries to do the double meaning shoot promo to knock punk so his friends will give him some attaboys and at the end of it swerve says that was the most pathetic thing i ever heard and son of a gun he was right and then you know but this dragged and they all, they had 10 minutes on the air when the entrances started and it was dragging after six minutes and basically the DVR froze on them on my programming while they were still talking. I don't know if violence occurred or not, but they had to, had to be in the last 30 seconds of the fucking program. I thought Swerve came out of this looking great, and the fans get more and more into him. The more he's used, the more over he gets, even though he's with a giant crew of guys who never win matches and everything else. He's over, and he's good. And... Him and Adam Page did not look like equals in this program. No. At all. He seems like someone on the way up, and Adam Page, like the Young Bucks, exactly where he was, but everyone else has kind of moved a little bit past that. Well, and that's a, yeah, we'll see it on the pay per view also. Uh, half of, or at least some part of, every match looks like they let a fucking make a wish kid into it. There's. <laughs> Again, a bunch of people playing these parts like Adam Page in the mirror. That was a great promo to him. When he was doing it in his fucking bathroom mirror, it was profound as fuck. Because he's seeing somebody that knows what the fuck he's doing in his mirror. That's the problem with a lot of these guys. They can't look in a fucking mirror and see reality. They look in the mirror and see who they have deluded themselves into believing they are. For Wheeler Useless to be presented as a badass. For the fucking plumber to be presented as a fucking second coming of Hoist Gracie and George St. Pierre all rolled into one. For all of these various children to work like the goddamn road warriors. A lot of them have perception issues with what they look like. And they work a style of what they want to be rather than how you could ever possibly fucking accept them as. And therein lies a problem. Brian, you know what I've come to realize could save the entire pro wrestling industry? No, what's that? The Raycon wireless earbuds. Think about this. Those live segments on the air, instead of having an empty-headed dumb shit like Adam Page out there blathering on, he could wear a set of those, and somebody who knows what they're doing could tell him what to say. And then everybody could have a set of the Raycon wireless earbuds in, so they would actually go off the air on time, because somebody could say, 
We're out of time. We're going off the air. Get your shit in. Because the Raycon wireless earbuds connect you to whatever you want to hear or need to hear. You can play your own soundtrack in your head. You can forget about the outside world. Or you can attune yourself to it as you see fit. What do you think, Brian? Are they going to save the wrestling business? Just put make, make all these guys on the roster androids, automatons, zombie slaves even and tell them every move to make through the Raycon wireless earbuds. And of course, they have a noise-canceling feature, which right now would be very helpful because uh, it turns out my contractor and his team are here, and they've started drilling something somewhere in the house. Well, you hear that? Out, can you hear that? Find out what's getting drilled from your, your wife down there. Unless she's the one getting drilled, in which case, she probably won't want to tell you. Oh my God, where is she? Seems like the contractor always comes to your house whenever you're recording. But Brian, I'll tell you something else. Suzanne, where are you? Raycon Sue? is, speaking of anniversaries of wedded people, Raycon is celebrating an, an anniversary of their own. They're six years old. They're just about ready to enter grade school, Brian. And for their sixth anniversary, we are going to be able to save you money like never before. Can you remember the last time, if any time, that we were able, Brian, to save people up to 40% on anything? No. Well, we can now. Because with Raycon turning six years old, they have decided to do not only 20% off everything on the site, but select products, ones they've selected, up to 40%. And then you can select those, you're going to save almost half off, for heaven's sake. Just for a sixth anniversary, it's not even gold or silver or even paper mache. Imagine when they get 25 years old, they'll be paying you to take stuff. And the past year, they expanded the entire business. They introduced Raycon Home and Raycon Power Tech and soon to come Raycon Septic Pumping. What's Power Tech? I don't know, but it sounds powerful. They don't do septic pumping. Let's just put that out there, too. Well, the not yet. But you know, they're about to Not take ever. over the world. Not ever. You can't predict that. If the right deal came along, they could diversify. And folks, once again, you need to diversify. Just because you already have the everyday earbuds with the 32-hour battery life and the perfect in-ear fit for all-day wear and lasting comfort, you might want something else and everything's 20% off. Some things are 40% off. Get another set of the Raycons. And because Halloween is coming up, right? Halloween, the spooky time of the year, take and put these Raycons in your spouse's ears and at night, just whisper 666 over the Raycons. They'll be hearing 666, 666. They'll wake up scared shitless. Or but waking up. it's their up, sixth anniversary. Or they'll wake up wanting sex, sex, sex. Well, that's only if you've got Kenny McIntosh's Scottish accent. Anyway, nevertheless, folks, right now, Celebrate Raycon turning six with the biggest sale of the year going on now. Go to buyraycon.com, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N.com slash J-C-E and use the code birthday. They say it's your birthday. -na 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 -na. With the code birthday, you're going to get 20 to 40% off site-wide. Buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. 20 to 40% off site-wide right now with the code BIRTHDAY. What about you there, birthday boy? It's not my birthday. Well, you could lie and get presents. I don't like to lie to people. I don't need presents. You know, really, I I've, I've lie all the time about I don't have a birthday every year. Really? I, w I was actually, I was, I was born on leap year at the stroke of noon. So they couldn't decide morning, night, what time or what day. So I just have a birthday every four years. I'm really only 21. Or no, I'd be 16. I'm the third two save. No, I'd be 11. Well, nevertheless. Nevertheless. By Raycon.com slash JCE code birthday. Now that that's over, did anybody watch that program? that we talked about here a few minutes ago on Wednesday night, the AEW Dynamite. Anybody watch it this week? 
Oh yeah, a bunch of people watched it. AEW Dynamite on September 27th was watched by 855,000 viewers. So have they got the exact same people every week chained to their Barca loungers? It's the same number everywhere, and then they get the extra 100,000 if they do the the big uh, uh, spectacular event at a stadium. It's the same thing every week. That it is, well, somewhat the same thing. But, but I mean, there used to be variation, fluctuation. SmackDown is going from 2.1 million to 2.7 or 8 million, depending on The Rock or Cena, and other programs fluctuate from week to week. They're right there. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Well, let's try to do this. And again, remember, I'm under the weather, so I'm going to do my best to actually read any of this. 8 to 8, 15 p.m., segment one, quarter one. I'm already messing up. Ray Phoenix versus Jeff Jarrett with picture in picture. Obviously, they were messing up too. Yeah. 923,000 viewers. Okay. Starting out like that, unless they go drastically upwards, they shouldn't lose. An incredible amount, according to their average. Go ahead. Quarter 2, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the MJF Adam Cole Big Show boat segment. An ad break. Kawa, Sammy, and Takeshita live promo with Tokyo footage. And Ricky Starks, We Are You to Confrontation. 843,000 viewers. Ouch. Okay, so they, they got to go back up. They just didn't like... What they saw there, 80,000 people in the first 15 minutes. Go ahead. Quarter three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. Nick Jackson versus Brian Cage versus Claudio Castagnoli with picture in picture and a video for The Righteous, 907,000 viewers. Okay, so should the people in, in uh, quarter two take that personally? <laughs> they just said, fuck that. We'll come back in 15 minutes. I think quarter two is usually a reflection of quarter one. And I think that's a large part of it because MJF there usually doesn't drag things down even if he's doing his comedy segments. But quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m., an ad break, and MJF and Adam Cole and Roddy Strong's live promo Going into MJF and Jay White beginning their live promo, 904,000 viewers. Okay, so again, the, so far the lowest rated quarter hour has been the comedy buddy video they did rather than their live appearance, MJF and Adam Cole. Quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour, 9 to 9.15 9, p.m., continuation of MJF and Adam Cole, Adam Cole, MJF and Jay White's live promo as well as the Christian Darby Allen promo with Jim Ross in the back. You didn't even mention that one. 943,000 viewers. Holy shit. Well, there you go. The magic. of, <laughs> And they were talking and talking and talking. So uh, people are just going to wait to see what MJF is going to do, apparently. That's what it seems like, and then... We'll see what they do after that. I was about to say, now we appear to be headed for the precipice with these numbers. Quarter 6, 9.15 to 9.30 p.m. Orange Cassidy versus Austin Gunn versus Matt Jackson versus Penta El Zero Miedo. We may have found the precipice. With picture in picture twice, 813,000 viewers. Ouch! 130,000 people said, okay, we're done here. Check, please. Yeah, and also, by the way, quarter five, the high point, that was also the high point in the key demo, and then that dropped off a bit going into this quarter. But quarter seven, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., an ad break, Julia Hart versus Willow Nightingale with picture in picture, and the post-match angle with Chris Statlander, 759,000 viewers. Youch. Okay, there went another 40, 54. So that means in from quarter five to quarter seven, they lost 184,000 people. And finally, quarter eight. And by the way, I should mention these were compiled by WrestleNomics. Quarter eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m. An ad break. 
and the Swerve Strickland Adam Page contract signing, 753,000 viewers. Oh, and 6,000 more. So, basic 190,000. They lost two, four, six, eight. They lost 21, 22% of what they started with. And they, if you want to uh, go with the high point, which was MJF in, in quarter five, they lost goddamn almost 25% of the audience from quarter five to quarter eight. Oh, well. There you have it. Oh, well, there you have it. AEW Dynamite. Well, we, we need to collide real quick with Collision before we get to the big pay-per-view, AEW Wet Dream, I believe they called it. Uh, but I just want to recognize a couple things, because I know you didn't have time to even collide with Collision, and it's not really worth it anymore. But there was a couple I chose of the Met game. The Mets were on against it. I'd rather watch that. Well, I would have rather chose belly rubs with Harley, but I feel some duty to check this out because juice wrestled they put juice on the air we've been bitching and whining why don't they put juice in the ring so they finally did i didn't want to slough that off and have people castigate us for it so it was juice robinson against andre and i it was an okay match but i just love watching juice robinson he moves and acts like a heel pro wrestler which is almost unique these days. He's got a great face. He's animated personality, loud. He can work. He knows he's a heel. And, you know, the again, the only thing is there's always something with AEW. You get a talent, they get a shitty finish. And basically in this one, they went back and forth and, one of the guns jumped up to draw the referee and the other gun rolled in the ring like he was going to do something. And the referee turns around and sees him in the ring. Doesn't call for a disqualification. Ejects both of the guns from ringside. And then the, and the match would continue. And then Andre to hit a shoot Judas elbow on juice. I don't know whether he meant to or not. But I thought it knocked him out. I think the announcers did too. And that was a two count. And then he picked poor Juice up and hit what looked like almost a shoot DDT and got the three count. And I'm, what the fuck was that? Besides the fact that the wrong guy won, I'd push Juice to give him some credibility. Andre's been floating around for quite a while, but... If the guy was going to win, it looked like he knocked the motherfucker out with his elbow strike that may have been accidental. I don't know what the fuck. I've never seen him do it before. It was the Judas. But that's a two count, and then he picks him up and drops him on his head again. After ejecting the heels from ringside immediately before that to where people are still reacting to that, and it's all ran together. So again, they need somebody to work on some of this shit. Taven and Bennett had a match, which we've been wanting to see, but unfortunately, the match they had was against the Pudding Gang. So I didn't want to see that. And it took them over 10 minutes to beat these fucking clowns. So it didn't really do any good. And, oh, good. And then they can't even leave well enough alone by trying to give these guys a win on some kind of television. Part of their finish is a was a wiener punch where they punched the baby face in the dick. And then afterwards, Bennett was selling and crawling with their, they had their bags, their suitcases, and they were crawling, Bennett was crawling up the ramp selling in a comedy fashion after they just beat these fucking job guys. While Taven was asking Cole to meet them at Roddy's house because it was an emergency. So this was even wasted. They Again, they had Julia Hart wrestling. See my previous match comments, but she won and then called out Chris Statlander, and Statlander came out with the Puddin' Gang. 
And you can't make Statlander a star if she's hanging out with fucking schlubs for the same reason that Paige was doomed from the start because he's in the middle of a job guy group. Do you remember when Steve Austin was backed up by his good friends, the Oddities? Of course not. Do you remember when The Rock was supported by the Brooklyn Brawler? I think Brawler may have got a truck 30 years after the fact, but anyway, the, everybody stared at each other for a while. And then they announced that Claudio Castagnoli would wrestle Josh Barnett on the pay-per-view tomorrow night in less than 24 hours. They were still announcing matches. And uh, Jericho and Twinkle Toes beat Tia Leone and Bishop Khan. And then the Righteous beat Tits McGee and Arnold Finster. And they pulled a two-by-four, the Righteous did, do you remember the, the thing in Misery that Kathy Bates did to James Kahn's ankles where she puts the block of wood and she whacks with the sledgehammer? Yeah. They did that to a jobber's ankles. And nobody cared. Because nobody had ever seen this motherfucker before. And if anything, he looked like he deserved it. And they're sitting on their fucking hands. And the main event of what was formerly the great wrestling program where we got classic matches was Ricky Starks, Big Bill, and Ozzy Oldham in an eight-man tag against FTR, Wheeler Useless, and Brian Danielson. And I've, again, there's parts of this, Brian Danielson, FTR, but FTR has gone from teaming with CM Punk to teaming with Yuta. And Danielson and Starks are stuck in this mess. And it's just... And Zack Sabre Jr. was on commentary. He sounded like a British life insurance salesman. And I didn't care and I didn't watch it. That was collision. So, we don't know how many people watched that yet either. But it was disturbingly low according to the... What do they call them? The fast overnights? It was in the 300,000-something range. Oof. Well, again, it was against a WWE uh, what, NXT pay-per-view event. But again, now free television from AEW is getting a shit kicked out of it by the pay-per-views, not from the WWE, but from their developmental program? Anyway, I believe we have an update from the stock market. Brian, um... The can can I just do this real quick? Well, I don't know. It's changed since uh, we spoke a few minutes ago about this. Well, but I've, I've, the the live one stock, folks, we had quoted it at ninety six cents earlier in the program. It was just a few scant moments ago, ninety two cents. Where is it at now? It is currently at. Oh, once again, it's at 92 cents. Well, there you go. Where was it when you were afraid it was something different? 90 cents. God damn it. You mean they're staging a comeback? How low can it go? What is the limbo uh, bar for stock before they say, well, fuck, we can't ask anybody to buy this with a straight face? And again, I apologize for the noise in the background, the work here at the manor, but... Again, if it's under... Are they trying to get out of your walls? If it's under a dollar for... I forget if it's 30 days or 90 days, they've got a problem. They may be delisted. You know, NASDAQ got behind them. We'll see how much longer that lasts. But again, this is the parent company, Live One, at 92 cents. Podcast One, currently as we are recording, $1.90. Oh, they're making a little comeback there. Tiny comeback. How is the stock of the subsidiary worth more than the stock of the company that owns it? Well, they own 81% of it. All right, have then rephrase the, that question. How is the stock of the subsidiary more valuable than the stock of the company that owns 81% of it? Well, again, there are a lot of different things that go into play. How much stock is out there for people to buy, what the price is. And uh, 
The market cap right now for Podcast One is at $43 million. And for Live One, this page appears to have frozen. For Live One, the market cap right now is at $82 million. Oh, me. Well, jump right on that bargain, folks. Get it while you can. It's got nowhere to go but up. And speaking of nowhere to go, where are you going this week if you survive this program to do the rest of the work of the Arcadian Vanguard Network? Listen, I feel really sick. Listen to the Wrestling News every day. The WrestlingNews.com are available wherever you find your favorite shows. Go through the archive for everything with all the shows on Twitter, at Super Podcasts, on Facebook, uh, Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast. I can't do it. The mothership. I can't do it. Fuck. <laughs> the mothership. It's a great mothership. You just have to trust me. Go through the archive, 605pod.com. Longer, more fun plug next week. The All mothership. right. Well, I guess now we come to the main event of what we've been all waiting for at least i was waiting for it to be over so there was some waiting going on aew wrestle dream oh a dream is but a dream on october the first from one of those fine arenas up in the seattle washington area and brad again this had it was legitimately five and a half hours from start to finish because they added a 30 minute window to the normally one hour pregame show their zero hour was zero 90 minutes right they said they started at 6 30 eastern i i didn't i watch didn't realize that i started at, i started watching or at least having it on the tv at seven going in and out until the main show i didn't know it started at 6 30 their advertising at least somewhere was a zero hour 6 30 eastern time 3 30 out there whatever the fuck but nevertheless they did an hour and a four hour paper it was five to five and a half hours 14 matches endless repetition it would not be over with and when they on about three different occasions they had a really good match or something going that there was just swell, and they didn't know when to leave well enough alone and had to go too far. And that's why it seemed like to me that it would never stop. And I wanted to see and did watch um, Bar Josh Barnett and Claudio Castagnoli on the Zero Hour, the match that they announced and added the night before on Collision. Apparently... I guess because it's Josh Barnett's hometown, too. He just drove down and wanted to do something, I guess, is how that got put together. But these zero-hour matches, why would you do this to this crowd that's already going to sit through four fucking matches or four hours of pay-per-view matches? The acclaimed and Billy Gunn against Shane Haste, Mikey Nichols, and a guy legitimately named Bad Dude Tito. And that was for the six-man belts. And then Dino Douche against Nick Wayne, I get because it's his hometown, so he had to work. And uh, again, Booker of the Year, Shane Taylor, Lee Moriarty, Diamante, and Mercedes Martinez against Satoshi Kojima, Keith Lee, Athena and Billy Starks in an eight person and mixed man and person and woman match or whatever. And then in the middle of all this is poor Josh Barnett and Claudio Castagnoli. And they worked a grappling match legitimately. And it was like in the middle of Rocky Horror Picture Show. Suddenly, they announced, ladies and gentlemen, Pavarotti with a selection from the Merchant of Venice. It was as far away from what this crowd would have come to see as anything you could possibly imagine. And they were respectful to it because it was Claudio. And I guess they're smart enough to know that Barnett is somebody. But it was grown men working a grappling contest in in the middle of a, however many 4,000 people or whatever that came to see the kids on the trampoline. 
And you could tell they just, they need educated on something like this. It needed to be a, an issue, some type of rivalry. They need to, needed to explain ahead of time what they were going to do, the rules of their contest. Because it was just kind of so polar opposite of anything else that AEW does. I don't, did you see it at all? Yeah, I thought it was good. I'm not a big Claudio fan, but I thought it was good. It was a different well, kind of match, but it was done so serious, and the fans treated it respectfully that it worked. Yeah, other, than, other than Moxley on commentary. Well, I was going to get to that, but and I didn't say it was bad. What I was saying was that it looked like a lot of the people just didn't know what to make of it because they're like, wait a minute, they're trying to make us believe this? You know, <laughs> it was just so odd for an AEW show. But they put Moxley on commentary like now he's goddamn Joe Rogan for the MMA-influenced people on the roster, and he was cussing and, uh, you know, and just droning on and slurring and whatever the fuck he does. And they were going to him like he was a mixed martial arts expert or could convey that verbally. And it was... and. At one point during the pay-per-view when he was out there with, I think, another one of the BBC matches, Nigel had to tell him, take a breath, which was a nice way of saying, shut the fuck up and let us get a word in edgewise. But anyway, so that was the zero hour. And the pay-per-view opened up with the only smart motherfucker in this company. MJF knew, put me on first. I'm going to lay this match out and hopefully these guys will be able to follow it. I'm not going to get hurt. I'm not going to look like an idiot and I'm going to get out of there before I get any on me or before it goes any longer in this fucking marathon and the people's enthusiasm is worn down. And that's exactly what he did. He's a goddamn, he's Leonard Bernstein. He is playing the fans and the, the opponents and again, Tony and everybody else like a goddamn fiddle. And no matter what kind of stupid angle they put him in, when, when he's out there where it's left up to him rather than these buddy comedy videos or whatever, or he's in a match that he'll figure out a way to make sense out of it. It's like watching Lawler work the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis with some green football player. He'll just work to that guy's ability level and he'll come up with some shit that makes the people pop even though nothing's fucking happening. He's a genius. Um, and he cut the promo to lay it out. He set up the deal of the match, got to defend the belts, keep him for my good buddy Adam. And then he tells the people what he's going to do. He's going to body slam the fat guy and he's going to stick Vinny's head up the fat guy's ass. And then they put the match together based on him trying to do that. And it was, it was great. And they got a little heat on him. And then, you know, Vinny tried to use the chair, but MJF grabbed his nuts and then made a comeback and body slam Dutch, and the people hit their feet and gave him a standing ovation for a body slam and chanted, holy shit. And then he ran Vince's head into Dutch's ass and <laughs> hit the kangaroo kick and the heat seeker on Dutch, one, two, three. So again, despite the ridiculousness of having the AEW world champion involved in this whole thing that we've talked about earlier in an opening match against an unknown team that's just started, but he made it work to at least, it didn't sell any pay-per-views, didn't draw any money, didn't sell any tickets, but he didn't look like a goddamn idiot. He got away with it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought MJF did good. The big guy in Vincent and Dutch, I don't know who's who. The big guy no, was... Vincent has the dreadlocks. Dutch is the, is the big fella. Dutch is pretty good for a big guy. I mean, you know, just watching him move in this one match, using this match as an example, I haven't seen him before. He was moving pretty good. Well, he reminds me of Big Bubba and even used a boss man slam. 
Um, he's a big guy that doesn't have a big, you know, a muscular physique, but he moves nimbly and he's got weight and he can put stuff behind it. So I just wish they'd quit cutting out paper dolls on their videos and maybe I'd be able to get on this train. But otherwise that was, and then that was MJ and he gets to get out early and beat the traffic. But I, I just, I'm constantly nervous that sooner or later they're going to give him something or make him be involved in some situation that the rest of these fucking idiots are going to fuck up, hurt themselves, do something. It's going to fucking hurt him too. He can't do this forever. He's, he's up on a tight wire. One side's ice, the other's fire. We'll probably play it on the drive through because we've gone along today, but there's audio from the media scrum after the event from a few different people I want to play you, but MJF had some comments about that, which are very interesting. Well, at least we don't have to hear Tony scrum today. Um, what Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling Championships were on the line in the match between Eddie Kingston and Shibata? I think it was the Ring of Honor World Championship and the uh, Open Weight Strong Championship. Open Weight Strong Championship. Well, Shibuti, Shibuti, Shibuti. I think they transplanted Tony Khan's brain. Again, Eddie Kingston ha had, has a an everyman appeal, and he's got the wise-ass mouth, and he comes off natural in a lot of situations but now i think we've established and i like eddie god damn he's not going to do anything but these fucking modern indie style japanese strong style whatever the fuck matches it's just that's that's what we're going to get and they locked up and then <laughs> shibata stood there and let kingston hit him over and over and then kingston did the same thing and then he asked shibata to kick him and so Shibata did and covered him, got a two count. And, uh, and at that point, the announcers were saying, this is going to be strong style. And I wrote, AKA phony shit and a good time to pick up some time. They ought to call it Japanese Mark style wrestling. I fast forwarded to the finish. The finish was they were standing there hitting each other. And then Kingston hit like three finishes on him in a row. And covered him one, two, three. Did I miss any subtleties? No, this was not a match for you. Who was this a match for? For fans of that style of wrestling. Fans who were into that style of wrestling. Good. Well, then they saw it eight other times in the course of the night. For the TBS title, Julia Hart versus Chris Statlander. And again, now Julia Hart has had more matches this week than moolah had in a, the same week in 1972 but it looked here like that somebody told him go as fast as you can do no wrestling moves whatsoever just fight and do unrelated shit to each other back and forth i'm talking no wrestling moves like arm drags hip tosses i'm they just did shit to each other back and forth and then statlander won with two tombstones in a row. So now we've established that not only Julia, Wh Julia White, Julia Hart just started wrestling on the program regularly a week or two ago. We've just seen a couple of matches. Now she's already been beat, but it took two tombstone pile drivers to beat a 125-pound 22-year-old blonde girl. Help me, Brian. You keep saying that. I don't know what you want me to say. Uh, I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. Julia Hart's moonsault is incredible. Yeah, again, yes, but they need to have somebody, if they're going to do this, somebody putting their matches together to play to their strengths, but to tell a fucking story instead of just doing... They tried to fight. They put a lot into it. They worked hard. It was supposed to be a, a, a fight. But my God, they, maybe they cut their time. They just started and didn't stop, but there was no time to let anything sink in. It just went back and forth and back and forth until two tombstones. 
And boy, does Julia Hart need to teach everybody else her neck routine. Because just think, if you could do that to your neck where you could get tombstone pile driven twice in a row, and that's the only thing that got the three count on you. All right. But you know, as soon as I finished looking at Chris Statlander and Julia Hart, you know what I started thinking about? No. I started thinking how wonderful it would be to dig into a good box of awesome. That's what you started thinking about during this match? Right as soon as the match was over, I said, I got to get into an awesome box. And boy, that's when I went back to the box of awesome that our friends over at Bespoke Post and boxofawesome.com sent me last week. Because they send you one every month, but it hadn't been a month, it's only been a week. So I dug into my box of awesome again to relive the greatness and the awesomeness that was my box delivered from boxofawesome.com. Brian, you remember what was in there, the, the tasting glasses from Maison Forin. Do you like the way I pronounce that? See, oh, yeah. I'm, I, I took a little French in school. The Because it was, a, a, a you know, Kentucky's big with the bourbon down here. This is bourbon country, so they sent me a box of awesome to do with an interest in bourbon. And I got the tasting glasses, and I got the, well, I thought it was a brown-nosing kit, and I was going to forward it to you, but then I saw it was a bourbon-nosing kit where you learn to train your nose and your nostrils and your central glands to, de to identify all the various scents in the good bourbons, the, the oak and the black pepper and the, the barley and the harley and the farley and all those other things that are in the brown bourbon nosing kit. And, of course, the olive oil and organic sourdough flatbread bites that you, you nosh on while you're sitting there sipping your bourbon and sticking the pepper up your nose and making yourself sneeze. That was in my box of awesome. And of course, your boxes of awesome have ranged from those knives that you are disturbingly compiling for some reason, all the way to a grow your own, not that, but pizza kit, where you can actually grow from Mother Earth the, the ingredients in your bland, meatless pizzas that you eat. It's all a part of Box of Awesome, and it's all a part of whatever you might be interested in, folks. Whether it's knives, or drinking, or eating, or whatever, you just go to boxofawesome.com, and you take their quiz. And you your answers will help them pick the right boxes of awesomeness for your individual interests. And then they send you a new box every month across a ton of different categories. And you pay only a fraction of the actual valuation of these items and you're supporting small businesses brian did you know they did a survey 90 percent of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from a small business and they've actually gone to these places and measured you can't be more than one story high that's 12 feet and you can't be more than 1400 square feet of floor space or elsewise they'll they'll just throw the shit back at you and they will not send it to their customers because they want only small, tiny, almost microscopic businesses, holes in the wall even. That's who they're helping, and you'll be supporting those folks too. And they're, they're fine people. They're very small people also. Many of the proprietors of these small businesses are only about three and a half feet tall. See, now I know you've, you've just aspirated and died because you're not disagreeing with anything folks again go to boxofawesome.com enter the code jce at checkout for 20 percent off your first monthly box when you sign up boxofawesome.com enter the code jce 20 percent off your first box of awesomeness from boxofawesome.com and folks, now if someone will call 911 for an emergency ambulance to pick up Brian Last, who has apparently lost consciousness. Are well, you there, Brian? I, Brian? I'm, I'm here. I'm listening to Yo, you. Brian. I'm Conan. listening to you talk about all these wonderful small businesses. And again, we encourage everyone to check out the Box of Awesome, Bespoke Post. We get it. We like it. One more time, what's the promo code, Jim? 
Boxofawesome.com code JCE, 20% off. And they're very, they're very small, tiny proprietors of these small businesses. That's right. All righty. Well, you know what was up next, Brian? And I, I want to I wanna be equal. I want to treat everybody equally. And the four-way tag team match where the winners get a shot at the tag team title came up next. And I didn't watch the single match that they had out of it. So I figured I'd skip this one, too. The Guns against the Lucha Brothers, against Hook and Pockets, against the Buckaroos. I feel bad that the Guns have to be, you know, inserted into this foolishness. But at least I felt like with Pockets and the Buckaroos and Penthouse and Felix all in the same match, it's, it's economical. I can skip them all at the same time. So that's where the finish was the Buckaroos did 100 things. And then Nicky slipped on a spinning flip and fell on his head and jumped up and clotheslined the guy anyway. And then they beat Penthouse with the shitty-looking double knee lift that they do, one, two, three. Again, or were there nuances that I was unaware of? No. Were there any fans that reacted like this was special? Is there any fan that is still <laughs> excited about the idea of seeing the Young Bucks and FTR anymore? This went from being a match that people anticipated to, really, again? I don't think anyone wants to see this. It was clear after Wembley that something more was going to happen because they all kept doing stuff together. And now we're going to get at least match four, maybe match well, five. But, but that's the thing. But now, you know, two out of three was fine. But now it's going to be four. And if, if the Buckaroos ain't going to go down three to one. So then that would necessitate the three out of five, which the Buckaroos may very well win. And does anybody want to see that anymore? Because no. Uh, okay. I think, honestly, my favorite match, just because of the reaction, came up next with uh, Hangnail Page and Swerve, and Swerve, of course, with Prince Nana, Swerve Strickland in his hometown. You could tell when Page came down the the way that the crowd was thinking, here comes the goof with the black cloud over his head. And Swerve was in his hometown, and Nana comes out dancing like Denny Terrio, and the people are yelling, Swerve's house, and he looks like something. And from it was another a situation where the crowd decided, We're, we like the heel, and we don't like the baby face, we don't give a fuck how it's been presented, but they didn't change anything about their match either. That not even subtly, like a, you know, the a Michaels and Hogan type of thing, or whatever the fucking case, or the Rock and Hogan, I should say. They just did the match where every time the heel cheated, the fans cheered, and every time the babyface showed fire, the people booed, and it was. It was like watching wrestling in a funhouse mirror because it's it wasn't even like they were... Yes, they were supporting an individual person, but since they changed really nothing about their match, everything that the guy that they supported was doing was, was making him look like an underhanded prick. I mean, do, does that make sense to you, what I'm trying to say? Well, I think it also ties into the previous match. The Young Bucks won. The Young Bucks did not get a big reaction coming out there. The Young Bucks were not really cheered by the fans. There was not a big pop for their winning. There was not a big smattering of booze for their winning. It was kind of indifference. And I think yeah. Adam Page has put himself in the position where he gets that kind of reaction too. He's going against someone here beyond hometown crowd. Charismatic. Seems pretty cool and happening. Pretty good in the ring. Why would you cheer Adam? Adam Page has done nothing to make himself cheerable unless you were already predisposed to liking him from Three years ago or something. It, unless you've been having some type of therapy classes for alcohol and depression, then might you could ad identify with this sad, drunken, fucking alleged cowboy from Virginia who drives a fucking electric car or whatever. Anyway, I, I, the match was a good match. Nothing out of the ordinary for AEW. Nothing particularly rotten or whatever the fuck, except... 
Again, at one point, Paige gave Swerve the dead eye on the on the metal stairs, and it wasn't the finish, and there was no count out. But then it was it was hilarious watching Swerve basically try to break Paige's arm, and the people cheering it. And it, you know, just about the time that it got long, Paige hit a buckshot and covered, but Nana put. Swerve's leg on the ropes and the referee ejected Nana and the crowd booed and while the referee was with Nana Paige went for the buckshot and Swerve hit him with the title belt and it covered him and got a two count now what the fuck uh, besides the fact that they created a situation where the referee ejected the heel manager for interfering and the crowd booed that decision and then the crowd cheered the baby face getting hit over the head with the title belt. That wasn't the finish. Then Swerve hit two more kicks and some kind of flippy move and then just beat him one, two, three. And I wrote, you got to be shitting me. They had the finish, the belt shot. That's the one that if they weren't going to change the rest of the match, they shouldn't have changed... Uh, he was still fucking him like a heel, but they were going to like it anyway, but at least he fucked him. They're so stupid that they do a finish that will give everybody what they need. The heel and the guy win and goes over. The, the baby face has an out. The people are up. It gets a pop. And then that, that'll be a two count, and they'll do three or four more moves and just beat a guy flat. And Brian, I swear to God, in any company, in any territory, in any period of wrestling until maybe the last, maybe only 10 years, if you had a baby face that was really over or thought he was being featured as a top guy and you went to him and said, okay, you're going to hit your fucking finish and you're going to cover me but my manager is going to put my leg on the ropes and break the count. And while the referee is kicking him out, you're going to come at me for another one. And I'm going to hit you with the title belt behind the referee's back and cover you and count one, two, three. They probably would have gone for that because the manager interfered. The referee was distracted. The heel cheated. Everything's right there. But if you said to him, I'll hit you with the belt and cover you, and then you kick out. So I'll get up. I'll kick you in the head two more times. I will pick you up and hit a move where I drop you on your head again and just pin you one, two, three. The fucking baby face would laugh at you. And he would say, are you out of your fucking mind? No, you're goddamn not. Because then he just beat him flat. It's fucking insane. They're doing this all over the place. It makes no sense. Your thoughts on this contest? I actually enjoyed it, but mostly because I was really getting into Swerve. And it was kind of cool, the fact the fans completely rejected Adam Page. Yes. I think the problem in general is there were too many matches where guys get hit with devastating finishers and kick out. And then it'll happen a second time, and they kick out. Maybe even a third or a fourth time. And then the thing they finally get beat with, even beyond the psychology of what a heel or baby face should do, the move they get beat with doesn't even look as devastating as any of the things they got hit with before it. Nowhere near any of the other shit they've survived. They just ran out of shit to do, so it was time. Booking-wise, though, I'm glad Swerve got a win. I think Swerve is clearly a guy on the way up and a clearly a guy the fans, not just in Seattle, want to get behind. And Tony's smart to do something with him right now. They did miss an opportunity, though. These people hated Paige so bad. If they'd have put him over, we might have seen somebody hit the fucking ring. It'd be refreshing to see that level of heat these days. I think they probably might have taken him out in the parking lot and fucking used him for a pinata. I mean, when when the heel wins a shoulder tackle exchange and the fans pop for it, it's uh, anyway. Page has made his own bed. Now he can 
He can certainly not sleep in a fine Helix mattress. Okay, I bet you watched Ricky Starks versus Wheeler Useless, didn't you? Not so much, because... Okay. Nothing even against this match, and I'm not a Wheeler Yuta fan, and he looks ridiculous. You want to talk about, you brought up Jay White earlier during the Dynamite review that he's a little bit taller, but not completely dissimilar to the Adam Cole build. Wheeler Yuta's even worse. He has, like, no muscle. He's just skinny. Just tall and skinny with long arms. Long, but, long skinny arms with no muscles on them. He looks a bit like somebody was almost ready to fill up one of those Weeble Wobbles with some sand, but they didn't have enough sand. Yeah, if you put sand in that Weeble Wobble, it would look like superhuman. That's why. There, there you go. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, like, I like Ricky Starks. I wasn't going to watch this, and uh, I needed a break. It was a long show. I said during this show, after one of the matches I liked, I said on Twitter, I really wish they would bring back intermission. I, I'm not even joking. It's not even a joke. There needs to be an intermission on these shows. It's too long for me, and I'm home. Well, yeah, I mean, b those poor people in the in the arena, but even they used to have an intermission on early pay-per-views for the people at home to get up and piss or get a goddamn right. soft drink or something. That's right. But uh, the plumber was back on color, stumbling through that. You can't take Wheeler seriously. You can't listen to the plumber ramble. I, I, and honestly, in there with Starks, who looks like an athlete, he's not the biggest guy in the world, but there, Wheeler's got the beard, the lack of physique, the unflattering tights. He looks like a recently released political prisoner. Somebody's been mistreating him in some fashion. He escaped somehow across a border. He's their version of Eric Watts. He's a guy being pushed beyond where he should be because certain people there really like him and want him to be their guy that gets pushed. But there's nothing, there's nothing that shows that it's there now with him. Well, Starks won at least, so they, you know, they made the right decision there. And then the the dream match on Wrestle Dream that was billed as a dream match: the two best technical wrestlers allegedly in the world. I say allegedly. Danielson, I'll buy is one of them. I'm still alleging the other one. Zack Sabre Jr. and Brian Danielson. Do you remember when the best British wrestler in the world was Billy Robinson and he looked like he could fucking snap every goddamn appendage on your body? He could. And he could, yes. Okay, even if Zack Sabre Jr. could, I'd laugh if you suggested that he might try. He looks like a fucking insurance salesman with a bad bleach job. There is the... None he of used these. to be. He used to be even skinnier. This is him with weight on him. What? Oh yeah. No, if you'd seen him like four years ago, it was even. He stood out even more as being really, really skinny despite his talent. This is him with weight. But how come in a previous generation, all the guys that were in their late twenties and early thirties looked like they were forty, and now all the guys that are almost forty look like they're in their fucking late teens, early twenties? Terry Gordy looked like he was fucking 30 when he was 19. What is it, nobody is intimidating in it. Here's the thing. Again, like I said, they needed with Barnett and Claudio, not Jim Barnett, but Josh Barnett. With, yeah. with my boy. Oh, yeah, my boy. With, uh, with him and Claudio, they needed to educate the people on the style of wrestling they were going to do, and they also needed to have an issue and and Barnett just can't, you know, show up because it's his hometown. Well, he did, so he can. But and and for the people to understand what's going on, because it's not a wrestling crowd anymore. Especially these people, they come to see the trampoline fucking routine. But was with, with Zack Saber Jr. has been on their television what twice or three times? A couple of times he's talked. I think they had him in a tag team match. Did he get a single win one time? Um, he, you know, again, he doesn't look like anything visually if they don't allow him to get over by showing that he's allegedly the, the greatest technical wrestler in the world. And you just hear that said, why the fuck do you believe it? So this was just cold matches for Tony Khan's 
sensibility with people that the majority of even of his own television audience have not seen. And, and there's the plumbers out there for color again. That's where Nigel had to almost say, shut up. Take a breath, John, and let me just ask you this. I would like to know from the AEW fans, was that a fair trade-off? You get the dream match, but you also have to get Moxley on commentary. I, I don't see how that anything about that can be fair. But, you know, on this show, they're going to have a good match here for the style that they're doing. But Danielson was wasted. This is not a marquee match. Zack Sabre Jr. means nothing. MJF was wasted. Moxley, thank fuck, wasn't even on the card, but he's a name there. Cole is injured. It, 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 they neutralized or marginalized a lot of their top talent in meaningless matches with no issue, no, no grudge, no, no reason for happening. And in some cases, a cold match amongst top guys is not the worst thing. Except then you go at one further by having a cold match with somebody in, uh, on one side of it that's never even on your fucking television. So it's a cold match with a nobody. <sighs> so, and then Sockface started comparing this to Inoki versus Billy Robinson. That famous 60-minute draw. He was unbearable all night. Excalibur. <sighs> Well, because he's in his element here. He pleasures himself to the Japanese indie wrestling. And then they stood there and let each other forearm the other one. And if this was a dream pro wrestling match, I'd have loved to give me one tackle, drop down, leapfrog, hip toss, kick off, arm drag, arm drag, drop kick, bump to the floor. Give me some fucking wrestling. Don't give me the same shit that everybody else tries to do these days. And it was executed better. Danielson's great. And little Q-tip boy Zack Sabre can do all the moves. But he doesn't look like a salty old fucking, you know, Welsh coal miner doing it. He looks like a fucking, like I said, a British life insurance salesman with a bad bleach job. And they're doing... If neither guy was over, this was a well-done, modern-style cold match that people would have sat on their hands for. Danielson is over, so that saved it. But there was no heel, per se, or babyface that the fans just liked Danielson. But again, lots of kicks, lots of the mat wrestling. Danielson and MJF was a classic. This was laborious because... People didn't care about half the fucking competitors. And again, they were doing the same thing that a lot of these other guys try to do these days. They just did it a lot better. But then finally, Danielson hit the knee and got a two count. So he got up and did the same thing again and got a three count. Well, am I being too hard? Maybe. I thought it was really good. Again, I'm not taking away. You're 100% right. This may not be the best use of Danielson. This is not a big money match to people who aren't in that bubble. Zack Sabre Jr. hasn't been built up well on TV. This match doesn't seem to mean anything in the general scheme of things in AEW, but I'm sure there'll be a rematch at Wembley or something down the road. But with all that said, I enjoyed it. I went into it knowing what it was going to be. It was going to be these two guys trying to do a really good grappling match. And it was. I liked a lot of the mat stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not even saying it sucked, and I'm not saying I didn't enjoy some of it. They could lighten up on the goddamn kicks, couldn't they, if they're going to have a wrestling match. But I guess that's Danielson's gimmick. Yeah, and if it's an Anoki tribute show, might as well have the kicks. Might as well. In that case, somebody should have had a fucking prosthetic chin. At the media scrum, I will say, Tony Khan was wearing a scarf like Inoki. The red scarf. <laughs> so he was obviously in the Inoki zone. Have you seen one of the clips that's been on Twitter? People have been sending it around when Andre worked with Inoki. The little rib that Andre did. He did the old deal where he grabbed Inoki's head with his chin down on his thigh and he did the stomp thing. 
And then Andre sold his own thigh because of the size of Anoki's chin. <laughs> I did not see that, no. <laughs> but anyway. But I, but I thought um, this was a good match. Again, not taking away from anything you said, which are all valid points. Just as a match, I enjoyed it because I didn't think of it as yeah. anything more than that. I just wish that I could get lost in it a little bit more if all of the the British world of sport technical masters didn't look like they were fucking 14 years old. And it looked like the, the, the world of sports stars of days gone by or the American transplants, the Robinsons, the Thorntons, the Charleses, the fucking Foley's, the goddamn, not Mick Foley, but John Foley, the fucking Ted Heath. Ted Heath was a salty looking old bastard. You'd think he could fucking stretch you. But, you know, there's a difference between tough and rugged kids going to a local gym and learning how to hook versus kids who grew up watching WWE deciding they want to get into wrestling. And then some of them yeah. eventually discover Japanese tapes and they want to do what they see there. You know, it's not like, I went to Wigan and I learned the Wigan style. No, there's none of that. So now instead of getting Tommy Billington, we get Tommy Two-Tone. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. So the six-man tag team confrontation was up next with Jericho, Kenny Olivier, and his life partner, Kota Ibushi, against uh, Will Ostrich, Sammy Guevara, and our friend Take a Shit with Don Fallis. And can anybody now realize that seeing Take standing next to Ibushi amplifies how bland and generic and nondescript Ibushi is. He looks like uh, somebody fucking imported an amateur Japanese swimmer into the fucking match. Take a shit looks like a goddamn star, and he's so athletic, and he moves like greased lightning. I agree, and the other thing is, Ibushi has, what, what do you call it, moop face? Just permanent moop face. Moop face, yeah. Just woo. And at least they did some wrestling here. Even Kenny did some arm drags. What the uh, ostrich had the round blotches all over his body. And that used to be a thing in Inoki's TVs. You would see his young guys in matches had the round blotches all over their body back in the mid eighties. What is that procedure they're doing I think it's cupping, where they use, uh, you know, suction to try to bring blood to an area of the body that needs help. But why the fuck would this fucking white boy from goddamn Australia or wherever be doing that? England. Uh, uh, oh, he's the one from England. Wait, we just saw him have the big match at Wembley. The other guy's the other one from Australia. Which other guy? Wherever all they're... I don't know where they're from. The point is, he's some fucking... Fancy Dan talking British or Australian white boy. What's he doing the Japanese cupping treatment for? Just to look like he's a Japanese wrestler? Well, no, athlete. There are other athletes outside of wrestling. Or yeah, he's the only one that shows up with big round blotches all over him. It's cosmetic business. He looks like he's got the leprosy. And I'll give him credit. Out of all the British wrestlers or even the Australian wrestlers you accuse of being British that we've seen the last few years... He's, and let's not leave New Zealand out of this. He's the one, Will Ospreay, he sounds the least posh out of everyone. <laughs> so give him credit. Well, when you say another fancy British guy, I don't think that's fair. All right, he's least posh and he's least spicy or whatever else he is, but Kenny did some wrestling. We saw some arm drags and blah, blah, blah. And then they got some heat on Kenny. And again... You know, I said, uh, take looks the best of anybody to me in the match. And then I swear to God, if after they've got heat on Kenny and he's sold and he's sold, if he didn't make his own comeback with the most ridiculous looking flying claw slam to a couple of the heels, but he made his own comeback and then turned around and gave Jericho a flat footed cold tag. I was like, wow. Thank you. Why did he bother selling then? And so Jericho made a little comeback and he tagged Idushi in and he did very little and they tagged Kenny back in. And then they did their double backflips and they a bunch of shit by everybody. 
And then Sammy, he did something where he got a two count on Jericho because they're the only ones in the ring because, again, they're doing the thing the modern matches do where they'll have just two guys in the ring and everybody else will be just laying around watching. But Sammy got a two count on Jericho, and then instead of trying to do something else to him because he narrowly kicked out, Sammy jumped up, ran up to the top rope, and backflipped off the top rope onto the people on the floor. Why? How what how is that gonna He's he had the guy almost beat in the middle of the ring? These people were 20 feet away from him. They couldn't do anything about it. It's a good point. But then he got back in, did Sammy, and Jericho was up and hit him with the fucking code breaker or whatever. And again, you know, then Ostrich and Kenny were fighting, and everybody else just watched. And then everybody hit moves on everybody else. And it uh, again, it doesn't really make any sense because then they stop tagging and they stop, you know, having a one on one match, and everybody either disappears or is all in a mess together. And then Sammy, at one point, did you see whatever they did to him or he did? He looked so blown up that as they were getting heat on Jericho, Sammy was just waving his hand in front of himself as the other ones were beating on Jericho instead of even making any contact. And he looked like he was sucking wind. Maybe somebody knocked the fucking breath out of him. And then Ibushi did some phony-looking shit. And then when you had Coda and Take standing in front of each other. It looked like the Japanese Arnold Schwarzenegger against the Japanese Jimmy Fallon. It's just ridiculous. And then they stood there and traded forearms while everybody else laid there and watched them do it. And then I said enough, and I fast-forwarded a few minutes and a few dives, and Jericho got the walls on Sammy, and Don Fallis came in with Jericho's baseball bat and hit him in the head with it, and Sammy covered him one, two, three. And I'll say one more thing, and then you can give me your comments. What the fuck now? They're using the gimmick that the babyface brings to the ring to fuck the babyface. Maybe he should have just left it in the, in the fucking back. Your thoughts. Well, again, between Omega and Jericho and Callus, you have some of the brightest minds in wrestling history uh, involved with this match. It was all right. You know, I knew what it would be and what it wouldn't be. And it was okay, not great for that. It was a fine six-man AEW-style match. And I agree with you. Konosuke Takeshita has a look, he has size, and he's good in the ring. And... Just like I said earlier with Swerve Strickland, he's another guy that they should really break away from all this other shit and do something with. Well, speaking of breaking away, we couldn't break away from this show because it wasn't over yet. Three hours in the pay-per-view, plus an hour or hour and a half of the pre-show, the bell rings for the AEW World Tag Team title match with FTR and our friends Ozzy Oldham, and the people have been sitting there for between four and four and a half hours, plus whatever time they came in before the match has started. And, God, now that I think about that, Brian, if the pre-show started at 6.30, that was 3.30 local time, the people had to be in the building about 3, 3.15 at the latest, would they leave their homes? They left their homes shortly after lunchtime, and they were still watching wrestling at pretty much 8 o'clock at night. And there, no, I'm sorry, 9 o'clock, because it was midnight on the East Coast. So they they were still watching. They watched wrestling or were on the way to the fucking show for the better part of half the more than half the day. All right. Anyway, FTR and Ozzy Oldham, old Kyle Fletcher and old, what's his name? Ned Davis, Mark Davis. Ozzy open. Do you now see what I said before? When I said the one guy looks like cash and Dax had a giant baby. Yes. He's a perfect mix of the two of them. 
but don't don't uh, correct me on their name because Nigel McGinnis is calling him Ozzy Osbourne. I'll correct him when I see him. So I'm thinking at this point, okay, Ozzy both may look like Ned in their own way, but at least we've got a wrestling match. I'll take it at this point. And I thought that I was going to like this because I don't know how long it was, but if it was, if it was 15 minutes, I liked the first 10 and it wasn't because it was too long. It was because of what they did the last five minutes, but nevertheless, I will, I'll digress and I'll put them over first. FTR were the smoothest and the most professional pro wrestlers on the show with the timing and the basics and the pace they're moving, but it's not too fast. They're using pro wrestling moves. It's not just a bad Japanese indie tribute match, right? Fletcher took a backdrop. I actually took two of them. It, when Dax and Mark Davis, the big guy, when they traded the chops, it was like they meant it. And they were exchanging blows like a fight. They weren't standing there. Oh, I dare you hit me. I'll let you. And and really the first when when FTR are in control and they're controlling the pace and calling everything, it's usually pretty impeccable. When they started getting the heat on cash and Ozzy were in control, there again the problem is they're not over because they've had no serious TV time, very few promos. They're not a top tier tag team. Like I said, one guy looks like the other guy's delinquent fucking nephew. Their look is, the the team name is stupid, and their look doesn't fit both of them. Uh, once again, the uh, Mark Davis, the bigger, older, rougher-looking guy, he's wearing a flashy green tights and whatever that the young guy with the weird haircut might look good in. But the young guy with the weird haircut doesn't look like he ought to be hanging out with the old guy. You see what I'm saying here? They just look odd. No, I do think that they, and again, I haven't seen a ton of their stuff. I've seen a good amount, and I've seen their previous match with FTR from a year ago. They look like they should be in two different tag teams. They don't have a yeah. look that matches. So the, the name, all you did, they're from Australia. Great. Big deal. What, what's open about them? Uh, it, 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 the name doesn't work. The individual names are John Smith. Nothing stands out. They don't look like they belong together, and they need some other kind of fucking clothing that at least would bring the two of them together. So point being, when they're getting heat on fucking FTR, the people are kind of like, eh, because who gives a shit? Nobody thinks they're going to win. And then after a long heat, Fletcher nailed Dax off the apron and Cash took over and set Fletcher up on the top rope and hit a belly to back off the top on Fletcher, which interrupted the flow of the heat. What, it's like making your own comeback, but it wasn't even as exciting because it took longer, but he was in control. And then Cash went to tag again because Dax wasn't on the, Dax had been nailed off the apron or he would have tagged. But you didn't have to do a belly to back off the top. So that kind of put the kibosh on the heat they'd gotten. And then when he went to tag again, they pulled Dax off the apron again and got more heat. Now I'm saying too long now. And finally, Cash backdropped Fletcher and hit the tag to Dax after milking the tag. So they got a pop. And again, nice comeback, but the crowd was tired. And Ozzy ain't over. So they popped for Dax's high impact stuff, but they weren't. <sighs> Part of the great reaction of a hot tag and a comeback is that the people want to see the heel get the shit kicked out of him for all the shit he's just done to the baby face and for the heat that he already has. These people were not happy about who Dax was beating up. They just liked seeing his moves. There was, so that's the difference. And 
Then I wrote lots of back and forth, and I said, they need to go. And then they did more shit. The heels did more shit to Dax, and they were tagging in and out. No, you don't need that. Get it done. And then tons of false finishes and more heel tags. And FTR hit the superplex splash, but then they did a spot where Fletcher dove on Dax, and they fell on him for the save. And then a four-way in the middle and another heel tag. So the heat's been done so long ago, they might as well not have done it at all. And more false finishes. FTR Spike Pile drove Davis on the apron. And then Fletcher dove on FTR. And then FTR gave Fletcher the shatter machine off the top rope. Finally, one, two, three. It was the best wrestling match of the night until Cash hot tagged Dax. And when Dax made his comeback, and they didn't go home in the next two minutes. Then they just started doing everything ever done to beat a mid-card tag team that the fans don't give a shit about. And this is FTR's problem. They think everything has to be a classic or it will ruin their reputation as the best ever. But the problem is, the rest of the teams they're working with ain't up to a classic. They either can't remember it, they can't execute it, or nobody wants to see him do it to begin with. Because it's too much for people who are, aren't over. And this was a five fucking hour show. Oh, good God. Have I conveyed that in any clear terms? Yeah, I think so. It was an all right match. And I think that is sometimes something we see with FTR. Sometimes they do more with certain guys than they probably need to. But with that said, they probably see Aussie Open a bit different than we do. They see a little bit more of the history there and a tag team they like working with. Okay, they ought to look at it like the fans do. And the fans say, who are these fucking guys? I haven't seen much of them. I don't remember hearing them talk. If they do, it doesn't stand out. They look odd together. And they're not at FTR's level. During the match, I almost thought they may win because I was just thinking, surely they cannot do another Bucks FTR match now. There's no demand for it. Why not do something different? Oh, there's big demand for the Bucks against Ozzy Oldham. No, but at least it would have been something different that could have gone somewhere else. Yeah, something different would be instead of kicking you in the balls, I'll fucking hit you with a fucking stick, but it'd still be a shot in the balls. All right, well, I believe there's one more match left on the show. There's certainly, but three falls, one match, three falls. For the TNT title, two out of three falls, Christian Cage versus Darby Allen, and this match went on last. And I'm thinking, okay, when I was first watching it, not knowing what would eventually unfold, I'm thinking, oh, it's Darby's hometown, so he'll be the hero, maybe they're, you know, and then, as we find out, the finish had to go on last also. But again... The bell rang at three hours, 25 minutes into the pay-per-view. And then add an hour, hour and a half for the pregame. So the, the people are five hours into the show before the main event starts. And in the first fall, you would expect that normally the, the heel goes up to put the Baby face in jeopardy, right? Generally, the heel will somehow win the first fall, so that way the people, oh, shit, he's got to win two now to the baby face to pull this out. But they did. And again, this was another one where I thought this is going to be the best thing on the whole show until I saw the last five minutes. They can't help themselves. Christian Cage is a tremendous fucking heel. His work is great. He knows what to do and what he shouldn't be doing, and he's not going to get hurt. And he's got heel demeanor, and he can put a match together to make sense. I'm sure somebody else helped him with this one. And Darby is a hometown boy, and he's the most leadable babyface on their roster. Remember, we've said it. When he's got a veteran that will control him and not let him do the, all the stupid shit, he's great. And he's leadable, and he has the the charisma. But I, I honestly, and I'll get to it, I can't believe that Christian Cage 
it was his idea to, or was he in favor of some of the things that were done in this match, but we'll get to that. There was a clear baby face and heel. There was solid wrestling. They didn't start at 100 miles for an hour. Christian took over with simple shit and got big heat from the fans. And then they came up with a brilliant finish for the first fall that was executed perfectly. When Christian was going to do something, Darby came out and foiled it and pulled Christian's turtleneck over his fucking face and head and then jackknifed him while he was blind, one, two, three. And it was perfect, and it was brilliant. And now Darby's up one fall, and the people are, they're hooked. So I love that, right? That was fucking great. What'd you think? I enjoyed the first fall. And it was only a couple minutes, so they didn't give away everything that they, you know, they had. And when they started the second fall, that's when Christian takes over and starts the heat because Darby has to fight from underneath and be the underdog and get hope spots and then explode. And Christian got heat on him, and it was, again, solid. And then he missed a splash or diving headbutt or whatever. Darby made a comeback. They got a few false finishes. Christian dumped him to the floor and bounced him off the rail. And then that Nick Wayne's mother is in the front row. And they did the thing where Christian... Christian is not exactly a sex symbol. I don't know if I would have had had him go over there and try to put the make on Nick's mom. He could have gone over and taunted her. But nevertheless, she looks like she's going along with it until he gets close, and then she throws a drink in his face. And then Darby hit one of those bullet drives, or bullet dives, rather, where he just, like he's shot from a cannon. And then does the coffin drop, off the top bullet, rope onto the floor. Bullet, dro- bullet drive is what Cash Wheeler calls the ride home. Oh, come on now. The that bullet, has never been proven. The proof- bullet drive. That has never been proven. What gun? But uh, what, what gun? So he hits the coffin drop off the top to the floor, and then one in the ring, but Christian raises the knees, and then he knocks Darby off the apron onto the desk. And then that's when it fell apart. Because then after they do a back and forth and Christian looks like he's going to, they're on the apron and he picks Darby up like he's going to power slam him off the apron onto the steel stairs, which I believe was the spot that they were going for. But it looked like as Christian was holding him, he realized and he said something to Darby. He's like, I don't, the, the stairs were pointed that way. They'd been moved. So he would have had to slab slab Darby. Yeah, he just about did. He would have had to have slammed Darby on the actual stairs, not on the flat top, but on the steps. And so it looked like he was saying, I can't put you down good from here. So he just kind of slammed him off the apron onto the floor feet first. And then he goes down there and picks Darby up like for a vertical suplex and suplexed him onto the stairs. And then they get back up on the apron and Christian picks him up and does power slam him or body slam him off the apron onto the stairs. What he had tried not to do the first time. Now the guy's taking two of those bumps. And I'm, I'm right. Why? What the fuck is going on here? And it looked brutal. And it was, no, uh, right on the goddamn edges of those steel stairs back first. That's not something Christian would do unless this idiot was saying, no, do it to me, do it to me, do it to me. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would say, because now Darby, the doctor comes to check him and Darby gets counted out for the second fall. And the first bump would have worked, but he had to take the second one. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that when Christian got him up the first time, he said, no, this ain't safe. I can't do it. And he kind of, and he let him like Darby just flipped out of it and landed on the floor. But then he went down to get Darby and he picked him up and he dropped him on these things in a way that Christian apparently felt was safe. 
and thought that will be the bump. And then Darby either gets up or is telling him, no, no, do the other thing. Because he's a fucking idiot and he has to be protected from himself and his lack of goddamn sense, Darby. But Christian, after being requested to, I believe, said, all right, I'll do it to this fucking guy and see if I can do it. And that's what they did. So he took two of the bumps when it, the first one would have worked or either one would have worked, but both in a row called attention till they fucked something up. Is that what you got or were you even caring by that point? You know, it's a weird thing when you watch a Darby Allen match, you kind of wait for what's the spot going to be where I go, oh my God, there's no way he could survive that. And then he does it. It's every single match. It never looks good. Like you said, it always has to be his idea because no one's going to say, hey, how about I just fucking kill you out there? Darby seems to like that kind of stuff. But it was, it had gone pretty, when they were setting up the stairs, I was worried. And when they finally hit it, I was like, yeah, that looks really awful. Yeah, and again, even if it was a great idea and even if Darby wanted to do it, when it didn't come off the first two times, drop it because now you're just making yourself look stupid in front of these people because they can start telling that you're doing a variation of the same thing over and over again. You're obviously fucking it up. So then they get Darby on a stretcher. The doctor, and there's no count out. The doctor and the people just come and they put him on a stretcher on wheels and they're strapping him down. So we would assume this thing has been stopped, right? Because they're going to wheel him out. While they're wheeling him out, or preparing to wheel him out, Christian cuts the apron loose and, un and unrolls the canvas and starts unrolling the padding off of half of the ring. Why would he be doing that if the, his opponent is on a fucking stretcher? And he's obviously won this thing. Just stand there, right? But no. He's, uh, Christian is stripping half the ring and then goes to the top rope and splashes off the top onto Darby on the stretcher on the floor, which it didn't break because it's a real stretcher and there's wheels on it. But then Christian rolled Darby back into the ring. So now the doctor and the referee don't have control anymore. Why is, if Christian is about to win this thing, why is he wanting it to continue? Why is the referee and the doctor letting him take the guy off the stretcher that they just put him on and put him back in the fucking ring? And why, if any of this was going to happen, did Christian need to take any of the ring apart? Oh, the announcers are kind enough to tell you, apparently so he can pick the guy up that was on the stretcher and drop him on the hardwood. And that's what he did. He gave Darby his finish, the unprettier, on the wood with no padding or canvas and covered him and got a two count. A two count on the corpse, the the fucking dead body of Darby Allen that had just been hauled off a stretcher, that had just been paralyzed on the ring steps. Now Christian gets a scorpion death lock on Darby, a submission hold after a hospitalization angle, and his finish on lumber and a half torn down ring. Now we'll go for a submission. But then Darby comes out of it, and he does a coffin drop off the top rope onto Christian on the bare wood and gets a two count. And then Christian power bombs him on the wood. But Darby ducks out of the way and Christian spears the referee. So then Christian hits Darby in the balls. But of course, as we know, that doesn't work. We've seen it already tonight. Christian gets the title belt. And he's going to fucking hit Darby with it. But Nick Wayne appears at ringside and steals the belt and rolls in to stand by Darby Allen. And Darby stands up and now 
There's Darby and Nick Wayne looking at Christian. And of course, Nick Wayne turns around and knocks a fuck out of Darby Allen with the title belt. And his mother gets upset. And Nick Wayne dives out and Christian covers and the referee is awake again. One, two, three. So apparently, remember back a couple of weeks ago that one time that it was mentioned that Nick was not altogether happy about Darby's involvement with Swerve and the guy that's been forgotten that disappeared, A.R. Fox, when he was in there for a minute. Yeah, he turned too, twice. Uh, he turned and turned back and then he turned up missing. Um, well, Nick has held a grudge. Apparently. Apparently. So, I mean, surprising move. You didn't really get into him as the young underling baby face to Darby. Now they're going to try to do that with Christian, whose whole gimmick is what? He's a weird father figure who makes jokes about dead people. I don't know what the gimmick is exactly. Are you okay with that for Nick Wayne trying something different? Well, <laughs> I'm I'm okay with somebody trying something different. If they hadn't, if everything's designed to either be short term or to fail to begin with. Remember, Action Andretti was a future superstar for three weeks. Then he disappeared. You didn't see him much until he started coming back every once in a while to do a job. Nick Wayne was signed as this heralded teenage sensation, this sympathetic figure, this. His son of a dead fucking hero, you know, and that lasts eight weeks. And then they're, they've, they've made him so meaningless and stupid and involved him in this nonsensical angle where people are turning on each other back and forth to now he's a heel. Shit like this used to take a lot longer to develop, didn't it? Where people would actually care about it by the time that it happened yeah i mean again nick wayne has just been established there now they are in his hometown so if you were ever going to get a reaction i guess that was it but in general everything does everything happen have to happen in everybody's hometown no and again nick wayne did lose earlier in the he actually lost the luchasaurus on the pre-show funny enough there you go but I think after the match ended and they started doing the angle and angles, I guess you could say, it took forever. Like, it felt like it was almost as yes. long as the match, the post-match, just waiting. You were clearly waiting for something to happen, and most people guessed what it was, and it was exactly that. But it took forever to get there. Well, and let's, let's go ahead and start getting there, because basically the match was over when... Darby got clocked with the title belt by his friend or ex-friend Nick Wayne and Christian covered him and one, two, three, and Mama Wayne was upset at Nick. And again, as I mentioned, the first part of that match, most of it was great until the whole stare thing and it fell apart and then it got ridiculous with the ring being taken apart and just that visual. It is so stupid. But then Christian is holding Darby. And Nick is on him, a slap at him, and a punch at him, and a kick at him. And then here comes Darby's friend Sting. And he was really walking with purpose. If somebody is just beating the bejesus out of you, and a friend of yours is coming to help, and, and they, they move at the pace that Sting was moving, would you question their dedication to your friendship? Is this the first time we've seen Sting come out without his music playing? Well, I think at least because that's because it was unplanned. At least they figured that out after we've been screaming that for four years. But couldn't he move a little quicker? Yeah, but everything else that's an unplanned running on the show, everyone had their music on this show, had their music playing, had videos playing. Well, maybe he said, you know what? Don't play my music. It'll be a bigger pop when what happens happens. Who knows? Point is, he didn't look like he was goddamn highly motivated to get there and save poor Darby. But he finally got in the ring, and it, he made a little bit of an awkward comeback because the ring was a mess, and the the padding was rolled up in the middle, and you couldn't bump safely with a bunch of people in the ring. And then he gave him a few pissy bumps, and then the heel stayed down while Sting walked around, I guess waiting on 
Dino douche to get there because Dino was a bit late, but finally he got there and he got on Sting and Sting went down. And then Christian goes out to get the two chairs for the concerto. And, and like you mentioned, at that point, I said, this won't end. It was so slow and it like, there's no, already there's no credibility and there's no realism because security or cops or extra referees or somebody would be trying to stop mayhem like this. There's no urgency. It's just the same thing with the WWE when they do these long angles. But nevertheless, suddenly the lights go out. And... On the video screen pops up the video of somebody starting up and driving a car. <laughs> and I wrote, my God, now a video makes the save. Everybody stops what they're doing in the ring to watch somebody that you can't see drive a car. But helpfully... <laughs> I'm going to kick your ass! I'm going to... Oh, oh, wait, there's a movie. Yeah, there's a movie. There's, is there Punch and Pie also with the film? Fortunately, they ruined their own surprise when the car, an overhead shot from one of their independent film auteurs that does this shit. Darby Allen. They had a shot of the car driving over a, a, a street from above where the street had rated R written on the street. So, And the people, you heard the people pop when they saw it. So they... They blew their own surprise with the fucking introductory faceless car driver video. And then Edge's music hits, which apparently he owns. His, you think you know me? Well, no, he doesn't own it. It's a real band with a real song. They own it, and they will allow Edge to use it wherever he wants. However, what WWE does own is you think you know me. That's why that was changed. I... I, I wasn't well versed enough to know that it was changed. Uh, it was the same words. No, it was, it different was people. I think it was a different voice saying, you think you know him, not you think you know me. Oh, maybe it was, you think you own me? Well, and Tony said, yes, you don't own me anymore. Nevertheless, edges, music hits in whatever iteration or orchestration of it. And he comes out with pyro and the big pop and heads to the ring and doesn't make an immediate save. He goes in face-to-face -face with Christian, his old cohort, compadre, asks Christian for the chair. He sets up like he's going to do the concerto on Sting, so of course by now you know he's not. And he turns around and hits Nick Wayne with the chair and spears Dino and spears Nick and Christian bails to the floor. And Ed shakes hands with the baby faces and the people are ballistic. And of course, they can't call him Edge. He's got to be Adam Copeland, but he can be rated R superstar, apparently. Yeah, they vacated that trademark, although he did uh, file for a bunch of trademarks earlier today as we were recording, I think, Cope was one of them, and uh, obviously he has rated R superstar, I guess. What about copacetic? He has not gone for that yet. What about the cope? I don't know if he's going to be able to cope with this. Um, I hate to see this move, honestly, because I know Tony probably gave him several million dollars a year for however many years. And I guess he just thought at that point, okay, there's new ownership in the WWE. Is Edge already in the Hall of Fame? Have they inducted him? Oh, I think they did, but I'm not certain. I think they did too, but yes, they did. So if he's in the Hall of Fame already, they're probably if they didn't take fucking Trump or Benoit out, they're not going to take him out. See, that's the problem. They keep saying he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's not. He's like a third or fourth ballot Hall of Famer. You have to seriously think about it and wonder if he's there or not. Well, but nevertheless, he, he, I didn't think as of a couple weeks ago, that's why he's worked there for 25 years. He and his wife both. And he's done television and acting roles. And now the biggest talent agency in Hollywood owns the fucking... WWE and just out out of any kind of 
loyalty, gratitude, or future income? Did Tony give him enough million dollars for the next two or three years? And I assume at this level, all of Tony's big-time talent contracts are guaranteed by his father rather than if AEW goes out of business. So was it enough money that, that Edge said, fuck it for three years and maybe they've just sold the company. I don't have any loyalty to these new people anyway. And I'm already in the Hall of Fame. They won't kick me out. I think you're looking at it all wrong. I think he's a guy who came back. And for some of us, the comeback didn't hit its full potential or didn't feel all that great after a while. He just felt like another guy. And he's gone through everyone over there. I'll play you the media scrum audio on the drive through but he said that they and he saw things a little differently. I think he's one of those guys they were ready to start phasing out, phasing down. You know, you'll still be on the show, but well, yes, you're but, not going to be winning. He's going to go there, and he's excited, he said, about all the new opponents. And because of all the time off he had, there are a number of people he's never been in the ring with, never wrestled. He's going to be full-time. He's going to be on every Wednesday night, at least. Yeah. And he seemed very excited about just being able to do all the things and be everything that he wanted to be in WWE right now, but they're not, they're not seeing the investment in Edge the same way Tony's seeing the investment in Adam Copeland. Well, but see, that's what worries me. He thinks, like everybody has, that he's going to come there and he can do the great stuff that he wants to do. He doesn't realize yet I'm sure he can do something great with Christian, but he doesn't realize yet that anybody he's working with is either going to get hurt, or going to get heat with the fucking EVPs, or going to goddamn not be able to work up to the fucking level or standards that, you know, he might think he that he should be used to. But the biggest thing was, I thought, if the WWE didn't want to re-sign him for enough money or wanted to phase him out or whatever, why piss him off? Why not just retire and move into a little acting? Because if you don't want to stop working, why would you do that? Just to make WWE happy? He's going to go make a bunch of money. They'll take him back at the end of the day. If he ever I, wanted I, to go I don't back. Well, uh, the new ownership. I don't know if I'd trust that or not. Point is, in, in two or three years, when either Tony has blown all of his inheritance or has the breakdown we don't know that this company's still going to be around in a few years the wwe will be that's why i'm i'm shocked at a guy that spent his entire life there except now maybe you know okay he's done everything he's going to be working with they all of his put friends him in the hall of fame and he gets to play with his friends well that's what it is he gets to for the but first you, time in a number of years he gets to do stuff with christian him and ftr are very close but it's like a, a reverse cody you get to go from the top company with the best production and the most professional presentation. And then a lot of people are going to think, well, he just quit wrestling altogether. And other people are going to say, oh, look, Edge is now he's with the, you know, the, the indie promotion. It is a reverse Cody because Cody was still working his way up. Cody was still on the way up. Edge isn't there is nothing but a slide down for Edge. And that's not a shot at him, but his age, what else is happening in the business? You can't push him the way you would a Cody. AEW is going to let him do everything he wants. He'll work with a bunch of people he wants to work with. I don't know how good it's going to be. I mean, they were really pushing in the media scrum. He's going to be here every week. He's full time. I think the more he was on WWE TV, the more people didn't care. It, w it was too much because it was special. He came back from a forced retirement. The story was there. The sentiment was there. The sympathy. And then the more you saw him go back and forth, the more that it was kind of, eh. So they ended the show with the big Edge reveal. And, uh, you know, it is interesting. I guess, what would Edge have done if Darby had won? <laughs> Did he still have the video queued up? Was he still going to storm the stage? And have he was still going to drive that car down. And, and I get, you know, talking about it with you, you're right. If he's convinced that, He's done everything in the WWE. They ain't going to kick him out of the Hall of Fame. He's going to get millions of dollars from Tony Khan. And he's made peace with the fact that if the new ownership doesn't want to take him back for future projects as a legend, he doesn't need money. I'm sure he's already fixed financially. And 
he'd rather go play with his friends than have the come down of being going from the big company to the land of Lilliput with all the unprofessional jackoffs. And again, we'll play the audio on the drive through but he literally said in the scrum that his daughter said, why don't you go be with Uncle Jay? And I think that is a big thing there. I mean, everyone has friends, everyone has family, but him and Christian literally came into the business together. They were best friends from childhood. They've not done anything together in wrestling in forever because Edge was out of the picture. Christian... Christian was in TNA for a long time. A lot of different places. So, yeah. you know, again, I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong in a lot of what you're saying, but if you look at it from his point of view, if you know you only have a little limited time, realistically, just because of age left in the ring. Yeah. You've got millions already. You're going to still get millions. And you're going to be able to work with, be around in the locker room, some people you want to be around. I could see it making sense for him. Now, I do want to say they closed the show that's a tribute to Antonio Inoki by finding the one wrestler with a pelican jaw to come out there <laughs> and make the save at the end. Good job, Tony Khan. Good job, Tony. That's about the only time you'll hear that said this week. All right, so, okay, I guess Edge then fine. As long as his money is guaranteed by Shad Khan that he will get paid if AEW goes out of business. And I think that would be for any main event level talent yeah. looking to sign any kind of extension or long-term deal with AEW. Don't let that loophole bite you in the ass. Make the money guaranteed by Shad Khan's corporation rather than depending on hoping that AEW is still going to be a thing in three years. Again, a lot of people said, just wait for the video game, wait for the video game. We're getting more and more feedback from people who are saying, you have to see how dead it is. There's no one playing online. There's like two dozen people. The video game's dead on arrival. And how much was that? 60 million or whatever, whatever it was. It was many, many millions of dollars. They said that was the difference between the company being profitable and not. Has it made its money back or come even closer? Does it have any prospect of doing that? Probably not, but... One would think that if the video game was doing well, one would be hearing that. And we're hearing the opposite. That's right, and that is guaranteed by Shad Khan. Alrighty, is it guaranteed that we're done with this program? I think so. I need a nap. You need a nap. You need uh, Sudafed. You need penicillin. Whatever you need, go get it. And folks, if you need something, you're going to find it here on the drive through or next week on The Experience. And until then, thank you, fuck you, and bye-bye, everybody.